as our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the wrong way laughing at me. And incredible operations. You see, it's a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. You get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... Inside this box, we've got red roses. Smelling wonderful. <laughs> Life is one big bed of roses as hundreds of tons of Valentine's blooms. Normal weeks, we do around roughly around one million stems a day. Valentine's is double. Jet in for the world's largest flower auction. The whole building over here is this size of Monaco. It is sort of a way an insane job. A top-of-the-range race car puts handlers... It's very, 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 very tight. ...into a massive spin. What's that, Frank? Right? And a last-ditch airport repair... Under a bit of pressure now to get all the material back in the ground. ...sends stress levels supersonic. Can we sweep this bit? Hey! Driver! We're getting a bit close on the, the edge now. These aircraft are coming in, and uh, we're going to have to vacate the area. How much longer? It's approaching Valentine's Day, and love is in the air in the romantic canal-lined streets of Amsterdam, Holland. Also, wafting gently is the scent of millions of roses, coming from the world's largest auction facility, Royal Flora Holland. If you smell the roses, you see that the, the size of it is the largest store that I know there is. It's the size of Monaco. Now, I don't know if you see the Formula One in Monaco, they can put a Formula One race in here. In the Valentine week, we uh, auction minimum 100 million roses each week. To fill daily, one of the world's top ten biggest buildings, Royal Flora Holland draws on a network of global growers. And to get far-flung flowers here as fresh as a daisy, keeps Schiphol Airport blooming. We have a freighter fleet of six freighters, uh, four 747s and two triple uh, sevens. From general cargo to live animals, but naturally also fresh products, pharma products, air engines, you name it, we ship it. One of the biggest cargoes uh, for sure is flowers. In total, we ship around uh, close to uh, 66,000 tons a year. That equates to 11 and a half billion flowers annually. And with Valentine's looming, the latest mega batch of freshly cut roses from Quito in Ecuador is winging its way in on the Flying Dutchman. Have you ever seen this? 
<laughs> One of KLM's long-distance 747-400 aircraft that's almost entirely devoted to freighting flowers. As it pulls into a snowy skip hole, the clock is ticking to get its cargo rushed over to Royal Flora Holland. Today we've got uh, 100 tons of cargo on board. Most of it, 90% is, uh, is flowers. And we've got one aircraft engine on board also coming in. This is a very busy season because of the Valentine's Day is coming in. It's a big operation. Uh, in, in, in a small time frame you have to unload 100 tons of freight. So you have to be accurate to do it fast and safe. Time is a big issue, but safety comes first. Yes, Schiphol Airport is flower central for this most delicate of air freight. And keeping Henny and the rest of his crew on their toes today is fresh roses like to be kept at an optimum six degrees Celsius. We use every space we can get. Outside, it's sub-zero, so there's no time to waste. Inside this box, we've got red roses and yellow roses. They're looking nice. Smelling wonderful. <laughs> A lot of flowers over here. It's all flowers. All different boxes, all different kind of flowers. Most of them are roses, but all kind of colors. It's uh, extra busy, extra busy. We've got some, some extra flights from out of Africa and uh, South America with all flowers coming in. All for the Valentine's Day. Nice red roses over here. It all looks good. We're going to unload them as fast as possible. It's getting towards the plane. We unlock the pallets and offload them. The single operator high loader, using an automated roller bed to pull flower pallets off the plane, is the crew's main weapon to achieve their 90-minute unload target. This is the plane, and now we're over here busy with these pallets. As you can see, the first flowers are coming out now. He's going to put them on the pallet transporter. This is very delicate at the moment. The center of gravity by unloading is, uh, is one of the most important things because if you get too much out of it in the front, it can go backwards. So you have to follow the procedure. First, the back half, and then take off the flowers in front. Yes, having the Flying Dutchman topple over from a botched offload would be somewhat unfortunate. But as Henny monitors this, Inside, cargo manager Jos is being swept away by the blossoming promise of Valentine's. I think the most of the flowers are roses. I, I always buy roses for my pretty lady. <laughs> but the age-old romance killer soon strikes. Things go a bit flaccid. Some boxes have begun to droop. The beneath low of boxes they're a little bit crushed, and when they are crushed, the whole pallet will be hanging over to one side. And you must be careful that you, when you want to unload the pallet, that you are not damaging the door. Wonky boxes are not the only cause of furrowed brows. Nestled among the flower stacks is an enormous jet engine, weighing in at a hefty 12 tons. This engine is for the 787 Dreamliner. It's one of the biggest engines on this moment. As you can see, it's a maximum because you have no space left between the, uh, the height of the airplane. And now they will roll it backwards. It comes to us, I hope. It's massive. The door is three meters and 10 centimeters. The fan of the engine. It's, it's, your, your, your finger is between the door and the engine. As feared, the big engine. They're stopping again. Can we stop it? Equals big problems. The big engine, with the big engine over there, we must uh, move the loader a little bit to the side door. It's, it's not in one line with the, um, the plane, then we cannot unload the big engine. This is burning up valuable time. 
We hebben het expres gedaan. The open cargo door is flooding in frigid sub-zero air, threatening the precious petals. We hebben het expres gedaan om te laten zien hoe het wel moet. Set among the rolling Sussex hills is a farm. On first glance, it's like any other small holding, with livestock peacefully chewing the cud. But this particular farm has a secret that's truly extraordinary. It's the staging post for some of the world's most spectacular supercars, due for air freighting. This is an um, Aston Martin GT3 car. We picked it up from the factory. Then it's going into Heathrow, and then it's being flown to Japan. It's all completely carbon fiber. We've got the huge rear diffuser, all carbon fiber in the rear wing. It's got to be as lightweight as possible for racing. As you can see, there's nothing apart from the steering wheel and some pedals. This Aston Martin GT3 race car's powerful V8 engine produces in excess of 600 brake horsepower, enabling it to screech from 0 to 60 in three and a half seconds and hit 195 miles per hour. And this one's about to be air freighted 6,000 miles for Japan's national GT3 championship. You've got to push it out the front there, get it on the truck, and we'll have to winch her in because it, it won't drive this one. But first, Jamie's sidekick, Jack, needs to get this thoroughbred racer in its brand new box. So these are um, race transported trailers. And uh, I mean, they specifically designed them for this sort of work, really. Um, race cars, supercars. And it's fully enclosed like this. They're all nice and safe from the elements and um, any stone chips or anything like that. So a lot of people quite like to use these when they spent a lot of money on their car. I don't think they'd appreciate it if it come back with a scratch. <laughs> <laughs> to safely install the immaculate Aston Martin, Jack faces a sizable headache. The car is incredibly low slung, with millimetres ground clearance for extra racing downforce. Because the car's quite low, I have to use these um, assister ramps and not scratch any of the bottom. Making a trouble-free winch on board pretty difficult. My own weight just to pull it out. <laughs> Make that very difficult. In fact, oh no, the most difficult winch of his life. I don't seem to be getting any power to it. For some reason, can't get this one to go. It wasn't part of the plan. I don't know what to say. <laughs> and this is a brand new trailer, so it should work. That's the problem with the newfangled winch. It tends to wind you up. This winch in this trailer, has it never been used? It's not getting any power. Perhaps colleague Jamie can bring much needed winch salvation. Ah, oh, there. Ah. Never used these new trailers, you see. <laughs> Thanks, Jamie. Did it work, huh? It will do, won't it? Yeah, of course it does. <laughs> All right, see you in a bit. Bye bye. And just to add injury to insult, Jack gives his noggin a good crack. <laughs> Don't worry, we're all right. With all systems go, Jack can begin the delicate task of winching the ground hugging race car. So you put these just before the ramps, and it will lift those front wheels just enough just to make sure that that front doesn't rub on any of this here. Millimetres. We're getting there. Quite a wide car, this one, so... I'll be just real careful with it. Now we've got to use these straps now to um, secure it to the deck. So it's just a case of shutting everything up, 
and then off we go. Next stop, Heathrow Airport. Once we've dropped it in their hands, that'll be, that'll be our job complete. Spend the rest of my day off, hopefully. <laughs> and there... Cars just turning up. The super low-slung supercar... Oh! ..gets everyone into a super tiz. It's very, 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 very tight on those boards. At an icy Schiphol airport in Holland. They're stopping again. Come on, stop it. A 747 freighter has developed a serious case of engine trouble. We have no space left between the, the height of the airplane. It's massive. Speed is of the essence. A massive batch of Valentine's flowers is being exposed to freezing temperatures. So this big lump needs squeezing out fast. We uh, just stopped with unloading. The loader is not in one line with the plane. So we must go back and then try it again. Uh, when we have uh, problems in the aircraft with unloading, that means that there are a lot of people waiting inside our warehouse and the trucks waiting outside for us. Time is money and we must do it uh, as quick as possible. 20 frustratingly slow minutes later, the 12 ton engine is finally off board, quickly followed by the remaining flower pallets. Their new home, the landside warehouse. The aircraft is parked outside uh, behind those doors. It's only, I think, 50 meter drive for the pallet mover with the pallet from the aircraft to the uh, entrance. What you can see as we walk over there, the door opens, the pallet comes in. Yeah, on this flight, something like uh, almost 100 tons of flowers are coming in uh, and go or to the auction. So, yeah, it's busy time. From here, it should be a straightforward shuttle to lorry bays for onward transit to the world's largest flower auction at Royal Flora Holland. But on this occasion, flower power is powerless. Of course, when you're filming, <laughs> hits the fan. Nothing will get this rogue roller to roll. Not even brute force. I think it fixed itself. <laughs> Luckily. Just when Leonard thinks everything's coming up smelling of roses. broken down the track, because later on another aircraft is coming in and uh, they have something like 40 pellets which have to go straight through. So if they can't get that one away, they have a major issue. Uh, when it stalls, you get one big jam uh, behind it, especially now uh, the Valentine's, of course. So lots of flowers coming in and everybody waiting at the auction, but doing nothing. Uh, as everybody knows, when you do nothing, that costs money. We're now doing a system reset. First time I hear this one, so a little bit exciting today. The pallet is moving, so something's happening. Yeah, it's working and it's coming over here. Phew, that was one big thorny issue narrowly averted. Which is just as well, because as we'll see, when one of the world's biggest buildings enters full Valentine's fury, 24-7, ongoing, continuous, time is everything. Those caught up in it can go a bit flower potty. Normal weeks, we do around roughly around 1 million stems a day. Valentine's is double. Luckily, that's not every day because uh, nobody will survive. Dawn has broken over East Midlands Airport in the UK. And there's a croc roaming around. My name's Steve Irwin. Obviously, you've got Steve Irwin, the crocodile hunter. So everybody here now calls me Croc. I'm not snappy at anyone, but uh, I have to live with that now for the rest of my life. <laughs> Croc is checking in for another busy day, running engineering services at this major British cargo hub. 
So I think our job overall, obviously, we're looking after the day-to-day -day running of the airfield. The stressful part of this is we have to work around live aircraft. So you'll always see us here. Last minute, we do the aprons, the roadways that run around the uh, airfield, and also the, the runway and taxi lanes as well. So this area is our sort of emergency response area, I would call it. So if we have, um, if we have an issue where we have a failure or something gets damaged out on the airfield, with us having very, very tight, small windows, everything is here and it's all ready to go. So we've got drilling rigs, which can call out light. So if we've got damaged lighting, stuff like that. The other side, we've got the, the tarmac material. Plus we've got all different sort of sizes of uh, claws as well. So these, these types of things, so you were drilling a, a hole in your wall to put a picture frame up. You've got to think we're, we're drilling sort of mega holes in the ground. If we had some cracking out or anything like that appear anywhere or any joints that needed sealing, we've got this machine in here as well, which does all that. You'll see a lot of this probably looks quite dirty and horrible stuff, but everything here ready to go at a minute's call type of thing. But yeah, this is a lot tidier than it has been anyway. You must have known you were coming. <laughs> Well, in Crocs world, an emergency is always snapping at your heels. As evening approaches and the night cargo operation gears up to go full throttle. Got Papa Mike 91 Kilo Eastman's ground. Good afternoon. Uh, just stand by one. Air traffic manager Paul Kay has a pressing problem to contend with. We have some um, defects in the, in the main taxiway, our Alpha taxiway, which is, runs parallel to the runway and feeds all of the aprons, so it's in constant use. The important thing is that we get it repaired as quick as we can. The problem is if you start getting a degradation of the surface, you get the stones coming loose, and obviously with jet engines or anything else, you can suck that into the engine and do damage. We are the UK's busiest airport at night, so because we're using the east and the west aprons, it's really critical we get that back for tonight. Down at ground level, Croc is weighing up some aviation heavyweights who, without access to the taxiway, will come banging on his door. This is the main thoroughfare through here, the most congested area on the airfield. So we've got everything from 777 aircraft, which are very large, carrying uh, large cargo. We've even got the Antonovs, which are some of the biggest aircraft in the world. So we've got to get this done before 6 p.m. Well, Croc, you better snap to it. It's now 5.30, so just half an hour to finish the job. We're getting very close to the time now where these aircraft are coming in and uh, we're going to have to vacate the area. So I think we're going to have to go and G these guys up to get them off the airfield. How much longer? How much longer? Five, ten minutes. Lovely. That's good. How long are you going to be silent? Uh, two more minutes and I'll be done. OK. So what we've been doing at the minute, obviously we've been planing out the surface course. Uh, we're under, under a bit of pressure now to get all the material back in the ground, uh, rolled, sealed and obviously cleaned up because uh, we're getting a bit close on the, the edge now. We've uh, handed this back for around six o'clock. Uh, we've still got guys working at the far end, which I'm a bit worried about. So we'll probably go and have a look up at them, up at the top end. Not only does the taxiway need its rapid repair... So have to pick all this up here. Croc is wary of the cursed FOD that could land him in serious hot water. Lads! FOD is a big thing on airfields. FOD is foreign object debris. And this is the type of thing that we're picking up. So if that got ingested into an engine, caused millions of pounds worth of damage to the engine, the engine, the aircraft will be taken out of service. And obviously it's uh, a big downtime for the operator and it'll be a reportable incident. So that's where we get everybody and do a full sweep of the, uh, the work area. Come and sweep this bit. Hey, driver. Come down this. We're going to have to sort out this edge. 
Anthony! We just have to get him sweep up and down on this. We're getting to come round on this end. So I just got the guys to come over, clean up the edge, re-roll it, and we've rebrushed the area as well. So after an almighty scramble, the taxiway is fully repaired and spick and span. So time-wise, we're bang on time. Luckily, everything's gone our way today. The weather's been excellent. Guys have all worked very well. As you see, we're just doing the final walkout. Uh, once we get down the far end of the field, I'll give AGL a call. That's it, air ground lighting engineers. We'll get them to test the lighting, make sure everything's OK. We've not damaged anything on that. Remove all the boards, make sure everybody's off the airfield. We've just got operations coming through now. Thankfully, the taxiway lights indeed light up. All good. I'm happy now. And a fleet of cargo aircraft is green lit to start operations. A lot of pressure today, but um, all the guys pulled together, ready for the first plane coming down here. I think it's time for a cup of tea. <laughs> Job done. See you later, alligator. Under dramatic skies at Heathrow, it's busy, busy, busy at Europe's biggest airport. The 8 p.m. flight from Abu Dhabi is one of around 1,300 planes that land here daily. So it's all in a day's work for duty manager Gary. The aircraft will be coming on stand shortly, and then we can start the offloading process. It'll have a mixture of baggage and cargo on the inbound. They'll offload the baggage first, then offload the cargo, and then ready to be reloaded. Soon, tons of general cargo is pouring off the plane. And making its star entrance. The car's just turning up. Ready for loading is a piece of freight that doesn't need red carpets to wow onlookers. We've got a car. An Aston Martin GT3 Vantage racing car. So, yeah, a lot more pressurized than normal, especially this one with the height of the car. Uh, it has no handbrake on it. So, that is what we've got to um, make sure that we load safely, ready for the departure time. Yes, the finely engineered 400k race car we followed from its incongruous farm base in Sussex is bound for Japan's GT3 championships. Anthony, when you put the high-low on, make sure you get it as close as possible because we don't want any gaps for the car pallet going on, yeah? When the car goes on, because the car is so low to the ground being a racing car, we don't want anything to dip down with the possibility of the front of the like, bumper touching the aircraft. So we want it as close as possible so it'll go in nice and smoothly. Paul, I'll leave you with that. I'm just going to have a look check the car over. Right before anything can happen, though, in a scene painfully familiar to car hire motorists, Gary gives the graceful bodywork a forensic search for any liability-inducing nicks and dings. We're just going to check now to see if there's any damage to the car. We'll make sure that there's, the alloys are in condition, there's no scuff marks caused by the straps or whatever, and, and any bodywork marks and take pictures. It's just for our... Um, Peace of mind. Greg, can you just take a picture of that? But it's not just avoiding a hefty bill that's giving the crew the shivers. Oh! Where they've spread it. Look at how much clearance now. It's the shivering timbers wedged under the car that's causing palpitations. As you can see, where the weight has gone on this board, it's sprung this one up and it's pushing the plywood into the car is something that we're going to have to be really careful when we're taking it off of this pallet inside the aircraft hold. It's very, 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 very tight on those boards. Well, as we'll see, this star turn treading the boards... Is he coming? Good more. ..turns what should be a relatively straightforward load into nail-biting theatre. What's that for, Greg? On the outskirts of Amsterdam, 
Royal Flora Holland is gearing up for the maddest rush of Valentine's flowers on Earth. This truck is uh, uh, just arrived from uh, Schiphol Airport. During this uh, Valentine's week, it's uh, very busy. Uh, we expect around 140,000 boxes. In among this ongoing flower onslaught is the 90-ton batch of Ecuadorian roses we followed through Schiphol Airport. This is a delicate product, so they need to be very careful uh, with all these boxes because flowers have a limited time that they are beautiful. It needs to be fast. That's why uh, we bring the plates directly into our cool cell because if the flowers get too warm, the quality will drop immediately. Because it's a, a refrigerated room, it's only four Celsius and it's very important for the flowers. It's keeping them fresh, so they need to be cooled all the time. The next uh, truck just arrived. So uh, within maybe two hours, this will be entirely full. It's 24-7, ongoing, continuous. Time is everything. Already fighting the clock, the unload crew must squeeze in an additional time-saving task. We'll sort these boxes out, because if you see, they're all not the same. They're, not, they're all different variety of roses, different colors. So it's a, it's a mix of everything, and our agents need to, uh, the, the boxes to be sorted out so they can uh, do their job on the most efficient way possible. The agents, the middlemen between growers and buyers, take these flowers by the bucket loads and turn them into beautiful bouquets fit for the world's biggest flower auction. Valentine's Day is the busiest two weeks of the year. This can make or break the year for many growers and also for us as a company. Everybody's now anxious because it's peak period. They all want flowers, they all need them fast, they all want best quality. So yeah, the, everybody is now waiting and aiming for, uh, for these flowers. So what we do here, the roses are all packed in uh, protective SFKs as they're called. And what we would like to do is take them off, check the quality first, and then bring them to the machine where we cut a little bit of the bottom of the rose. If you don't cut, it won't drink water, it won't last so long. Yes, any budding eunuchs should look away now. The stems are given the snip. The machine is set to a certain length so that it's really nice and level and the presentation is perfect. Normal weeks, we do around roughly about one million stems a day. Valentine's is double. And we have peak days where it's tripled. But uh, luckily that's not every day because uh, nobody will survive. Caught in this flower tsunami is under pressure packer Aniko, who's sadly fallen out of Valentine's love. Working here, you must be really fast and uh, you must really know what you do. In the Valentine time, we are so busy, it's coming. Uh, 100,000 flowers. I am always happy when I know a oh, Valentine is finished. <laughs> and my husband always asking, and do you want the flowers? No, I don't want flowers anymore. <laughs> In just a few hours, around 60,000 of Agent Martin's blooms have shed their dowdy boxes, had a manicure, coiffure, and fancy packaging, ready to join millions of other stems for the grand auction. What we do here is do a real last time physical check of what's going on with these flowers. Are they really marketable? Are they unpacked correctly? Are the correct numbers in the buckets? And uh, if everything is okay, we sign it off, goes literally around the corner, and then it's off to the auction. But after thousands of buyers snap up these perfectly preened petals, they face one last peril. The floral equivalent of wacky races. At Heathrow Airport, a gaggle of handlers are attempting to load a 400k finely engineered GT3 race car. Look at how much clearance now. We're going to have to be so careful when we try and get this off. Their biggest concern is the car's ultra low ride height. With millimetres ground clearance, they must proceed with extreme caution, 
to avoid eye-wateringly expensive damage. Good. Sorry, lads, eh? Well, stop there, stop there. All right, lift it up and then strain it up. Take it away from the truck. This is such a big deal, they've drafted in the big brass. Training officer, Paul. Because of the clearance of this particular car, there's very little space between the underside and everything we put on. That's why these boards are going in, to just raise it up a little bit. It just gives you a little bit more ground clearance. It makes it a bit more challenging, you know what I mean? The aircraft entrusted with freighting the car to Japan for their GT3 championships is an Airbus A380, the world's largest passenger airliner with an equally voluminous cargo hold. What are you doing? No, no, you're bringing this on. Yeah, take it back up, bring this on to the top, then send it back down empty to bring him up. While moving the Aston on the roller bed to the doorway is a piece of cake. You're good. good. Okay, yeah, slightly. Oh, keep coming. Maneuvering it on board yeah. is far from a cakewalk. Keep coming a bit more. A bit more. Watch that front break. Right. You can start to come in a bit. Keep coming. Whoa, 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 whoa. Right, we're well over that. Well over that. The car's only part way in, being over 15 feet long and wider than your average motor. Whoa, 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 whoa. Only adds to the crew's spiralling stress levels. If you pull your corner round, Lou, you can get that corner round. Let me sway out. This doorway is just an extra foot and a half wider. You see, it's a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. Keep coming. Right, let's get it in the middle. Keep going. No, we don't want it to run it over. Come back a bit then. A bit more, a little bit more. That's it, that's it. Perfect. At last, with the car lined up in the hold, it's taken off the leash. You ready, yeah? OK, guys. Yeah? All right, let's go then. And heaved to its final resting place. Rocket, rocket, keep coming. Keep coming. Yeah, do ya. It took an excruciating 22 minutes to complete the 30-foot journey to its cargo bay berth. OK, guys, let's get the straps. Surely nothing can go wrong now. Oh! Oh! Thank God you've got a light right. on that camera. It could be that the ground power has tripped out for some reason. Oh, there you go. Power restored, the final task is to swaddle the race car as gently as a newborn babe. We feed the straps through some sleeves that we've made up ourselves so that when the strap goes around the alloy wheels, there's no chance of it damaging the uh, paintwork or anything. Final check. Straps are all good. We wrap that around the buckle so there's no danger with the metal of the buckle ever coming in contact with the, with the car. I'm very happy with that. All the tension on the straps are great. So, yeah, really happy with it now. I have no concerns with the shipping of this at all. At 8 in the evening, the supercar inside the supersized A380 takes off into the night skies, bound for a Japan racetrack. The flight has now departed. More than happy with how the car went. We're really pleased. So it was a good night as far as we were concerned. At Royal Flora Holland, the 90 tons of Ecuadorian blues we followed being rushed through Schiphol Airport. They're looking nice. Smelling wonderful. <laughs> then onto the world's largest flower auctioneers have been preened and primped, ready for market. In the Valentine time, we are so busy. I am always happy when I know, oh, Valentine is finished. <laughs> 
So you could say, for resident auctioneer and flora enthusiast Eric, his job is a giant bed of roses. I love roses generally, because I work with it every day. All the colors for roses and all the varieties, I love them. <laughs> this is the cold store for the auction. It's early. Um, there are all roses over here. Over there are roses, over here are roses. Roses from over the world, from Kenya, from Ethiopia, from Ecuador. Uh, they are waiting to be auctioned. Approximately six o'clock, the auction begins. In the Valentine week, we have a minimum 100 million roses we auction. We have uh, 700 varieties with all colors. So, what are you looking for? We have it. Well, Eric, it's a few minutes to 6 a.m. Look, oh, wait, the buyer, the buyer. <laughs> more, more. So you better get on your bike. He must go back to his station now because the auction is all uh, already beginning. So he's uh, speeding up. It's Valentine, so everyone is tense, you know? You see the flowers are coming out of the coal store. Now we will go into the auction room, so we must be quiet, because they are buying at this moment. Yes, this is it. The start of the flower buying frenzy. Fueled by the scent of a bargain bucket of bouquets, around 2,000 rival buyers are poised for a Dutch War of the Roses. As an auctioneer, I know the price, what is optimum in the market. So, for example, if the price is 50 cents for one flower, 50 cents, I start the clock at a high position, for example, 90 cents. The clock will go down, and when it's in the, uh, uh, within 50 cents, a buyer will press the button. Well, if any of that's double Dutch to you, the best way to explain a Dutch auction is it operates in reverse. The price starts high and drops until the first buyer makes a purchase bid. It is fast. Within approximately every two seconds, we make one transaction. It's going very fast. The only snag with auctioning millions of stems in minutes is flowers must be divvied up and sent to the correct onward delivery bay for the clients. Cue the kind of motoring mayhem normally seen at Rome's rush hour. You see over here? These are the distribution uh, tickets. They will put them on a trolley. They're welcome, you're welcome. They put them on a trolley, the trolley is going to, into the system, and then the, the flowers will be distributed. This is going for hours and hours, because we must deliver 14, 15,000 trolleys, and also 10 or 12,000 trolleys of plants. This is a process that we do every day. If you don't like the stress, then you must sit at the table and enjoy the flowers. Amid the pandemonium are our Ecuadorian flowers. And in a lovely twist of fate, they're feeling right at home. I am uh, from Quito, so where they grow a lot of roses. So that's really cool when you see the address and it's from Ecuador and it gives a little... Oh, that's from my home country. The whole building over here is just a size to Monaco. At the side you see all the uh, cards and uh, every card at the side of the of this distribution center is uh, a client. So as you can see there are a lot of clients. So what we do is we put them on cards, then we collect all the cards per client and we um, take them to a point where the clients could pick it up. It is a, in a in sort of a way an insane job. So in the space of 96 hours, our Quito roses have been picked, flown halfway around the globe, sold, then, along with all the other flowers, re-delivered worldwide. The driver is now loading. This is the last trolley. The trolleys are going to England. And tomorrow, they are in the, in, the, in the shop. One of the thousands of florists snapping up these stems is Miss Moll's Emporium in Brighton, UK, ready to rescue those last-minute Lotharios. It's always good to stay open late on um, Valentine's Day because it's down to the men, so they, um, 
they panic and they're finishing work and they're on their way home and they've been sent a text to remind them that it's the day of love. They rush in here and hope that we've still got flowers for them and we always do. The florist industry wouldn't survive without suppliers from abroad. As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position Buckle in and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... This load, in actual fact, is Mega. We hitch a ride on the world's wildest salmon run. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. From the Arctic Circle to Japan's top sushi restaurants. Fish have to get from the sea to the table of Japanese diners in 36 hours. The world's largest military transporter swings by. Just a, another day in the office. <laughs> delivering tons of bespoke pharmaceutical equipment. My colleague must be very careful. It's a critical situation. In the underbelly of the world's biggest air package sorting facility. I probably take 20,000 steps a day, as we call it a hub walk. Mechanics battle valiantly to maintain 155 miles of smart conveyor belts. It's critical. If these lines go down, it, it backs up and slows the whole process down. And we follow an irrepressible MD. Now, engineers, don't run away. Wow. I've never seen him move that fast. As she lays plans to ensure her airport is Britain's best for air cargo. I look ridiculous with high heels on and a hard hat. Helsinki, Finland. The Scandinavian gateway to the east for air cargo. And, in a delightful twist of irony, the Finns specialize in fish on a mega scale. So we're here at the cargo hub in uh, Helsinki Airport. This is our 80 million uh, Euro new uh, temperature controlled cargo terminal. We ship about 200 tons of fresh fish, particularly salmon, to major markets in Japan. To cater for this astonishing weekly volume of salmon, Finnair built what they dub the Cool Cargo Hub. A state-of-the-art 64,000 square feet fridge in Helsinki Airport to keep fish fresh and delectable. As you can see here, so this whole huge space is about five, six degrees, and we've got temperature sensors all over the walls, and it just guarantees that salmon doesn't go above a certain temperature, because if it does, everything, everything fails. 
the salmon boxes, they're built onto pallets, and then finally they go through these gates into the airplanes. Our whole perishable operations has been, been built around the optimization of the salmon from the sea to the, the table of Japanese diners in 36 hours. Yes, this day and a half special delivery is arguably the most complex and impressive salmon run the world has ever seen. And the journey begins 850 miles away in the Arctic Circle at Skievoy at the top of Norway. Today we're going to visit uh, one of our uh, sites where we have uh, salmon. And I think our salmon is the best salmon as uh, sushi and sashimi. It's the best in the world. If you don't take Jan's word for it, then how about Japan's top sushi chefs? Their Itamai training that can take 20 years provides unrivaled expertise. And after an exhaustive worldwide search, they declared the Norwegian Aurora salmon the creme de la creme. Aurora salmon is the best salmon for sushi and sashimi. A fish is growing very slowly in the deeply cold water, so it makes the meat fatty, and the sweetness and the texture will be the best. That's why top Japanese chefs are choosing Aurora's salmon. To keep up with the Far East's insatiable demand, the Norwegians rear mind-boggling quantities of salmon in massive farms on the Arctic fields. At the moment, we are at uh, 70 degrees north. We're uh, far north of the Arctic Circle. The weather can be uh, spooky. We've learned that uh, the more uh, exposed uh, you can go, the better for the salmon. So uh, the salmon prefer some rough weather. The salmon that we produce here has a very high quality, and we want to give that quality back to the market. So we want to sell it fresh, but that means also, as a fresh product, it's in a hurry. So we have a slogan that says that uh, uh, nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. So presumably their salmon rush die. To meet their sea-to-plate 36-hour deadline, the Aurora Salmon Run is a frantic race against time. Starting with a boat delivering tons of live fish from the farm to the shoreside processing plant. Right now we are going to go down to the harbour and uh, uh, check if the boat is able to come into the, the harbour. Any significant delay could mean missing the Japan flight. And right now, the boat can't dock in rough seas. The weather is uh, so bad to have to wait. The nature is uh, controlling uh, us right now. This is a bad situation for everyone. And uh, yeah, all we can do is wait. East Midlands Airport, UK. Dawn is broken by a massive beast that dwarfs all the other airfield's planes. The Antonov 124 has landed. A heavyweight champion of aviation, able to deliver a knockout blow to all its rivals. This aeroplane and the T25 have a large number of world records, including the heaviest single piece of cargo ever carried by air. We can put pieces weighing in excess of 100 tonnes, single piece, into the Antonov 124. So we carry pieces of oil rigs, yachts, aeroplanes, helicopters, satellites. Once we carried an enormous cactus plant there is no aircraft available of equivalent capability. Just a, another day in the office. <laughs> the man who arranged the charter for this winged monster is Tom Blakeman. Oh, Hello, nice how are you? Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to see you. <laughs> Glad to see you. He organized for a supersized batch of pharmaceutical equipment that manufactures pioneering drugs for a deadly lung disease to travel from Toronto in Canada to East Midlands. Its final destination, a Swindon site 123 miles away. 
This answer I've wanted you for every time it comes in never ceases to amaze me. It's carrying 30 tons of medical equipment the inside of the aircraft. Prior to this aircraft, everything that it carries would have gone by sea. The, the industry just couldn't cope without it. Very impressive. All the more impressive are the Antonov 124's many boasts. It can take cargo through either front or rear, has internal roof-mounted cranes, and can kneel to aid loading. Not bad for a 33-year-old. We can start. We can start the offload yeah. now. So yeah. Either yeah. way. So this is the consignment of 11 crates of medical equipment, and by this evening we'll be in a medical facility in Swindon. This will take no longer than three to four hours to unload, utilising these two overhead gantries. The gantries will lift anything up to 20 tonnes. Once the straps are off the crates, the gantries will come down and take it out through the rear of the aircraft. This load, in actual fact, is mega. Too right, Tom. Mega is the only currency Antonov trades in. On the ground. Yeah, and then we'll take it away by forklift. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The time has come to squeeze 30 tons worth of high-grade gear out of its backside. Overseeing this colonic extraction is Ukrainian flight manager Dmitro, oh, who has a rather interesting explanation for this complicated process. If you want to understand the situation, yes, you must uh, imagine, yes, that you, for example, make a shish kebab, yeah? This is the logistic of this aircraft. You can put one of the big piece of meat for this kebab, yeah? <laughs> right. Well, first up, the kebab needs to be unskewered and craned out of the Antonov's bowels. All the people take part. So we have two cranes on the aircraft, yes, and uh, the capacity of each of the crane consists 10 tons, yes. So two cranes can carry 20 tons. The two overhead gantries are electrically controlled from the module the chap has in front of him. It allows him to lift, lower, and traverse right, left. They'll take the first crate onto the ramp, and then a forklift will move to the waiting trailers. To tell you the truth, by our plans to offload this one as soon as possible, because the next, next point of destination of our aircraft is home sweet home. But the delights of homeland Ukraine may have to wait a little while longer. After a trouble-free offload of the first relatively small crate, the next is giving loadmaster Alexei a much bigger headache. Uh, this is cargo is uh, of category uh, difficult. It's very tall, this cargo. Very tall, this box. And uh, for the safety, cable must be changed position left and right. It's a critical situation. And we have uh, limited distance uh, between the cargo and our cranes. And uh, I am and my colleague must be very careful uh, because um, distance very, very limited. But we have experience and uh, for me and my guys, it's not a difficult job. Well, that's not strictly true. Leša, ты готов? This is the very first time Alexei's second crane operator, Lyoka, has used this equipment. Nothing like being thrown in at the deep end. Так, а теперь for the working together with first operator and second operator. So we sync together, working together. If I'm moving, my colleague must repeat the operation. Now you can look very little distance between our crane and these boxes. Давай немножко приопустим, опускаем вниз. Нет, нет. Леха, 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 нет. Can the Oka keep pace and perform a smooth offload? Or will tons of bespoke, irreplaceable farmer equipment end up as scrap metal? Leha, stop. Earlier, we saw Helsinki Airport's hugely ambitious mega-air takeaway service 
delivering prime salmon sushi from the Norwegian Arctic Circle to Asian stomachs in just 36 hours. We have a slogan that says that uh, nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. But as we took a ride on the world's fastest salmon run, fish processing manager Thora had a sinking feeling. Nature is uh, controlling uh, us right now. When you have to wait, of course, the customers have to wait, and we don't have time for that, really. So this is a bad situation for everyone. After a frustrating two-hour wait, the boat carrying tons of live salmon to the processing plant disgorges its load into quayside fish pens, and only Thora is allowed to get stressed. It's important to not stress the fish at this stage because uh, if you stress the fish, you will have a bad quality in the fish. If you look here, we got the fish into the waiting cage and now we're pumping the fish to be processed uh, inside. And this is a very uh, gentle way to have the fish inside the factory. It's not stressing the fish too much. After being pumped by pipe into the factory, the salmon are quietly dispatched to the great ocean in the sky, then processed at hyper speed. Here we have a four or five kilo fish. It's a very good size and looks perfectly fine. <laughs> we say that it's gold. It's gold of Norway. For me, it's extremely important to know that this fish will be like uh, on someone's table tomorrow. So it's quite a journey for fish. <laughs> With the salmon iced and boxed, the robots lend a mechanical hand. This is the two robots uh, we have. So it's palletizing approximately 24,000 boxes every day. This is the shipment uh, ready for Helsinki and Japan. Then, once the salmon trucks are loaded to the gills, humans navigate a grueling 18-hour journey from Skievoy to the Finnish capital, Helsinki. It's a long drive. In the winter is a lot of snowing and uh, I see. This time is quite strong wind. 850 miles away at the high-tech Helsinki cargo hub, every twist and turn of this treacherous trek is being monitored by a Scando big brother. We're at the moment in uh, Finne Cargo's control center, CCC. We have the cargo eye tool, uh, where we can actually basically see where the cargo is moving in the trucks and in the flights. Looking at, for instance, the salmon that we get from Norway, we can actually start tracking the truck and see where it's coming from. The great thing in this tool is that if there's any disruptions or exceptions, uh, let's say the truck is delayed, we can take action on it. We want to ensure that the salmon makes it on time in, in Asia. And the time pressure that we have, of course, is uh, very high as uh, even at looking at the, at the price of the salmon, the value of the salmon goes down in the sushi markets and in the markets quite fast, so we have to get it there fresh. But still high in the Arctic Circle, the well-oiled salmon shuttle is stuck. Not by lethal icy mountain tracks, but by the curse of all motorists, roadworks. We have to wait, but we have to stop because of uh, roadworks. It's taking time. Yes, yeah, really slow. As the salmon lorry crawls across the Finnish border, it's three hours late and in danger of missing the Tokyo flight. Tiro, the driver for the final 450 mile leg to Helsinki airport, must regain lost time in sub-zero conditions. It's really icy. Driving in snow and ice, it's uh, it's really interesting. I never know what what is coming from behind the corner. Sometimes it's really challenging because when it's really icy and very windy, it's really dangerous because the truck is sliding with the wind. 
It's a terrifying juggernaut sleigh ride where, with over 20 tons of pricey salmon sushi on board, one slip-up could cost £175,000. Come on, move along. Everything is going downhill. At Louisville, in America's heartland, the world's largest automated package handling facility churns through another cycle of express shipments. It's a hustle, it's a bustle, there's a lot going on. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. Worldport is a place that truly delivers. Every day, around two million packages are sorted for 220 countries worldwide thanks to a network of smart conveyor belts that divert incoming items to their correct outbound destination. So here's OPC, Operations Planning and Control. It almost feels like a NASA space center, like you're putting rockets on the moon or something. Yep, this is ground control for Worldport's 155 miles of high-tech belts. MICA is responsible for every single inch. There's 35,000 conveyors in this building. We have a team of about 300 people working on them and keeping them going, monitoring them in real time to make sure everything's running correctly, running at the right speeds, and that everything's working properly. How are things looking today, Nate? We're going pretty good. Uh, I've got everything up and running now. All right, so green means good, right? Green is good. We have 1,600 live alarms on the assets right now. So what Nate can do from his seat with all of the screens is pull up the alarm viewer and see in real time what's going on. Well, in this mega system, it doesn't take long for the OPC alarms to flash up a belt SOS. Well, it looks like... It's lane one. Lane one is actually where lane we have one the issue over in North Corp. Is not green. We have a conveyor that is not running properly. So as a package enters our system, we track it every inch of its journey through the building. Right now we have a, a conveyor that's not tracking packages properly. How about you call Troy? We need to run down there and take a look and see what's going on in lane one. While one conveyor may seem like one conveyor out of thousands here, it could be very important and hold up the rest of the system. So can make or break our departures of our airplanes. I probably take 20,000 steps a day on average. I'm guessing six, seven, eight miles, depending on how well the system's running. So we call it a hub walk. Micah is in the underbelly of the conveyor sorting hub. Come in. Overhead, there are more belts than at a prize fighter's convention. And one has malfunctioned. We have about 20 mechanics in this building today responding to any type of automation issues. What's up, Troy? What have we got? It looks like the, the sudden starts and stops the belts tore some of the teeth out. Okay. Just wear and tear on the, on the belt. So we have a bad timing belt, which explains why the belt was stopping and starting. So there's timing belt with cog shifts on this conveyor that keeps it in time to maintain the speed with the gear ratios. That particular belt, the teeth had been stripped off. So we just pulled the motor in, swapped out that timing belt, and it allowed us to, uh, to get, our, get back in time to where we can track our packages. That's a notch in the belt for Troy. But sadly, his only victory lap is a lap of the ginormous 33,245 conveyor belts. So Troy is going off to do a 300 level inspection. Each week here at Whirlport, our maintenance team performs 3,000 preventative maintenance inspections a week. We have a corporate goal of 99.5% of those inspections to be made on time. We're at 99.99% this year, so we're doing really well. First job for any good maintenance mechanic is disconnect the power. Troy's gonna have to lock this conveyor out before he works on it to make sure there are no injuries. These machines do not have consciousness. The thing that matters most to me is that these guys come to work and leave the same way they arrive. So we've got the conveyor locked out. We know that it cannot start now. It's a hands-on visual inspection. I'm gonna crawl underneath, open up the bottom drive guard so that we can see up into the entire drive unit. So we'll take a look at uh, all the components, check for bad bearings, bad rollers. 
wear on the conveyor, anything that we can come across. All right, so drive pulley looks good. Take up pulley looks good. Snuff roller looks good. Tracking assembly looks good. Bearings on the take up roller look good. That's pretty much it. Well, that's confirmed, this conveyor looks good. It, it's critical. If these lines go down, it, it backs up and slows the whole process down. You know, when we, when we see these planks take off every day without a hitch, everything goes out on time. You know, it's very satisfying to know that we've done a good job. And the proof of that good job is in the Operation Control Center. All their displays are lit up green. And we all know green means go. Perfect. Like everything's running fine there. All right. How is the rest of the building running? Right now, we're running well. All green right now. Looks great. Green is good. Worldport is the world's largest air hub. Flights come in from all over the globe, and we sort the packages, and the flights go back out. This room controls where those packages go. This team ensures those packages move through the building and onto the right planes so they can make their service. The building's running good. Everything is green. That means it's running. That means we're happy. At East Midlands Airport, it is a critical situation. Nerves on board the gigantic Antonov freighter are as taut as the crane cable wires, supporting tons of pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment. Леха, 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 нет. Alexei and his rookie co-crane operator must work perfectly in tandem to offload the tallest crate of the 30-ton cargo. Maximum now we have six, seven centimeters. It's not very good for the safety. We must be careful. Ну давай приподнимаем вверх. Нормально. Там не касается, не касается там ничего. Там все хорошо. Леха, стоп. Поехали. 20 minutes of synchronized boxes ballet. Леха, хорош. Sees Alexei and his rookie companion clear the claustrophobic Antonov interior. Stop. Now I operate uh, because better moving cargo when we have a little distance between the ground and cargo. For the safety, all the people uh, walking around the cargo. Safely unloaded, Alexei's young protege comes through his baptism of fire with flying colors. Uh, it's a very young technician, and uh, it's first job operation with the crown. I think we'll be load master in future. Back to the present, there's still nine more boxes to unload, all under the watchful eye of the guy who helped give birth to its contents. I'm part of a team that's designed and fabricated this equipment. Various pieces such as tanks, mixing units, a lot of different piping and platforms and other things of that nature. This is lipid tank. It's funny what they spray painted on the side of it. <laughs> Lipids are a type of fat, Correct. and it's yeah. used in, in part of the making of the drug. So it makes kind of like a little fat bubble around the, the antibiotic to help with the delivery of it. So, so it's like partially disclosing the formulation on the side of the crate. <laughs> We went with the Antonov option because it ended up saving so much time and this allowed us to uh, gain back time that we couldn't otherwise get. Yes, taking the admittedly pricier air route trumps sea shipping by a good three weeks. In less than a day, 11 bulky crates have loaded in Toronto, Canada, flown 5,500 miles, then unloaded onto five trailers, ready for a short hop to their final destination Swindon. Good job, guys. Thank you very much. Oh, always well. It's another successful delivery in yet another foreign field. Ten years I fly the load master. I can fly another country and look in many, many countries. Tourist. <laughs> I calculate how much countries uh, I visited. 163. I hope we fly here next time and uh, see again. <laughs> the pharmaceutical equipment may be out of Alexei's globe-trotting hands, 
but it isn't home and dry yet. The last few yards of its journey will be the most fraught, as millions of pounds of state-of-the-art gear hang in the balance. The wind is picking up now. Ow. Ow. Somewhere deep in the heart of Finland, the pressure is on. Come on, move along. The latest batch of highly valuable salmon sushi, bound for Tokyo's fine dining clientele, is way behind schedule. Mm, a little bit worried. It is really stressful. So much pressure and hopefully we'll get onto the flight. It's real bad. It's 9 a.m. and the salmon truck should already be at Helsinki Airport, over a hundred miles away. Finnair strategist Peter is determined this highly valuable shipment doesn't turn decidedly fishy. Fish which are on board that truck, they have to get to uh, Tokyo today and the flight leaves at 5.30. Um, it was due in a couple of hours ago, the truck, but we've seen from our in-flight GPS and also uh, we've heard from the truck driver that have been a few delays. We're not quite sure of the reasons, but a couple of hours. So I'm just heading in now to um, speak to my colleagues at the Cool Control Centre and see if we can get any more information on, on when the truck is expected to, to arrive. Under the ever-watchful cargo eye, Yannicka is across up-to-the-minute live tracking info from all Finnair's shipments. Hey, Yannicka, how are you doing? So, give me any idea about how late it's going to be. Yep, approximately two hours. The flight leaves at 5.30. Yep. So, is that quite a tight time frame for it to be offloaded? It's pretty tight, but uh, the guys in the warehouse are aware. Mm -hmm. So, basically, they unload the truck as yep. soon as it arrives. Outside, the A350 plane scheduled to freight the 10 tons of Norwegian salmon to Tokyo arrives. All Peter can do now is wait and hope the truck can rapidly negotiate Helsinki's clogged up streets. Now it's some traffic, but I do my best. This is only what I can do. About quarter to 12. We'll have about five hours before the Tokyo flight at 5.30. Slightly nervous. Eventually, the truck docks into its unloading bay over two hours late. With time scarce, a squadron of forklifts spring into action to whisk off hundreds of boxes of succulent Arctic salmon. My hurry is ended, but now it's the same hurry. Hurry to catch the plane. The fish is coming off the, the salmon truck now. A tablet on their forklifts that tell them exactly where they need to go. So it should be quite a smooth operation, I hope. Once off the truck and into the 80 million euro cool storage, the boxes must be rapidly assembled into perfect cubes on aircraft pallets. I suppose to us it looks a bit like Tetris or some kind of, there's some kind of complexity there, but I think for these guys, they're experts. There's an element of this kind of Nordic precision. I'm speaking from like the perspective of a Scot here. So things work very, very much uh, to the clock. Everybody has clear roles decided in advance. This human expertise combined with data and, and intelligent decisions being made by computer. So you've got all the elements. And at, at the end of the day, you have Japanese consumers who are able to eat sushi 36 hours since it's left the water in Norway. Yeah, it's, it's, it's really impressive. In just two hours since the salmon arrived, three flight pallets of neatly stacked boxes containing roughly 25,000 dishes of sushi are ready to be stowed on the 5.30 passenger flight to Tokyo. We carry all sorts under, under passengers' feet, and, and, and in fact, of course, on a, on a normal flight to key Asian destinations, you'll actually have far more fish than you will have passengers. So we're gonna get a unique perspective of where the salmon's going to go. So this is where the cargo sits, at the front of the plane. This is 170 centimetres high. We're at the front of the plane here. Right above us are the, the business 
class passengers, so maybe I could, maybe we can like tickle their feet or something. Well, Peter, don't get too complacent. If the salmon doesn't make it safely onto the Japan flight, salivating sushi guzzlers won't be tickled pink. It's all a stir in Swindon, England. It's the 18. I pity the fool! How'd I get here? 30 tons of pharmaceutical manufacturing equipment, air freighted from Canada in one of the world's largest cargo planes, the Antonov 124, is ready to be hoisted into its final resting place. You need to slow it left a bit more, Steve. Slightly left, mate, slightly left. We're in Swindon and we're building a pharmaceutical uh, equipment for uh, people who are ill and everything like that. So we're just getting the machines, bringing them down, lifting them up into the roof, putting them into place, bolting it together. You don't want to do anything wrong. You don't want to knock anything. You don't want to damage the roof. You just want to get it right into the hole and get it right. Well, we've seen firsthand the professionalism of the Ukrainian Antonov crew offloading the freight. Now it's up to the English to finish the job. Down here, you have uh, the slingers. All of us are down here when it gets slung, so we've got a, a thousand eyes on the machine so nothing gets damaged or broken. All right. Yep, out, there we go. It's going up there, dropping it through into the roof, into another room in there, and then from in there, it's been skating into place and connecting onto all the other little bits that we've got in there already. Just a normal day. <laughs> When you're doing a crane lift, the weather is the most ultimate thing. You want the weather to be your friend. You can always work in the rain with a crane, but you can't work when it's windy. Of course, today, Mother Nature is a cruel mistress. The wind is picking up now. It is picking up. And the weather's getting bad in, like, the next 10 minutes. So we need to get this piece in before the wind does get up. OK, drive your nerve, mate, if you're not happy to be. Oh, it's bad up here. Tell it, it's bad, he's blowing the birds off course. The rain's coming in, the wind's coming in from all directions. Having successfully air freighted this complex, fragile manufacturing equipment five and a half thousand miles from Canada, <laughs> the last few feet are rapidly becoming the most nerve wracking. This is very tight. Very, very, very slowly down through the hole, mate. Very, very slowly. Very, very tight. Steady, steady. Yeah, that's fine. Okay, slow it right down, slow it right down, slow it right down, and stop, and stop, full stop. That was close. 30 tons of pharmaceutical equipment has completed its epic journey. Once it's plumbed in, it will start producing groundbreaking lung disease medicine, thanks in part to the power and incredible load lugging capacity of the gigantic Antonov 124 transporter. The Antonov carries things that no other aeroplane and very few other means of transport can carry. If you need to move something in a hurry and it won't fit into a 747 or similar conventional aeroplane, then the solution for you is the Antonov 124. As we've seen, East Midlands Airport is a favourite port of call for mega transporter, the Antonov. Britain's busiest pure cargo hub has ambitious plans to increase its global reach. The brains behind this growth is the appropriately named Karen Smart. Karen, really nice, nice to meet you. Really yeah. Really I look ridiculous with high heels on and a hard hat. She's come to see the site of a gigantic new facility for a global delivery service. God, it's bigger than you think when well, you've got it all laid out and flattened flat. here, isn't it? Blimey. So this is a £114 million investment, um, about 36,000 square foot building, um, and uh, it really is uh, the opportunity to develop the cargo operation here at the airport. Karen's always been a high flyer. A distinguished RAF career was followed by an exec role at Stansted Airport. But as one of only two UK airport female MDs, she's an avid champion for equal opportunity. Aviation's in my blood. 
I'm probably fairly unusual and relatively unique in the UK. There aren't too many of us. Count on one hand the number of female leaders of airports. But you know, there's opportunities for everybody and gender, race, should not come into who can do my job or any job at an airport. Today, as well as running all aspects of the airport, Karen must swat up for a keynote speech in London. Hiya, Hi. how are we doing? Uh, speech for Ooh, yeah. Wednesday. Wednesday. Right. So, you've got 20, 25 minutes. Okay. You will be projected onto a giant 26 metre IMAX screen behind you, so everyone will get a good view. Long and slim, uh, I hope. But it's a really, really great opportunity to talk about the uniqueness of the airport. Sleeves rolled up and let's get on with it. Yep. Yeah, yeah thank Fine. you. Take See you later. later. Then Karen's off on one of her infamous airport walkabouts. Hello there. Hi. With customer relations manager, Andy. It is nice to uh, get Karen over here, but she does have a habit of uh, spotting those things that <laughs> I've walked past 20 times and going, what's that? Eagle eyes, as we call her. He loves it, really. We've got about 8,000 people in total on site that work in round the clock. But, you know, I'd like to think that we're a lot more personal than most airports. What we want is it to be an enjoyable place. Hi, how are you doing? Hi. Yeah, good and you? Hi, how are you doing? Now, engineers, don't run away. Come back. <laughs> You've never seen him move that fast. I've never seen him move that fast at all. I come through at least once a week and spend a bit of time with the staff and just getting a feel for what's going on. Working with our staff and with the customers is the best part of the job. Got to try the new men's fragrance? Uh, yeah, go for it. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> nice, nice. <laughs> Then finally, your escort to wait. So bring your let's go fire section. Here we come. With Christmas on the doorstep, we're going to the fire section because I've got some good news for them. Karen's the bearer of good tidings. I feel a little bit like Silla Black. Now, Paddy, how's your day going so far? My day was going to get better. How about two new bikes and a full maintenance contract? Ooh. Firefighters are really uh, keen that this is um, something that the whole of the airport can use, all the staff. So he's been saying to me we need spikes particularly, so that's what we've come to deliver some good news for. I'm dead to it. And that's another thing off my tick list. Well, that should keep everyone at the airport leaner and meaner and help the place soar to new heights. To be MD of this airport, I take as a real privilege, something that gets me out of bed every morning. I love it, I love it. Time for a cup of tea. Is anybody buying me lunch? <laughs> Earlier, we saw how Finair were busting a gun to hit their 36-hour Arctic cash to Tokyo plate deadline of highly prized salmon sushi for Japan's dining elite. This fish will be on someone's table tomorrow, so it's quite a journey for fish. <laughs> Having suffered delays en route. So much pressure. Hopefully it will get under the flight. 10 tons of prime Norwegian salmon was rushed through their cool cargo hub. And now, in the nick of time, three flight pallets are wrapped and ready to rumble straight onto the early evening Tokyo flight. The wide-bodied, state-of-the-art passenger jet, the Airbus A350. Finnair has a quite unique operation whereby flights arrive from Tokyo Narita, it arrives and it takes off within about three hours. It's offloaded its passengers, offloaded the cargo, it's had a check um, to make sure everything's fine. It's now rolled over here from the hangar and all the salmon that, um, that we've been following from, from Norway is still currently inside. So then the guys come and everything goes on board an hour before departure and then off it goes. So it's a really quick turnaround time. Right on cue, the salmon gets loaded along with other general cargo. In charge of this time critical process is Edward Homer. Uh, so far, yeah, I'd say we're quite happy with where we are quite now. At the moment, the uh, loading of the cargo has gone pretty smoothly. The machine, it basically drives under, raises up, which releases the locks and pulls the container onto the machine. We then drive onto the uh, large high loader over there, which can then 
lifted up to the height of the aircraft door, or then roll it into the aircraft and load it safely. There's quite a number of tons going onto the aircraft. Obviously, if you load the aircraft incorrectly, the balance is wrong, it can cause problems, so it's critical that we get this correct. 40 minutes of lightning fast loading, all the air cargo is stowed on board, including our well-traveled salmon from the Arctic Circle. The pallets have been loaded in there, been secured in the aircraft so they can't move around. We have made a note of the information so we can forward it to the captain so that he can ensure the temperature inside the hold is regulated to keep it nice and fresh for, for its survival. We have quite a lot of cargo, I think uh, 21.4 tons of it. Okay, so now all the pre-flight checks are done, everything is in order, and now we're off to Japan. With the captain's blessing, the A350 flight is given clearance to start its 5,000-mile trek east to Narita, Tokyo, all within the 36-hour ocean-to-plate time frame to feed the Japanese sushi market. So we've just said goodbye to the plane, and by the time I wake up tomorrow morning, somebody will probably be eating this Norwegian salmon in, in Japan. So, successful day. Some difficulty this morning with the trucks coming down from northern Norway, but everything was so smooth in the terminal. Guys worked their, their bums off, uh, super happy, and uh, yeah, delighted to see it go. As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being on an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people... You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa! We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out-of-this-world giants, life-saving medical supplies, it's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... All right, have you done your lasers up? Are you ready to go? All right. Mega Air goes Mega Air less. It's definitely neat realizing it that that'll get in the air with as much cargo as we're about to load on it. Yes, we blast through the final frontier following a satellite into space. Not anybody can say that they work on things that go to space every day. Britain's busiest nighttime cargo airport. We always come up with little issues that always bite you on the... Uh... Battles to upgrade facilities for winter. It's been decided that we're going to go out and anti-ice. It's no good having an airport if you can't land your planes. And one of the world's biggest package delivery services. Tires are good. Last thing we want to do is lose a tire on the takeoff. Goes to extreme lengths to guard urgent next day deliveries. Aviation has long periods of boredom followed by short periods of sheer terror.
Sunnyvale, California, in Silicon Valley, the heartbeat of the new tech revolution and base for aerospace giant Lockheed Martin. Since I was a little kid, I've always wanted to work uh, in space, uh, with space. Uh, it's really exciting. In this astounding 57,000 square foot high bay facility, their space boffins build cutting edge satellites worth over $100 million. So you'll excuse them from being a mite OCD over cleanliness. Right now, as we go into the high bay, it's a 100K clean room. Uh, and what you'll actually see is a, uh, we're gonna garment up and we're gonna get cleaned up to make sure we don't bring any foreign object debris into the high bay itself. So uh, first thing we do is we clean off our shoes. Make sure that any of the debris from our feet comes off. We'll garment up, we'll put these on. And then last step is uh, we'll actually put on some booties to cover up our feet. It's beautiful, do I look good? Yes, very fetching. But the prize at the end of all this sartorial trouble makes it totally worth it. Every single day, wake up thinking, today I get to go and be in the same room as these spacecraft. They're gonna go into orbit. So this is the 100K clean room high bay. Very simply, we call it a high bay because uh, the ceilings are extremely high. We essentially get a bunch of different components and kind of the building blocks of the spacecraft delivered here. We bring them all into the high bay. We assemble all of it and we put it through its rigorous test. And where we are right now is really at the tail end of that integration and test phase. So we've got one satellite that's uh, getting its final appendages put on and it'll be ready to go. And we've got this satellite, uh, which is already in its transportation container, uh, ready to be shipped tomorrow. Inside this appropriately spacey looking shipping container is a Hellas Sat-4 Saudi Geosat-1, or a commercial satellite to you and me. It's the largest, most powerful spacecraft Lockheed has ever built and will service the Middle East and Europe. And so what we're doing now is finally uh, finishing the last preparations. We're buttoning it up. And then uh, later today, we're gonna bring a truck in here to take it out. And tomorrow we'll load it into the Antonov and ship it to French Guiana. French Guiana in South America is the satellite launch site. Run by the European Space Agency, it ranks among the most modern space facilities in the world. With over 220 rocket launches to its name. But to get there, it must leave the protective high bay area and face the perils of the dirty and dangerous big outdoors. We pride ourselves on our mission success. There's no room for error. Uh, the satellite business uh, is one where you can't go fix it once it's on orbit. And so uh, we take that level of rigor and diligence into the container itself, creating the 3D models to make sure everything would fit correctly, because if it's transporting our, our spacecraft, it needs to be done right. To ensure no mishap befalls our satellite flying to the launch site and space beyond, it's put through its paces in a kind of galactic boot camp. The satellite that's uh, being transported is going to be uh, over 6,000 kilograms. So it's going to be very heavy and give it a pretty rough ride. So we do all of our testing to make sure the spacecraft itself is structurally sound. Behind this uh, big red door is where we uh, simulate the vibration environment that it'll experience when it's on the rocket on its way to space. You can hear uh, a lot of echo in here. It's uh, specifically designed uh, for that purpose. Uh, so the large holes you see up there are our uh, acoustic horns. Basically, the acoustic sound pressure will be coming down to the spacecraft and then uh, reverberating around, creating the exact profile of acoustic pressure that we're looking for. Make sure it holds together when it's on the rocket. If AI would have had any significant uh, failures in these tests, uh, we would not be shipping the spacecraft tomorrow. I mean, these things are going into space. Uh, it's not every day where anybody here, even in Silicon Valley, can say that they work on things that go to space every day. Well, there you have it. This six and a half ton satellite has been built to eye-watering expense and tested to within an inch of its life. So the transport team better not put a foot wrong. Okay, I think we're ready. Or else the only rocket taking place may be up their backside.
in certain directions is very robust, in other directions it's not so. It's, it's, it's fragile. Louisville, USA. Home to UPS, a giant of global package delivery. Their mega shipment machine whirring to the roar of over 500 planes, air freighting to 220 countries. Hello, Dan. Ready for a hot launch? Yeah, I am. With the bulk of volume, time critical next day air, any major disruption can cause service meltdown. Let's go. So when all else fails, the brave men that fly to the rescue are the hot spares. The hot spare program recovers about a million packages a year. So there's packages somewhere that need some help getting to their destination. The reason why we're here is to ensure that the packages will not be late. They make an unlikely pair of guardian angels, but Rob and First Officer Dan must scramble to replace any cancelled flights from things like mechanical failure or sickness and ensure that packages are delivered on time. It's the captain's job to do a full walk around. When on call, their first task is to check their MD-11 aircraft. We're going to make sure overall integrity of the airplane is uh, in good airworthy shape. We're going to start off with the tires. Just look at general condition of the tire. Make sure the tread is all uh, appropriate. Tires are good. All the bolts are in place. That all looks good. They're all there. Nice integrity. Uh, if one of those is loose, as we're rolling down the runway, the tire would be out of balance. And that's the last thing you want to do is lose a tire on the takeoff. You want to make sure that all these brake lines are intact. There's no uh, fluid dripping on the ground. We look in here. We look to see if there's any fluid on the ground. The outside of the engine overall looks good. Then we'll look inside. Looking at the uh, nacelle, making sure there's no dents on the nacelle. Looking at all the fan blades. Everything's intact. There's no obvious dents or nicks. All looks good. Their schedule saving weapon of choice today is a McDonnell Douglas MD-11, a tireless, long-distance, wide-bodied workhorse of UPS's fleet. Okay, engine fire test. As Captain Rob prowls Over his speed. aircraft outside, Over speed. inside, First Over Officer speed. Dan is checking the aircraft's myriad electronic systems. The MD-11 has a lot of automatic features, so I just really check a lot of the automatic systems are doing their, their intended function. Stabilizer. Because when we get airborne, uh, we, it's, it's hard for us to go ahead and correct anything if, if anything breaks. God forbid. And a great motivator for Captain Rob to leave no stone unturned. Looking at the leading edge, this is a very common area to get bird strikes, so making sure there's no remains of birds, making sure there's no dents, no cracks, and overall uh, integrity of the leading edge. I probably experience a bird strike once a month or so, and it can be very loud in the airplane if it hits the nose area. It sounds like anti-aircraft fire sometimes when it hits really hard, and it really wakes you up. But they usually get out of the way because we always win if it's a competition between us and a bird. Once they've scrupulously examined their big metal bird, they do it all over again with a written checklist. Off, seatbelts, off, emergency power, off. We'll spare you those exhaustive details. Off, radar, off. Once done, the MD-11 is given the seal of approval. All right, the pre-flight's been complete. I'm going to put a seal on the door, and this indicates the aircraft is in the exact same position that I left it. So we can open the door, break the seal, do a few pre-flight checks, and get pushed back in relatively quickly. Then it's off to the pilot's mess hall to play the waiting game. When the aircraft's ready for a hot launch. We basically sit and wait. I'm basically going to sit here and read for a little while. So it's just finding something to do and occupy ourselves until you get the call. So as Captain Rob indulges in a little light reading, the third edition avionics systems manual Dan's having a good time. He's not going to read any manuals or anything like that. First Officer Dan gives a privileged peek at the pilot's inner sanctum. All right. Yeah, we're uh, walking through the, uh, the halls. There's a sleep room. It's kind of a, a rat maze. I think it's over this way. Here you go. So here's what a typical sleep room looks like. It's uh, just big enough for a, for a single bed. 
at each of the sleep rooms have a, has a telephone. In case they uh, can't get a hold of us on our beeper or our cell phone, they'll call this phone right here in case we have to launch. But sadly for Dan, 40 winks is denied. With the MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. As we'll see, a hot launch sends him and Captain Rob scurrying to rescue stranded packages. Aviation has long periods of boredom followed by short periods of sheer terror. In the UK, East Midlands Airport is gearing up for winter. The country's premier pure cargo hub is acutely aware even a hostile act from the weather gods must be mitigated to keep their multi-billion pound business from hitting the skids. We push through about 380,000 tonnes of cargo every year. And what really makes us different is we're a 24-hour operation. And what's incredibly important to us is that we stay open all the time. How are you? Being good. <laughs> On a chilly November evening, Ground Ops Chief Steve Irwin, a.k.a. Croc, will be marshalling a major runway overhaul. Tonight's works, some parts of the airfield are tired, and they need upgrading, and we're installing a nice prediction system on the runway. So this system will uh, allow us to work out the best time for putting de-icing down. So a bit like what you spray on your windscreen, we'll be spraying that across the runway. Now, you've got to think this stuff's about a pound a litre. Now, every time we spray it, it costs us 12,000 pounds. At the height of the winter last year, we might have been putting 64,000 pounds worth of de-icer down on the runway. So if we can predict that a lot better, a lot to do, so we better get going. <laughs> yep, time will not be Croc's friend tonight. As the last aircraft jets off at midnight, the runway shuts and his troops roll in with just four hours to complete a mountain of work. The clock has started. It's not just done on, oh, I think we'll turn up tonight and dig a hole and stick a bit of tarmac in the ground. It doesn't happen at airports. So we've got road sweepers, drilling crews, traffic management, all the excavators, diggers, lighting. You've just got to plan as much as you can and uh, make sure that if anything does go wrong that you've got the backup procedure in place to, uh, I'll say it, pull you out the Well, right from the off, poor old Croc heads up that certain creek without a paddle. Yeah, it's going to be a no-go. Far too wet. First job, the repaint of the centre runway lines has been rained off. No painting's going to happen now tonight. It's just far too wet. At the minute, we've just got to uh, bite the bullet and, uh, and say that we can't do it. Are you happy? <laughs> After that opening damp squib, Croc's runway repair takes a further nosedive. We've uh, just had a call. The lighting pot that the light fitting uh, sits in on the centre line of the runway have uh, just asked me to come up and have a look at um, an issue they might have. It looks like we found another old fitting underneath it. So um, we'll just fill this light in tonight and then we may have to have an emergency closure tomorrow night to put this pot back in again. On top of that, the runway spouts a fountain of water. But this is good news. So we're basically checking all the fire hydrants to make sure everything's OK. Everything looks good on here. They'll just move down now and continue the same thing on the next, uh, the next one down the line. But the main winterproofing job tonight is the ice prediction stations that promised to cut the airport's astronomical de-icing bills. So time-wise now, we're just coming up to three o'clock, so every minute counts. If that's not on track, there's one surefire prediction. Croc will be firmly in a croc of deep doo-doo. What's guaranteed here is that there'll be aeroplanes in that sky and uh, it'll be on our head in the morning if they can't land here. I might have to go and pick me P45 up. In Silicon Valley, California, 
the countdown has begun to move the satellite worth over $100 million. We've got this satellite, which is already in its transportation container. It must leave its protective cocoon of the High Bay warehouse and venture out into the big bad world. So right now, we're actually just finishing up, uh, buttoning up the container. We'll actually put it onto a flatbed truck. We have our different gases here. We'll keep the gases basically uh, pumping and uh, we'll essentially keep the pressure of the container inside the spacecraft at a positive pressure and uh, ensure that none of the external air, as soon as we open the door and go outside, uh, gets inside the spacecraft. We'll also have a, uh, a generator kind of keeping everything going and we have uh, remote monitoring uh, allowing us to in real time see the temperature humidity of the spacecraft at all times. The man who has to bear the galactic responsibility of safely moving this six and a half ton satellite bristling with fragile parts is Robert Knopf. Okay, I think we're ready. All right, guys, you ready for a pre-task briefing? This is our pre-task briefing for the convoy out to the to Moffett Field, followed by the onload of the container. Our first task is gonna be get the generator fired up, get the ECU turned on. Pretty much at that point, we're gonna be ready to roll. We're getting ready to turn the system on. Okay, so we wanna open up all six K bottles? All six? All six. It creates a dry atmosphere inside the container. We induce uh, dry air to help keep it dry. Crank it up to about 30 PSI. Okay, good. Everything looks like it's in good shape. We're gonna hit the road. With all the satellite's vital signs forensically monitored, the convoy will travel less than a mile to the federal airfield, Moffat. There, it will meet the winged colossus with a convoluted name. The Antonov 124-100-150. Earlier, it thundered into Moffitt, much to the obvious pride of sales director, Amnon Ehrlich. So if we look, and you'll notice the beautiful blue and yellow colors of our Ukrainian flag. Right now we're looking at the aircraft in the kneeled position. The front of the plane lowers down, the wheels go out, and there's supports that'll hold up the, the weight of the aircraft. We kneel the aircraft so that we have a better angle for the cargo to get loaded in. Let's take a walk inside. It is much easier to climb the stairs now since the aircraft is kneeled down. Uh, maybe not. We have uh, 38 meters long of cargo space, a 4.4 meters high for us to load, and six meters wide. And it is a single deck aircraft, unlike most, uh, let's call them Western-based aircraft, like a 747, that's, that's two deck aircraft. If you look above, you can see the tracks for our internal crane system. One of the things that's amazing about this aircraft is the ramp system, the way that it operates, and the cranes. Uh, this differentiates us from just about every other type of aircraft. With these cranes, we can lift up to 30 tons that we can lift and load. So the guys are putting together the ramp system now that's gonna come out a significant distance. And once the ramp system is built, there'll be an external crane that will lift the, the spacecraft and put it onto the ramp system, which will then winch it into the aircraft. The Antonov crew live and work on this aviation monster for up to six weeks, trekking the world. But now they must pull out their A-game as they'll be breaking new territory. Being that this is our first flight with Lockheed, it is rather important that it is successful. There's always challenges uh, in a project like this. For one, schedule is really important to Lockheed. They have to make sure that this spacecraft makes it to the launch facility on time. We've been working well over a year to get to this point, and here we are. The day's come. So, as we'll discover, the stakes are not even sky high. They're space high. So that will be on top of that. We're gonna move to up. ramp pressure further, as Moffitt is a federal airfield, the place shuts before midnight. This is the first time using the new, newly designed container, so I think we're a little bit behind schedule. <laughs> In the dead of night at East Midlands Airport, Ground Ops Chief Croc is feeling the strain. 
We always come up with little issues that always bite you on the... Uh, on the he must get a small army of contractors to complete a major upgrade to the runway before the Dawn Air Cargo operation roars into life. Six minutes past four, so everybody's starting to come off now. We're going to do the, the final clean-up of the area now. And then at five o'clock, we do all the security checks. Come on, then, we ain't got all night. Still toiling away is the crew installing ice prediction sensors. With winter imminent, these should accurately forecast when and how much de-icer to spray on the runway, saving the airport a small fortune in de-icing bills and disrupted cargo flights. We've got quite a tight working window. So the procedure, what's going on over here now, is essentially cutting the runway and we've got a resin bond uh, the, the centre into the runway itself. Hopefully get everything uh, in before we need to have the runway open again. If the runway is, uh, has got snow and ice on it, they're going to have difficulty landing. Um, particularly here, because there's a lot of cargo that comes in. So that's it. It's just like a composite block. Okay, it's reading uh, surface temperature here. And there's another one down here that gives you a, a, a ground temperature reading. And then we've got some conductivity stuff here and here, which is basically what tells us um, if we've got ice forming on the runway. They cut it all out, cleaned it all out, dried it all out as best they can. Cables have been installed in. Now they're, now they're basically uh, trying to get the level right for the, uh, for the surface sensor in the runway here. And then once they've got all the cables and everything through, everyone's happy with what they've done, that's when they'll mix up the resin and we'll get it all, um, all bonded in. I hope you've measured this right. Uh, and then it's on a cable, which essentially comes all the way through the ground here. It all goes into the weather station, which is going to be situated up there. And that will all help them make decisions on whether to, well, de-ice their runway or not, and hopefully keep everything running. In the end, the runway overhaul goes right to the wire. You can already hear out there, we've got planes taking off. So we were just in time to hand back without disrupting uh, aircraft movements. We didn't have any planes, we wouldn't have any freight, and then obviously we, we wouldn't have a job. <laughs> Good night. The next day. So I think we're probably about 15, 20 minutes away from uh, the big power up. The runway sensors are being hooked up to the weather station. The big switch on. The big switch on. <laughs> and hovering ominously nearby is Croc with a big stick. This is the GPS. So what we're doing with the GPS is actually recording the position of the weather stations, where all the cabling goes. We use this bit of kit along with the, the receiver on the top. So it's a bit like the GPS in your car, but just very, very accurate. If you've got machineries or people digging around live cables, we want to know exactly where they are. The only snag, to pinpoint the sensors on the runway, Croc must find his own slot among the aircraft. We've only literally got five minutes in between flights, so once this one lands, I'll keep an eye on that aircraft out there. Okay. I'll quickly run out into the restricted zone, take the shots on this uh, base, but literally I've, I've only got minutes to do these now in between flights. That's how tight things are. All right, have you done your laces up? Are you ready to go? So hopefully now we'll taxi off at Mike and we'll uh, get in. All right. It's go, go, go. Croc must play a nerve jangling run the gauntlet with 100 plus ton aircraft speeding at over 100 miles per hour. So I've got to keep a listen out on the radio in case anything changes, but we have five minutes. So I'm just going to take a quick, uh, at the far end is where the, um, the actual ice, ice prediction sensor is, ice detection sensor is. So I'm just going to quickly, um, so. Uh, right. No time for fumbles now, Croc. Um, Record the position on the end of the runway of this, right? And then we we'll actually go out onto the runway. 
and this is the actual position of the actual sensor. That's it, that's all we're gonna get. We've done our job. Still thankfully in one piece, Croc is able to witness the historic booting up of the new weather station. Don't anger the weather station gods, but I think we're good. It's, uh, as you can see, a bottom of the range uh, Dell rugged laptop. That's not very rugged, it's just really heavy. And uh, at the moment, we're just trying to connect to the station via the wireless LAN, which we can do here just to see the data to make sure all the sensors we've wired in are working. So this is where the fingers are crossed, and we're hoping to see lots of numbers and no slashes. OK, that's good. See, we have uh, the wind sensors working there, as you can see. We've got uh, runway sensor reading. This looks good so far, so fingers crossed we'll be OK. But as they say, the proof is in the pudding. And whether or not that pudding will have icing all over it. Later, winter strikes. As the mercury plummets, will all the trouble and effort pay dividends? We need to make sure that the whole site is ready for this cold snap tonight. In Louisville, USA, Hot Spares duo Captain Rob and First Officer Dan are like tightly coiled springs. When the aircraft's ready for a hot launch, we basically sit and wait. Poised to fly and replace any cancelled UPS flight to rescue their package delivery. The interesting thing about the Hot Spare is you could go just about any place. So I generally pack for about a week at a time. Uh, sometimes we go to a place where it's cold, really cold. We'll go up to Anchorage in the middle of the winter, and then we'll continue on to uh, Asia, where it happens to be really, really hot. You never know where you're going to wind up. So it is incredibly dynamic. While flight crew wait for any hot launch, they're royally looked after. With a comfortable lounge, dormitories, and a dark chill room. And of course, the staple for whiling away time, the TV room. By the time I've never turned this TV on. Dan's the man who can unravel frighteningly complex aircraft systems. Maybe it's for the other TV. Can't even turn the TV off. Not as it appears, a simple TV. I have no idea whether or not they're gonna go ahead and call us, so I could sit here for the next eight hours in case we get the call. Right now, it's uh, you know the, the calm before the storm, and from midnight to 4 a.m., this place is uh, is pretty busy. It's, uh, it's Grand Central Station, New York City equivalent here at uh, about midnight. As the hours tick by at Worldport, Rob and Dan stay on alert until... Attention crew members, with the MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. The MD-11 hot crew, please report to the jump seat desk. All right, that's us. Off we go. All right, looks like we've been called out. Let's go find Dan. Marcus, we'll see you later. We have 45 minutes from the minute that we are notified that we're going to be on a hot launch to the minute where we actually push back. You ready? We're headed. All right, let's go. Okay. Aviation has long periods of boredom followed by short periods of sheer terror start to get your game face on. Uh, there's still a lot of things we don't necessarily know exactly where our destination is, but we know we have an aircraft that's already pre-flighted. You know, a little bit of pressure, but we want to get the aircraft out on time to uh, go rescue our cargo. <laughs> we still have some last minute work to do. We have to program the FMS with our flight plan. We have to get the current weather, get our current clearance. So there's a lot of things that happen in the very last few minutes of the flight. There's a little bit of adrenaline going, but as soon as we take off, get up to altitude, can relax a little bit and uh, worry about our destination on our landing. All right, clear to push, and uh, we'll get on our way. Okay. Let's get the bird in the air. And just like that, our delivery Batman and Robin, Dan and Rob, are on their way to rescue yet another batch of packages in distress. In Sunnyvale, California, it's all systems go. The giant six and a half ton satellite is painstakingly crawling the one mile journey to Moffett Federal Airfield and the waiting giant transporter, the Antonov. 
Well, obviously, you know, we have sensitive equipment inside, you know, it's a satellite. In certain directions, it's very robust. In other directions, it's not so. It's, it's, it's fragile. Uh, we take slow speeds, uh, you know, generally just for speed bumps, potholes, that sort of thing. We generally keep around five miles an hour as a max. At the airfield, Antonov director Amnon has brought forward the flight departure before air traffic controllers depart. So they're up against it. So right now, we're just waiting on the satellite to arrive. The only problem with we have a uh, deadline for when we can leave tonight. Air traffic control shuts down at 11, and we have to be out of here before then. So there is a little bit of a, a hurry for us to get out, and, and we're waiting. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. Finally, at 6 o'clock, just five hours before cutoff departure time, the satellite rumbles in. A few more minutes and we should be ready to start lifting. But no sooner do the aircraft crew clap eyes on its monstrous bulk than it sparks a furious Ukrainian debate. Yeah, it's on the back of the trailer. So that will be on top of that. Obviously, we have uh, the Ukrainian crew. There's a language barrier. Um, that's kind of entertaining sometimes. Uh, but this, we seem to be communicating OK. They, 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 they make their point um, one way or the other. Yeah, this is the same thing. Hopefully, American traffic manager Paige Cummins is on the same page. So right now, uh, the aircraft is just getting prepared to, with the sled system to receive the container. Once the container is loaded onto the sled system, they'll go ahead and slide it into the aircraft so we can go ahead and depart on our way to Houston and then on to French Guiana. This container specifically, there's no other aircraft that can actually receive this container and do a full-on transport. It's definitely neat seeing something that large and realizing it that that'll get in the air with as much cargo as we're about to load on it. First stage of the load, is crane the satellite container off the truck and onto the Antonov's ramp skids, the pulley system to winch it on board. The key to this is getting the lift center of gravity, or CG, perfect, so the satellite doesn't career wildly out of control. You guys loaded this before? Not this one. Not this one? We are pretty much ready to get the sling uh, you know, brought overhead here and get it rigged up. And then we're going to try to set the CG where we think it is. Don't let it bang into the trailer. Uh, we're taking the ductwork off and getting it ready for the lift. Before the lift can even begin, the CG is still TBC. Hey, Richard. Yes. That is going to be heavy because everything's hanging off that end. We want that end short. They're saying this is the heavy end. Okay. I'm just. Okay. It sure is a weighty concern. But right off the bat, the CG sweet spot is hit. And the six and a half ton satellite safely swings onto the Antonov's loading ramp. The rest should be a clear home run, in theory. I know we hit a little bit of a snag, uh, unbeknownst to us. You know, the container sits on all this wood dunnage here. We didn't realize some standoffs, which are used for the caster wheels, they extend down further than the support structure. So we can't have this solely sitting on the dunnage, so they need to be removed. We want full contact along the length of the container. I think we're a little bit behind schedule. <laughs> but yes, it, uh, it took some time. This is the first time I believe that they're using the new, newly designed container, so it'll be all right. Eventually, the stanchions are removed. Disconnected! And the satellite's weight is evenly spread over the ramp. But it's 9 o'clock, and the 11 p.m. departure deadline is in real danger of being missed. Pretty much at this point, I mean, we have some things to do the container itself to prep it for flight. But as far as winching it in, tying it down, that's all on the Antonov crew. The big weights have been lifted off my shoulders, literally. At this point, now that the straps are off, our crew will come down and they're going to start chaining from the container to the, the dollies. And once it's secured, then they're going to start to winch it and pull it inside the aircraft pressure is getting it to this point. What's it, it's at this point, it's a lot easier. Rather like an outlandish aviation python, the Antonov stretches credibility 
as it swallows its huge meal. I literally don't think we have an inch to grow on this container. <laughs> Very tight. Our clearance is only one inch on the sides and the top and only two inches on the bottom. But it goes in very, very tight. Eventually, at a quarter to midnight, the satellite is stowed. Air traffic control is sweet-talked into staying late. And the giant Antonov is given clearance to begin its 5,000-mile journey to French Guiana in South America. Glad to be on our way at last. Bedtime, I know that much. <laughs> Been up for about almost 19 hours, time for bed. It's only a quick 40 winks, though. Just five hours later, the satellite is back on terra firma at Houston, Texas. But it's not a case of, Houston, we have a problem. The thirsty Antonov needs a top-up in fuel. The spacecraft did wonderful during the flight. We had no anomalies. It feels wonderful to be basically halfway there. Yep. Soon, it'll be the big launch. After three years in the making, will the satellite touch the stars? January at East Midlands Airport. It's the depths of winter, and time to find out whether toil, strife, and runway protective measures will pay off. An Arctic cold front is sweeping across the country, threatening severe frost and snow. At the moment, there is a yellow weather warning uh, to the south of us and to the northeast of us. With the cargo operation, they need to have all their deliveries made on time, so it's imperative that their aircraft arrive on time. Perched 170 foot high in East Midlands Control Tower, Got Papa Mike 91 Kilo taxi to the RVL hangar. Pleasure. Paul K has the vital job of guiding cargo planes safely in. He's also under huge pressure to avoid disruption to this lucrative, time critical trade. So he's praying the new ice sensors deliver to avoid a winter of discontent. So we put the new ice detection system in to monitor the runway surface. It senses the, the temperature of that surface. It also knows what type of solution we put on, what water content is on the runway. And so it gives us an accurate prediction tool to look at when we need to go out and de-ice the runway surface to maintain operations. We need to make sure that the whole site is ready for this cold snap tonight. One of those gearing up for the deep freeze is the fire department. During winter storms, water turns from friend to foe. The fire service do the main majority of the snow clearing. The snow vehicles we have at East Midlands Airport are a series of man tractor units, and they are our main sort of strike force for when the weather turns bad and the snow comes. Well, it looks a mighty impressive snow fighting lineup. But as they say, practice makes perfect. Nine off station on the eastern doing some snow training. So before the wintry weather strikes, the boys do a dummy runway run. Okay guys, just one more run then, uh, just to check service ability of the vehicles. Meanwhile, ground ops crew Keith is waiting in the wings. And it appears the good old ice predictor sensors seem good sense after all. Before the runway sensor check, uh, it was showing as a minus one temperature at 10 o'clock, and at nine o'clock it was showing as zero. Now it's showing as minus one at nine o'clock, so things can change. We'd like to say it's going to be this temperature at this time all the time. Unfortunately, Mother Nature has other ideas, so we constantly need to check and look at this. We have a plan, but this can change the plan because it's, it's live. It's telling us what it's expected to be, what it's anticipated to be. So with that early ice warning, Keith mobilizes the de-icers to get ahead of the earlier than expected freeze. 
it's been decided that we're going to go out and anti-ice. The two rigs that we're following now with extended booms, it puts it down as a fine mist. As you can see, they go the full width of the taxiway and the runway. So it's a case of choosing the right moment so that we can get it down at the right time in the right amount. We're already ahead of the game. That night, the winter storms sweep in. Although East Midlands avoids the worst of the snow, temperatures plummet to a frigid minus six degrees Celsius. But crucially for the hectic cargo operation, life trundles on as normal. The runway is in really good shape. Uh, there is no ice patches, so all the work that we did yesterday uh, with the anti-icing and all the weather predictions that we worked on yesterday have made sure that we've had no ice on the runway and the runways remain fully operational and serviceable, which is the name of the game. It's no good having an airport if you can't land your planes. In French Guiana, the Guiana Space Center is in a state of high alert. After three years designing, building and air freighting 5,000 miles in the gigantic Antonov transporter, the hundred-plus million dollar Hellas Sat-4 satellite is poised for liftoff. People are gearing up for the launch. The liftoff due in just under a quarter of an hour. We are go for launch. Carrying the satellite on its last leg into space orbit is legendary rocket Ariane 5, the heavy launcher that really puts mmm into mega. Attention for the decompte final. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. schedule, the space rocket engages 1,340 tons of thrust and blasts towards the stars, reaching 25,000 miles per hour to break free of Earth's gravity. Once in space, it releases its telecommunication satellite to connect the Middle East and Europe. It's a fantastic feeling uh, knowing that we've accomplished such a great job to work on these satellites. It's really exciting getting to this day. As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. This is a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. 
Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead Selma. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode, we're under starter's orders. OK, here we go. As a plane load of highly priced show jumpers kick off. <laughs> checking in on the Equine Air Express. The worst thing you can do is try and ram a horse into a small space. If they decide they say no, I know horses that have taken like five hours to load up. In gastronomic capital Paris, my job is about making sure that you get on your plate the freshest produce of the world. Tons of fresh perishables jet in to feed the world's biggest food market. All this fresh produce together is like being in a fruit salad. <laughs> and in Ireland, military heli power flies to the rescue. There's a high degree of precision that's required for this type of flying. Once you add a big load, that center of gravity shifts in a giant bridge-building exercise. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. Liège Airport, Belgium's biggest air cargo hub, and favorite place in Europe to transport that most noble of beasts, horses. This airport is dedicated to horses. The stabling here receives horses from everywhere around the world. Every day we do have horses who are leaving to uh, another country by plane. And last year there was between four and five thousand horses. Horses are such big business for Liège Airport, they spent three million dollars building the state-of-the-art facility, Horse Inn. Here the premises are made by people who know the horses. We recruit people who know about horses to take care about the loading and things like that. That's what makes the difference before the airport. It's February and Liège is gearing itself for a truly mega equine shipment. 61 thoroughbred show jumpers for a prestigious event in Hong Kong. And five of those horses are coming from highly regarded stables, Ecurie de Cousine, 65 miles away. They are going for the Longines Masters of Hong Kong. It's the best show jumping competition in the world. It's a long uh, journey to arrive there. You think they are very strong as a horse, but in the same time, they are very fragile. We, as horse owners, this is the most important thing to us. They have a good flight and receive them in perfect condition to start the show. It's fair to say this sport ain't horseplay. A top show jumper can command anything up to 10 million pounds. So these well-bred steeds get nothing but the best. So now we're gonna put the clean blankets on the horse before the trip because it's always more comfortable for them. So they're gonna have what we call a, a sheet which is just one layer, which is quite light, which they're going to keep on the plane. So now I put another blanket on the top because the weather is cold. On the front, we put some bandages. They have shoes on the hooves. If they move and if they kick one leg with the other one during the flight, if there are some turbulences, it can be really severe. So um, it's better to protect the leg, which is the, the more fragile part of the horse. This snazzy outfit is set off with some fetching fleece-trimmed bell boots to prevent horseshoes being accidentally kicked off. But all the pampering in the world is sometimes not enough. Usually when the horses get like really, really stressed, it's usually before departure because it takes time to load the, the plane. And when they get crazy, it can happen, it's by this time. They can start checking, try to stand on their high legs. 
getting sweaty or shivering and so stressed and getting all spooky that way, it's never a good sign. Yes, highly combustible, stressy horses can turn into a proper mare. And the most susceptible of Fernanda's stable is Fidgety Philly through the looking glass. She's a, quite a stressed horse, it's true. As you know, the horses are so different, like a person, they have a different characters. When the horse must go to the plane and take this very long trip, I am quite nervous. I, I don't sleep. <laughs> well, insomnia beckons. As departure hour looms, the jet-setting horses are given a quick stroll. It's better when they walk around and the, the digestion is on to avoid colic. Colic, it's when they, as the horses, they have a long intestine, so they can't throw up. So it means when the heat and some food gets stuck in the intestine, it doesn't go through. Uh, it's really severe, so it's really important before a long trip, they have some exercise to have more relaxed when they board on, on the plane. After their quick stretch, it's time for Fernanda's show jumpers to take their leap of faith on their big journey. I'm a little bit stressed, as always. Uh, every year is the same, but I'm not getting used to that. This is the most difficult part. When they depart, it's stressful for us. Next stop, is Liège Airport, where pro-flying groom Matt Brooks faces the unenviable task of boarding 61 highly bred, highly strung horses. Okay, here we go. Okay. In orderly fashion. Come on, big lad. Casement Aerodrome, southwest of Dublin in the Republic of Ireland, is a military airbase and headquarters of the Irish Air Corps. Through their fleet of fixed and rotary wing aircraft, they fulfill a surprising number of vital roles. We provide uh, defence capability and transport for troops, but we also provide an aeromedical service every day of the week, and we also provide an air ambulance service inter-hospital, uh, both on island and off island, for members of the, the Irish Republic. They are also on hand for any natural disasters. During the summertime then we generally move into firefighting training. Over that four and a half weeks we dropped, uh, I think it was close to two million litres of water. Jay O'Reilly is 301 Squadron Commander and today he's leading a dangerous training exercise involving highly unusual air cargo. Today our plan is to move a, an engineering bridge which will help engineers cross an area of difficult terrain. And our load weight today, 600 kilos for the bridge but plus lifting equipment, you guys are estimating 670 kilos. Yeah. Any emergencies on the way down, comms failure, anything like that will be external lights off, come alongside. The muscle behind this mission is the Augusta Westland 139. The Irish Air Corps were the first military operators of this powerful twin-engine multi-role helicopter. Before we go flying, obviously we do our walk-around inspection. We're checking the condition of the aircraft uh, and just verifying that nothing, uh, no panels have been left open um, or nothing is out of place and also that our aircraft's configured the way that we need it for our particular operation. Today, because we're cargo slinging and the load is attached underneath the aircraft, we can operate it up to 6,800 kilos. We also need to check our cargo hook, which you can see is underneath the aircraft. Normally when we're not using it, that's in a stowed position, but we need it in this position today, drop down, ready for use. Our technicians have configured it for the type of operation that we're going to do, and they're going to now transport it out onto the ramp, where we'll get the right fuel load in, as per our performance calculations and then we'll get all of the crew and uh, team into the aircraft and we'll move ourselves down to the training area. Engaging all the 1,679 shaft horsepower from the two Pratt & Whitney engines, the massive Westland heaves itself into the air. 
we operate a crew of three for cargo sling, so we have two pilots up the front and one crewman in the back. And it's coordination between all three people it needs to be really in sync and everybody needs to know what the other guy is doing. The crewman in the back is really our eyes on the target. Once we come overhead, we can't see it. It's underneath the aircraft. And although we have great visibility around us, we don't have any visibility underneath. There's no room for error in this and there's no room for lag. When something heavy is moving underneath the aircraft, it needs to be uh, moved in a very particular way and the reactions need to be almost instantaneous. Soon they will strap a 1,500-pound bridge to a six-ton hovering helicopter and that can be a life-threatening experience. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. When it comes to fine dining, the French pride themselves on sitting firmly at the top table. Salut! So it comes as no great surprise that the world's largest fresh food market, Rangis, sits in the birthplace of gastronomy, Paris. If you realize the, the, the total area is as big as 300 soccer pitch, so that's pretty large. Well, the smell is fantastic, no? Because this mixture of all this fresh produce together it's like being in a, in a fruit salad. <laughs> yes, Rougis caters for everything from langoustine to the humble lettuce. And a significant portion of this manna from heaven does indeed drop from the skies via squadrons of aviation freighters bound for Europe's second largest airport, Charles de Gaulle. Charles de Gaulle Airport is a point of entry for the European market. So what comes in is not only for the French market, but for all Europe. This demand is growing at a pace of about 8% per year. So that's four times quicker than the overall growth of the air freight industry per year. Of the 2.1 million tons the airport handles annually, a quarter is fresh food. And head of perishables, Eric, must ensure service runs smoothly. My job is about making sure that you get on your plate the freshest produce, meat, fish uh, of the world. From farm to fork, what arrives today, this fret will be available on the market, in the restaurants and in your plate tomorrow morning. Well, that process starts today. And Eric is out to meet the meats and greet the groceries coming off the planes. This is AF410, just arrived from Santiago. And on this flight, we are expecting some nice fish. Today, we have one pallet of salmon. When I'm talking about a pallet, it's a huge pallet. It's an aircraft pallet that can carry two to three tons. The Boeing 777-300ER, or extended range aircraft, is one of Air France's flagship carriers. Around 25% of the freight on passenger aircraft like this are perishables. That's up to 35 tons on each of the 300 daily arrivals. We are going to unload the flight, and within one hour's time, uh, the pallet will be available in our perishable center. We will unpack all the boxes and present all the goods uh, for inspection. Well, today, that tight one-hour fresh food deadline may go a bit stale. This here is, uh, is fish. Along with tons of salmon. There's nobody to take the, the, the cargo. There's no, dry, uh, there's no car to take, take the cargo. Before Gallic frustration boils over, automotive help arrives and the salmon is saved. I see the truck is uh, just departed and on its way to the cargo warehouse. So this is the time that the cargo team is taking over and uh, the job begins. And uh, let's make sure we act fast. Feeling a little alone in the giant perishables warehouse, surrounded by driverless vehicles, is Natalie. 
We are expecting some uh, fish uh, shipments coming from America. This one is the AGV, Automatic Guide Vehicle. So this is manual. We, we do not have any uh, people on this uh, machine and this vehicle. Without human hindrance, 32 AGVs sift and sort through the goods. 70% will be transited back out by air. But as we'll see, the remaining delicacies, demanded by discerning Parisians, must pass product inspection at the Perishables Goods Center. And not all incoming is inanimate. On va contrôler de l'eau de homard vivant provenant du Canada. At a torrential Liège airport, their purpose-built $3 million horse inn is expecting a horse invasion. Good morning, Bella. How are you? We are living the dream here, waiting for you. What time, what time do you think you're going to get here? 61 top-class, highly valuable show jumpers will, with a little luck and persuasion, board a flight for the Far East to compete in the prestigious Hong Kong Masters. This is why they call you the donkey. <laughs> <laughs> We're here in Liège, which is probably the best loading and unloading uh, facility in Europe, possibly the world. We have 61 horses due to arrive. It, it's pretty chaotic because there'll be lots of grooms, lots of people walking in and out with horses, with their hay nets, with their tap bags. So it can be full on. This is very much the calm for the storm. In the saddle today, head groom Matt must get these feisty steeds onto special equine aircraft containers or stalls then ensure they're well looked after during the 16-hour journey. There's three classes for horses to fly in. There's first class, which is on its own, usually stallions if we're shuttling stallions. Then we've got business, which is two horses, which is probably the best way. We've got a companion, um, it keeps them all calm. And then you've got three in the stall, which is what we call economy. So we were just preparing the stall. Um, this one is for two horses. Open this up slightly. So the horse will come, hopefully come through the loading area into its stall. We close the doors. We've got a low side, which is the contour of the aircraft, or a high side. So we have to decide which side we prefer which horse in. So this is the order of load. So number one is a centre load, one, two, three, four, and it goes like this. This is basically how they will be on the aircraft. So you really want to start loading it sort of 9.15, 9.30, and it's 9.33, so we can get going. OK, guys, can we start, please? Can we start getting loading? OK, here we go. First up are some sprightly-looking stallions under the wary eye of travelling vet Gordon. We normally put the stallions on the front of the plane because it's not a good thing to have stallions in behind mares because obviously if the stallion sniffs the mare, they can get excited on the plane. So um, mares down the back, stallions up the front. Yes, we certainly can't have any mile high horsing around. But thankfully, the first few stallions behave like perfect gentlemen. Very good, very, very good. That was nice, that's how we like them. Obviously, a lot of these horses are very, very experienced, um, and they should all be like that, really, in the real world, but um, it doesn't always happen. They are, they are unpredictable. This next one's having a look. OK. Come on, big boy. Come on. Good lad. Mm, not so sure about that. As soon as you see the whites of their eyes, you know there's trouble. Got a bit of hay, anyway, a bit of hay? Give that hay look. He put his head down. Come on, big lad. Sadly, no amount of chirpy whistling or tantalising snacks is getting this stubborn beast on, to behave. Come on, hurt you boy. Okay, hold on a sec. Let's 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 get let Claude and I get together. Okay. Bear in mind, these powerful show jumpers can launch 1,500 pounds of body weight over six feet high jumps. So a couple of humans is a bit of a mismatch. We'll get Chiffney on first. But groom Matt has a secret weapon in his tack bag. 
We're um, just going to put a chiffney on him. It's control head bridle, and it just gives a little bit more control. So we'll put this on. Oh, come on. Will the chiffney prove a winner? Don't be glad. I wouldn't bet on it. Come on. Come on. He'll go, he'll go, he'll go. Come on. In the end, it takes the control bridle and all available muscle to heave the brute in. Typically, that was an English horse that let the side down. Yes, trust the Brits to wreak European havoc. But more worrying, with only six of the 60-odd horses loaded, Matt's already behind schedule. You don't need many horses jibbing to slow it all up to get an on-time departure, which is what we're all aiming for. It affects us going into Hong Kong because it's a busy air airport and um, we've got our time and that can be an issue. But things will go from bad to worse as the old horsey proverb comes true. OK, we'll, 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 we'll... You can lead a horse to water, but you can't make it drink. Or in this case, board a plane. Well, they really are nervous. Something's really spooked them. They can kick one of these to smithereens. They are very, very powerful. In the Republic of Ireland, flying fast and low over the Wicklow Mountains is an Augusta Westland 139. Piloted by Commandant Jay O'Reilly, today's training exercise is a perilous heli heavy lifting operation. When something heavy is moving underneath the aircraft, there's no room for error. A 1,500 pound engineering bridge used for first response disaster scenarios in both military and civilian services. The context that we'd use this bridge in would be a river crossing to provide access for engineers and generally used in inclement weather or emergency scenarios. Are they taking that off this? Yeah, that's what Tracy's talking to the guys about now. This bridge weighs about 600 kilos, plus our lifting equipment rounds it up to about 700 kilos in total, which we're going to attach to the underside of the aircraft. Uh, the hook on the underside of the aircraft can take a total of 2,200 kilos. And once the rig is prepared by our riggers here, we will bring the aircraft overhead. They'll attach it to the underside of the aircraft, and then we're going to transport this bridge across the far side of this training area to a river crossing scenario. Making sure this bridge doesn't hit troubled waters on the lift is Flight Sergeant Tracy Walsh. Coming up to the load, the first thing we'll do before anything else, the guys have already started here. The initial thing would be to check, checking in around the area is clear of foreign objects. We make sure that there's nothing else loose, no hanging straps coming down. Um, that could go up into the aircraft if it took to flight. Generally, these things are never easy to set up. The last thing you want to do is introduce uh, someone being injured and then having to be helicoptered out of here to hospital. There's a loose one down there. You can check all the connections that they're secured. While Tracy and her ground crew check every nook and cranny of the unassembled bridge, Jay assesses the load's drop zone. What I'm looking at now, I'm looking at the terrain around here. I'm looking particularly at the height of the trees. I'm happy that there's no wires in the area, but obviously we're down in a depression, so we're going to need to factor that into our plan. We're going to need to do a power assessment before we come in. Checks done. It's time to put training into practice and hope it's not a bridge too far. Have you been under a heli before, yeah? Yeah. OK, yeah. that's all right. When you know the downdraft is going to get you. To stay airborne, this six-ton aircraft displaces its equivalent weight in air. This powerful force is known as downdraft or downwash. This is the most dangerous time. Battling the breeze and with the aircraft just inches above her head, Tracy knows the pilot is flying blind. While the wheel of comms when the aircraft is coming in, 
when it's overhead, comms don't work, you, you're not going to hear them. So everything is on hand signal. We're signalling to the crewman, and when we're coming in and out, we're hand, using hand signals the whole time. One strap is safely on the chopper. Now they'll need to attach this to the bridge cable while avoiding a swinging cargo hook in 115 mile an hour downdraft. When you're underneath, you know the noises of the engines, so you know if there's a wrong noise, you're going to get out of there. The bridge may have liftoff, but it still needs to touch down at the hazardous drop zone ringed with 120-foot pine trees. Because of the tightness of the area, I'm just going to act as an extra set of eyes with the difficult terrain that they're putting the load down. At a soggy Liège airport, Belgium, it's all kicking off. Come on. Pro flying groom Matt is battling to get 60-odd headstrong show jumpers to load onto aircraft shipping stalls. In time for the 1.05 p.m. flight to Hong Kong via Abu Dhabi. We're about a third of the way through, so we're just about on time, I think. If we just keep moving, hopefully everything's loading really well and uh, we should be for an on-time departure. Fingers crossed. But just when Matt's desperate for some much-needed luck, on, big lad. along comes a dark horse. Come on, big boy. Yep, yep. This one's a bit, bit naughty, apparently. OK, we'll, 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 that, we'll yeah. keep it nice and calm. Whoa, 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 whoa. Good lad, come on. Oh, lad, oh, lad. OK, we'll try a little push, OK? Rich? We'll try a little push. OK, just stay there. Here we go. Come on, big lad. No amount of coaxing and cajoling is going to make this show jumper jump on board. OK. Because their jumpers are naturally flare, whereas a dressage horse is sort of a bit more disciplined, these have got to have a bit of their own mind. It can be a little bit <laughs> frustrating, to say the least. With this horse refusing to budge, Matt and vet Gordon play their ace what they call sleepy juice. We don't want to get too physical with them. We want to encourage them as much as we can, give them a little push, and if that's not going to work, really, the next step is a little bit of sedative, um, intravenously, administered by the vet. And that just calms them down. So it's loaded in a relaxed way. Come on. There we go. Oh, that's that Well done, Gordon. Well done. Very good. It's another batch of stubborn show jumpers in the can. But time is fast running away from Matt. We're well on the way, but I wanted to be finished in 10 minutes, and we're not going to be. We're going to be an hour late, I would think. Hovering anxiously nearby is Horse Inn supervisor Christian. And like a good racehorse handicapper, he's keeping a close eye on the weights. When the, uh, the horses are going out outside, it's a scale in the first places, and every cage is passing on it. I take the weight, and the weight will be sent immediately to the office. The loadmaster will know how to balance the, uh, the plane. Accompanying the horses as they get weighed, then loaded, is aeroplane groom Tim. They'll get trolleyed up straight in front of the, the high lift, and then they go up. And then once they're on the plane, it's got a really easy system where the floor rolls, and then they just roll them into place. Once we start going, then it's actually quite fast because these three will load while the next three are being loaded over there. Um, and then it's kind of like a conveyor belt and then we get going and then there's a bit of momentum and then we can get gone. As the horse crates are rolled into the aircraft, a Boeing 777 freighter, equipped with specially designed ventilation and temperature control, Loadmaster Joanne has the critical job of preventing it getting lopsided and falling at the first. Preferably, we try and put the lightest horses at the front, uh, work away heaviest towards the backs, just for the trim purpose for the aircraft. We've got this main deck control system, driving it onto the aircraft. 
We're just gonna drive both of the horse stalls forward. We're okay? And we're gonna go. There we go. So that just drives it straight down. Because it's livestock, the horses come first. They safety the horses, um, ensure they know they're not in distress. Um, and we try to make it as comfortable as possible for them. So we have four locking restraints which are in front of the horse door for the restraint going forward. We have four locking restraints at the, at the back for any turbulence. Uh, so that's uh, just a extra restraint for the movement of the horses. Locked and loaded, groom Tim is one of those responsible for treating these noble beasts like royalty. Hey, baby. This is the triple stall, so it's a little bit more cramped. This is my one, so he's got his hay and his water. And then we'll just regularly come in and check that he's happy. Um, and then he'll have a couple of feeds on the flight because, I mean, altogether it's 16 hours. Everybody does things differently, but I try and keep mine so they can graze their way through. I give them a net, a big net with small holes, and that just keeps them busy for hours on end. Well, Tim's show jumpers may have to wait for takeoff longer than thought. Over at Horse Inn, Matt still got his hands full, meaning the aircraft load has ground to a halt. I think we had some bad loaders. The worst thing you can do is try and ram a horse into a small space because then if they decide they say no, they run backwards and I know horses that have taken like five hours to load a horse. Do you know what time we're supposed to actually leave? Uh, 1.05, no cut. No. I think we'll be late. At Charles de Gaulle Airport, outside Paris, the clock is ticking. The objective is to get the perishable as fresh as possible on your plate in the minimum time frame. France normally frowns upon fast food, but head of perishables, Eric, has made it his mission to whisk produce from far-flung farms to our forks in just 48 hours, whatever the season. So if you don't want to eat carrots and potatoes in winter, well, you might as well import mangoes, avocados, uh, okra. As the consumer experience has changed over the, over the years. Uh, I remember I used to uh, buy avocados and they were hard as a stone. So I would just put it aside, wait for a few days, probably forgot the avocado, and by the time I wanted to eat it, I just would put it in the rubbish bin because it was not good enough. Today, things are very different. Within a few hours of touchdown, a panoply of exotic perishables has been unloaded, computer categorized, and now the portion allotted for the Parisians is ready for the inspector's perusal. Now we are moving to the meat area, where we have received some uh, nice uh, shipments of meat from Argentina. They are going to inspect the meat. Bonjour. This gentleman is going to enter the area and will uh, remove the net from the pallet, take the carcass of meat and hang it on the hooks, like if you will go to the, to the butcher. And this is a unique equipment uh, that you do not find uh, in all airports. Huh? The purpose of uh, keeping the meat standing is because otherwise the meat will get the match because one piece of meat touching the other is not something that you want to have. At least this meat won't bite back. This consignment of Canadian crustaceans present a bigger challenge. Je prends encore un colis, je regarde les mêmes choses. Donc là ça provient bien origine Canada. On est d'accord. Et je cherche l'agrément ici. Donc c'est bon. Voilà. Et on a de beaux homards vivant. Je vous en sortira. Voilà. Ils sont rangés dans des logettes. Et voilà. Donc le contrôle d'identité, il est bon. On a bien des homards qui proviennent bien du bon établissement. Tout va bien. Having passed their physical, the lobsters are cleared for consumption. The rest of the fresh food pallets are broken down into individual orders before being loaded onto trucks 
for immediate distribution. And the pick of the world's prime produce ends up here. Runji's Market. Well, this happens to be the largest wholesale market of fresh produce in the world. Huh? That's pretty big. So it's five o'clock in the morning. As you can see, it's quite busy, huh? because all these uh, fruits and vegetables are going to be uh, purchased basically from restaurants. Not only restaurants, but also people who have their, their grocery shops. Let's see if we find some uh, exotic food around. Nice fruit here, the pitaya, dragon fruit. We fly this from Colombia, and here you have all the red fruits. Amazing colors, huh? Nice mangoes here. All this arrived yesterday only, huh? The, the idea world would be to have a tree or a plantation that just take the fruit or the produce out of the ground and eat it. So we are trying to get as close as possible to this experience. Employing 13,000 people and dealing with 26,000 vehicle deliveries a day, this massive market has an annual turnover of a whopping 7.6 billion pounds. At the end of the day, when I go back home tonight and I, when I go to the grocery shop, <laughs> I have a vague idea of uh, what is behind the scene and uh, really enjoy it. It's a good job, because to keep up with soaring demand, aircraft are already arriving, bringing in more fancy food to help keep the world's biggest larder fully stocked. Back in the Irish Republic, an Augusta Westland 139 helicopter is hauling a 1,500-pound modular bridge cross-country. And taking control is pilot Jay. There's a high degree of precision that's required for this type of flying. The aircraft itself has a certain center of gravity, but once you add a big load, that center of gravity shifts. So what that means is that the aircraft handles very, very differently. You generally fly them at lower speeds than the aircraft would normally fly at. So it means that you don't have good aerodynamic effect over the aircraft keeping it stable. On this training exercise, the bridge will be airlifted to a tricky drop zone, guarded by tall trees. Alpha Whiskey 274, this is Lima Papa Message, over. So Flight Sergeant Tracy needs to be on code red. We're in position now. Uh, do you want to mechanically unhook yourselves or do you want us to take the load off from underneath over? OK, they're going to cut the load themselves. Because of the tightness of the area, I'm just going to act as a marshaller for the aircraft, for the pilots. Well, they will be listening to the crewman, it's just an extra set of eyes with the difficult terrain uh, that they're putting the load down. Mission completed. Just have the final part to do. Um, we get the engineers. We've got them as close as we could to the location where they're putting up the bridge. Uh, when they're finished, we'll be back here ready to pack it up again and bring it back. With the load safely delivered, Corporal Declan Killeen and his section of engineers dismantled this flat pack bridge. Once you have a well-trained crew, it becomes second nature to them, you know. They, every man knows his job. We've got an outer frame on the bridge itself, so that's keeping all the modules intact. They're going to strip that down. When they have that down then, we'll take the modules length by length as into what we need down to the bridge side itself. Very lift, lift. Just mind your foot. Within minutes, the bridge is manhandled down to the nearby river. Yeah. Drop it down, go back. Oh. Up. The Irish Corps of Engineers are construction specialists, honing their skills on UN deployments across Africa. Ready, prepare to boom, boom. Steady, one last shove, three, two, one. Now, here now at this stage, the bridge is complete. As we know, it was dropped in by air there, what, 10, 15 minutes ago. Disassembled, brought down, connected up, rolled across the rollers. Personnel have got safely across the river itself. One, two, three, and a... That's it. Keep it going, keep it going. Having schlepped through this exhaustive bridge exercise, the whole process goes into reverse. We'll give it a check over visually to make sure that there's no any, any loose ends. 
all the pins are in, but there's nothing hanging off. Hand over to the landing point commanders, they do their checks, and likewise, they'll make sure everything's 100%. Job done and dusted. Returning back to base at Baldonnell, Squadron Commander J. O'Reilly reflects on a successful operation. But that's it, that's the end of our day's flying. Mission complete, all the training objectives were achieved. Uh, so since the flight ops are finished, we hand the aircraft back to our maintenance squadron, 303, and they're going to conduct a daily inspection on this aircraft and have it, have it ready for tomorrow's either training or operations, and we'll see what tomorrow brings. At Liège Airport in Belgium, the epic horse load is entering its final furlong. OK. Good lad. Very good, Trevian. Among the 61 show jumpers destined for the prestigious Hong Kong Masters is a group of five we followed from the renowned stables Ecurie de Cousine. The Longines Masters of Hong Kong is the best show jumping competition in the world. But it's a long journey to arrive there. Sadly, though, their nervous novice flyer through the looking glass is nowhere to be seen. So the horse through the looking glass, is that, that's not flying now? Yes, the owner decided it's not going to travel. OK, so, all oh, right, so that gives us some that's flexibility. That's got to be a double yeah. Yeah. Yes, OK. All right. Bye, thank you. Although her young filly proved too agitated to fly, at least owner Fernanda wins the loading prize for best behaved show jumpers. Very good. Yeah, that stable gets 10 out of 10. They can come again. Oh, la, la. Right, that's the end of the load. Uh, we, we have to just put some equipment on the empty stall, so I've got one more stall to load. We're about half an hour late, which everything considered, I think, is, is pretty good going, really. If you have one or two horses that maybe are a bit reluctant, it just adds time. Which we but Matt's work is far from over. Merci, merci. Once on the giant Boeing 777 horse freighter, he'll be one of eight grooms looking after 61 extremely valuable thoroughbreds for a mammoth 16-hour journey. I'm just going to go through and uh, have a walk at the horses. All the horses have settled really well, they're all relaxed, no horses kicking off. Obviously, the, the horses' welfare always comes first. So I, I will be walking around, making sure that all, all the buckets have got water in, just, just observing the horses, making sure they're looking healthy and well. We want a nice, relaxed flight, that, that's, that's what we're aiming for. In this one? Yes. But it's, it's, it's amazing how they just settle in there, they just get in, they've got the hay net, you know, they, they could be at home. Good lad. They look really good, very good. Very pleased. In a giant plume of spray, the 777 freighter, with 69 tonnes of prime show jumpers on board, heads east for the Hong Kong Masters and a giant leap for horse kind. There, Owner Fernanda would clean sweep the Asian Junior Challenge, her horses claiming the top five positions. As our world races at an ever faster pace... We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. ...and delivery deadlines shrink. We're in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people... You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have a 
have an aircraft on stand 666 which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode, the world's biggest package handling facility goes into overdrive. This is our view of our bags being sorted. Pretty incredible place. It's huge. Sorting and delivering around two million items a night. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. We hitch a ride on the early morning mail flight. We are under time pressures to go down to the Channel Islands. You've got the loaders there and the lorries waiting to take the freight on to the customers. Delivering vital supplies to the remote Channel Islands. Being in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in, and obviously this is priority. It's always urgent. A mystery air cargo has crew scratching their heads. Shall we have a quick look and see if we can see anything? At what's inside the box. We have to be extra careful. We don't want to drop this. Here we go. And an aircraft fire crew bravely enters the inferno. There's a lot of dangers that we need to be aware of, and we get two minutes to get there. As they tackle a full freighter blaze. External fires on the number one engine and underwing. Louisville, Kentucky, the home of fried chicken and the world's largest automated package handling facility. That's the air. Going by the grandiose title Worldport, UPS's most mega facility can process up to four million items a day. Something Jim still struggles to get his head around. Every time I come out to Worldport, uh, I'm still amazed after 15 years here. Every day we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. That's more than 20 million deliveries every single day. I enjoy driving around the airport. You have to have your head on a swivel while you're out here because there is a lot going on. I mean, you can see right in front of us, we have aircraft that'll be taxiing uh, down the ramps. And the one thing you have to remember is that airplanes always have the right of way. And so every time a vehicle on the ramp either goes forward or backs up, we honk. So we honk once to go forward and twice to go backwards. This is a place where size really does matter. Worldport's mega 5.2 million square feet hub, equivalent to 90 US football fields, caters for around 300 flights daily. That's an awful lot of packages to process. This operation is mind-boggling. To get two million packages a day sorted, we need just a gargantuan facility. Uh, we've moved things like whale sharks. Uh, it might be a critical medical shipment. It might be an e-commerce purchase, something you bought online. We can move just about anything, just about anywhere. A boast even more impressive when you consider most of this takes place while we're all in the land of Nod. So we're wrapping up our second day of operation during the day. It'll get quiet for a while, then the joint really starts jumping about midnight. And then we'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours, getting all that volume on the ground so we can get it in the building, get it sorted, and get it back out and delivered on time the next morning. So as the sun dips below the horizon, there's a real buzz in the air, not just from squadrons of aircraft, but also the nervous anticipation of an impending package tsunami. Uh, what's up, Bill? 
It's something that's all too familiar for the aptly named Chase, who faces nightly pursuits against delivery deadlines. It is very busy on the night side. It's kind of the start to the hustle and bustle. I've been on nights 11 years now. My wife does not like it that I work nights, but I do prefer nights over day sort. I got a good solid eight hours of sleep and ate a nice healthy dinner before I came in here, so I'm ready to go. Chase's first world port of call is one of five wings, the docking arms for the avalanche of arriving aircraft. Right now, we're headed into our, uh, our wing, our wing echo. You take your badge, badge into the badge reader. What that does is essentially clocks you in for the start of the sort. Come on with me and we'll walk into the inbound operation. What up? How you doing? What's up, dude? What's up, man? Hey, we got everybody ready for this? Yep, we're all set People up. People in place? Yep, ready right. to go, ready to go. You want the aircraft to be offloaded uh, as quickly as possible, and once they're inside, the inbound operation can start unloading those containers. So it's, it's a very fast-paced and uh, time-sensitive job. Here's the actual inbound aircraft right now coming down the runway. It's gonna make the turn, it's gonna actually park and block, and once it gets blocked in and we get the green light, we're gonna start the offload process. How long is it gonna take you to get this offloaded? Uh, I have it done in about 15 minutes tops. Probably closer to 10, but 15 times. I'll have it all in. It's approaching midnight, and it's crunch time. Literally, as hundreds of package containers crunch down on special rolling dogs. A person is up there using a joystick and controls to get the containers onto the K loader. They then lower it, and then the employees will then pull it from the K loader onto the dock where they use the roller system to get it into the inbound so that way we can start the unload process. Excuse me, slide it out of the way here. Thanks. Look down here, these rollers that are on the floor, these casters are designed to help shift containers easily. So like for instance, this AMJ right here, after it's fully loaded and can weigh anywhere between 5,000 and 6,000 pounds. It would probably take 10 people if they didn't have the casters. I don't know if I could move 5,000 pounds, but there might be somebody out there. This is now do or die for tonight's million plus package sorting onslaught. We are flowing 140,000 packages through. Hundreds of thousands of components must work perfectly to process these items and keep to Worldport's average sort time of just 13 minutes. Helping people get what they want, it makes me happy. I feel like one of Sandra's helpers. <laughs> It's 3.45 a.m. at East Midlands Airport, UK. While the country sleeps, Captain Nick Winter is preparing to become a real high flyer among Britain's postmen. Today we're going down to the Channel Islands. We're going to Jersey first and then Guernsey. We take up to about eight tonnes of mail and freight down to the Channel Islands. And as you can see, we start early so we can actually get down there. People are getting up in the Channel Islands and they want their uh, papers, their mail and their deliveries. And it's all delivered before nine o'clock. Yes, Nick helps provide the isolated Channel Islands with a crucial link to the outside world. His delivery weapon of choice is a British Aerospace ATP-F twin prop plane, a freighter known for its short haul efficiency. So we just have a check round, making sure there's no leaks, really hydraulic leaks or oil you can see on the floor or the tyres, make sure there's no splits and cuts, that the brakes are OK, general wear and tear you can see, and any signs of obvious damage really. But as you'll see on the flight, you get great views and uh, it's not a bad office in the sky, in fact. While Nick scrutinises his plane... This is just the hydraulics there, we're just making sure the levels are correct. First Officer James Cadman oversees the load of around three tonnes of freight, containing everything from urgent financial documents to medical vaccines. We're using a belt loader over here. Uh, one guy at the bottom is putting the boxes on and parcels. They've been brought to the top. Our guy here then is taking them down to the middle bay and loading them from there. We'll then fasten the nets around it to uh, ensure it's each bay, and that also helps load balance the aircraft by categorising each bay in different weights. This is an extra flight bag. If the aircraft wasn't in balance, it could 
effectively cause a crash on the aircraft. So it's very important to make sure that the aircraft is balanced at all points of flight. This is the last one. Yeah, this should all be it. That should be the lot, yeah. OK, that's good. We're very conscious about time, making sure we don't have delays. With the last package on board, it's time for liftoff. But first, their thoroughbred flying machine needs free rein. These are prop straps. Basically, what they do is ensure the props don't move in high winds, hit anyone in the head or anything like that, really. Safety is king. Then... It's up, up and away. The first leg of this mega postal run is a 250-mile blast to Jersey. Then, after a short 24-mile hop to Guernsey, back home. M6 is backing up as per usual. Yep. The dawn is breaking. We are under uh, time pressures to go down to the Channel Islands. It affects a knock-on effect if you're late onto the other two islands as well. And then, of course, you've got the loaders there and the lorries waiting to take the freight on to the customers and to the shops. Their daily task, fly 520 miles and make two offloads in just over four hours. But for now, James's head is filled with more weighty matters. When we get to uh, Jersey, we're going to lose certain amounts of load off the aircraft. So we'll probably lose bay one, two and three, leaving Guernsey with bay four and seven. We're going to Jersey first, which is straight ahead. The islands do suffer from fog. Uh, quite often we'll come down and we'll have to hold um, if it's foggy. Sometimes we can't get in and we have to go all the way back to East Midlands. Later, we'll find out whether the Channel Islands weather gods are in benevolent mood. Or if not, the islanders will be left stranded, empty-handed. There's some cloud cover down there, isn't there? As we've seen, East Midlands Airport is one of Britain's busiest hubs for air cargo. This multi-billion vital artery to UK trade must be protected at all costs. And part of that huge responsibility falls on the resident fire rescue crew. On a daily basis, we're kind of prepped for anything, effectively. It could be a passenger aircraft or indeed a freight aircraft. Each have their own inherent dangers the cargo side of operations. There's a lot more vehicular issues we'll have in relation to access because the aircraft, if it's on stand, it might be loading, unloading. It might have dangerous goods on it. It might have animals on it because we move animals through East Midlands Airport as well. So there's a lot of dangers that we need to be aware of en route. And we get two minutes, not exceeding three, to get there. In order to meet this critical target, practice makes perfect. And tonight, the fire crew are on one of their regular training drills, using a dummy aircraft fuselage. The route we take is just around the perimeter of the airfield. Um, obviously, we have to be mindful of all the other operations. One of the concerns we have when flying passengers see big rates of fire on the corner of the airfield, it doesn't always project a good impression. But obviously we need to make sure that we're all competent within our roles and be able to operate during the day and the night. So tonight we've got a freight aircraft that has a single engine at the rear on the tail and two engines, one on each wing. We've got aircraft taxiing up now onto the uh, 27 end that are about to take off. We've got aircraft on the, on the Alpha taxiway. We've got uh, aircraft being loaded and unloaded, passengers, cargo. That's all happening as we stand here and we plan our exercise. This firefighting rig is a Frankenstein aircraft made from sections of the 737, 757 and 767 and fitted with industrial-sized gas burners. So effectively, I can control the on-off of the main burner. Uh, the engine the pilots are lit. The guys, I can see are now just turning around at the, uh, the holding point. So as soon as they radio up, we can call them into an aircraft fire. 
Rescue 3 of a running call. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine fire. I'm going to start up the fires. This first warm-up engine drill is all about containing the danger of a jet fuel fire that can burn at a metal melting 2,200 degrees Celsius. Wearing heavy-duty proximity suits, Jez's crew must try to extinguish the blaze within minutes. So I'm looking at the monitor spray from the front of the aircraft, and the snozzle, which is positioned at the rear of the aircraft, now will deploy. It's a slight, a slower process, but the snozzle can get a lot closer than the other two. Happening now as the lads have changed their uh, tactical to defence. Oh, no! The lads and lads have now stepped out of the, uh, the, in the risk area because the fire's been extinguished. But when they've done that, is they've opened up their spray branches to afford them as much protection as possible should there be a reignition. Engine fire dealt with. Later, after a minor hiccup. H, have you got the lighter? Yeah. It's a bit daft, isn't it, firing without a lighter? The heat is cranked up to the max with a full cargo inferno. Please respond to an aircraft. It has multiple fires. There are dangerous goods on board. In Louisville, USA, it's midnight and crunch time for the world's largest package sorting facility. We got everybody ready for this? Yep, we're all set People up. People in place? Yep, ready right. to go, ready to go. As thousands of containers, containing up to 400 packages each, are humped into the main sorting core, they're separated into three groups. Irregulars or oversized items, parcels, and smalls. You guessed it, small items. Okay, can you drop a D-bagger on 3 Delta, please? And don't be misled by their name. Smalls make the biggest slice of the sorting pie. Small sort is where a lot of volume runs through. We run anywhere from 54 to 60% of volume sometimes. So small sort's where it's at. <laughs> when I'm in this room, I'm always looking at the production to see how our volume is flowing. So we scan through the cameras and uh, look at where we're at on our flows. Our production numbers are really, really amazing. We are flowing. 140,000 packages there. Outside April's sanctuary, the rush is on. Worldport has set a fraught average sort time for packages inbound to outbound of just 13 minutes. This place is very big. Lots of equipment, lots of people. The first part of the humongous sorting process is debagging. Despite its college initiation connotations, debagging is removing the contents from mail bags into chutes. We feed the beast. We make sure that we're keeping our flow up so that we can send it to the bags. They can then load it and put it on the aircraft and go. It's all on who can get the most. <laughs> and perhaps young Wyatt here is taking that challenge too much to heart. His approach a little too keen. Wyatt, he uh, loves the D-bag and he definitely, uh, he definitely, it's his, it's his favorite things. Yep, he likes to be up here. I gotta make sure he's on track. It's like a beehive in there. We're the workers um, helping people get their package. You know, when you come in, you see all this, you think to yourself, am I ready for this? Working day in, day out among boxes and bags has led Wyatt to ponder on one of Worldport's imponderables. I've been asking myself this question, which is more important, the bags or the boxes? That's been on my mind for years. What's the answer? Bags. I love how heavy it is. The more stuff you get, the more you can pull it in. I feel like one of Santa's helpers. <laughs> At the other end of Wyatt's chute, is where the rather creepily named inductors take over. All right, so here we are inducting. She is making sure the labels are placed up. We have cameras that read the label that 
destination, the zip code, and then it sorts to the area it needs to go to. The sorting is done by a staggering 155 miles of conveyor belts. As packages travel nearly five miles per hour, scanners read the destination barcodes and divert them to their correct destinations. Automated genius. The packages are being sorted and the trays tilt into the bag. We have hundreds of bag positions with several destinations. So this one right here looks like it's going to Texas. We uh, fill our bag up, put our label on, we take it off, and then we put it over here on this. This is called our return line. Once it's on the return line, it gets shifted out, and then they decide on which destination it's going to. This is our view. It sure is. But a short distance away, fingernails are being chewed nervously. All UPS flights worldwide are planned and uh, tracked out of this building here. Their main operations center must not only ensure Worldport runs smoothly, but keep thousands of global flights on track. It's an early season snowstorm that's indicated on radar here, so we're evaluating the impact of that. 16,000 feet over the English Channel. There's some cloud cover down there, isn't there? Yeah, a little bit, but I don't think it's too much. The East Midlands cargo plane dodges the threat of fog and touches down on the small island of Jersey. Their first leg of their round-robin delivery trip to the Channel Islands. We're here. Great. There are no toilets on this stripped-down freighter, so first thing Captain Nick and First Officer James do is dash off for a very welcome break. Taking over is a human chain of handlers up against a demanding deadline. Work together, try and do it as, as quick and safe as possible. Being an island, obviously we need all these parcels for, for various companies every day, and the service is run uh, four days a week, so it's really important to have it. And it keeps us on a job as well. Because this aircraft brings uh, cargo to Jersey and it goes to Guernsey with some cargo as well. So the guys are waiting over there, obviously, being in the morning, all the customers are waiting. They want, they want the stuff as quick as possible. So when it comes here, we've got the pressure of turning it around quick so it goes to Guernsey and, and that's how they can get their stuff as well. Normally, we've got a limit of 20 minutes. Uh, that's the time given by the airline, but we uh, sometimes we take more or less. Today. Today's going to be a bit quicker because the camera is rolling, so... <laughs> um, it is time critical. It's always pressure <laughs> to be away on time. Now we finished up at the back, so now we have some more cargo at the front. We're just going to move the truck into the front. It's always, always on pressure. That's it for you. Lovely. Off you go, off you go. Noah here has swapped one island for another. Tropical Madeira in the Atlantic Ocean for northerly Jersey. It's just the need for a Jersey that makes him grumble. I've done it for 15 years now, and I, I, I kind of like doing it, especially when the weather's nice. In the winter, not so much, but that's one of the things of the job. We're making good progress, and it'll be another five, 10 minutes, we'll be done. There's a lot of medicine coming in, and obviously this is priority. As soon as it comes in, our customers are waiting to get it delivered because it's got um, medicine for the hospital, it's always urgent. That's why it's essential to have this service on the island nearly every day. Precisely 19 minutes after the East Midlands plane came to its stand, Noah and his colleagues have completed the two tons offload. That's it, ready to go. Job done. All safe to go and offload it, so we're ready to push. All right, thanks very much. Thank you, thank you. We're going to push in a minute. It's going to take off and fly to Guernsey. Now it's time for a cup of tea, and tomorrow's another day. So Noah can enjoy his cuppa, knowing he came through the frantic airmail run with flying colours. Now the pressure shifts to neighbouring Guernsey. Can they beat the 9am deadline with less than an hour to go? 
Right, now we'll have to fault lift the pallets that's on the board. So they need to be turned round and back out again to the stand spray. Helsinki Airport, Finland. Over 150,000 tonnes of cargo shuttle their way through this key Scandinavian hub each year. But every now and again, it throws up the odd curveball. Uh, here we have a, quite an interesting bit of cargo, actually, something unusual, uh, which has arrived from Germany today and has to get to a gallery in New York. So what, what do we have here? This looks, this is an unusual shape. It is, I know. I'm trying to work out what this is. By day, Peter Seaman is a strategist, but these odd-shaped boxes are bringing out his inner sleuth. Yeah. Shall we have a quick look and see if we can see anything? Can't see very much here. Normally you can't see anything. No. I mean, it's high value, obviously, I would yes. imagine. It's, it's one of a kind, and it's good that these guys are trusting us to carry something so fragile. Yeah. As I understand, because of its odd shape and dimensions, you'll take it down there, you'll leave it in the kind of the, the general cargo yes. area, yes. and then it'll be have a special place. People will know where to pick it yes. up. OK, All perfect. Right. Great. And now we start the job. Well, Lowry here better take care. For all he knows, he could be carrying a Lowry, a million pound painting by the famous 20th century English artist. So not the time to get into a pallet palava. So the thing is that I was planning to put that pallet on that side, but it's not possible because it's a little bit unstable. We still have to figure that out. We have to be extra careful. We don't want to drop this. Air cargo gets compactly assembled into multi-item pallets for optimal storage in aircraft. But the best method is still open for debate. Okay. We have to do it, do it again because our supervisor just came here. We have to do it. We have to put the smaller box over here, but we also want to keep it those boxes safe. So that's why we add this wood. So the weight goes all the way here and here. Here we go. Now we're gonna complete the Tetris game. Last one. Yes, the flight pallet. It's 100% done. Congratulations. After applying a rope netting to keep his precious pallet securely bound, Lowry sends it into Helsinki's high-tech elevated transport vehicle storage area. Tough job. <laughs> or in other words, it's the place where robots rule. No humans are allowed in this area. This is all automated. But yeah, it's very futuristic. People in the control centre, they know where every single item is. And so they can program these cranes to then take one of the items and move them to the other side, ready for them going onto a plane. Once the clever crane channels our mystery art boxes out to its designated aircraft, on this occasion a wide-bodied A330, it leaves Peter's care with him still none the wiser of what's inside. We've just finished the loading and they're just waiting for final checks and then push back from the gate. And uh, yeah, this flight takes off in, in, in 20 minutes. So this is headed to a gallery in New York. It's packed safely. And as far as I know, everything's gone really smoothly. So um, we'll have a happy uh, gallery owner in New York. The Anna's Arena Art Gallery in Manhattan, New York, has a growing reputation for showcasing art that challenges minds and perceptions. But more importantly, after a great deal of speculation, the time has finally come to reveal 
What's in the boxes? What is the price? Oh dear, not what we were expecting at all. It just goes to show, when it comes to air cargo, it always has the ability to shock. In the dead of night at East Midlands, there's a stench of smouldering aircraft. I'm going to start up the fires. We have an aircraft which has got an engine fire. The airport fire crew are mid-training drill to ensure they're prime, ready to deal with any emergency at this vital UK air cargo hub. Just going to check the fires to see if they still work. They stay lit, are they? Is it still lit? But as the team prepares for their second drill, this time a simulation of a full freighter inferno, there's one key ingredient missing. Fire. We just need a lighter to, uh, to start proceeding. Small seeds grow eight, eight no, what is it? Small acorns grow big trees. And the small lighters get big incidents. That's what we need it for. The pilot flame for the aircraft's internal gas burners to initiate the fire has gone out. You got the lighter? The things are out. H, have you got the lighter? What? You got the lighter? You got the lighter? Yeah, it's a bit daft, isn't it? Firing without a lighter. Eventually, some bright spark comes up trumps. Oh, I it. Yeah, you got it, yeah. I'll I'll bring it. Lighting, yeah. I'll light it. Just light this one back up. And the giant gas flamethrowers can be ignited, ready for the big burn. On stand one, two, one. It has multiple fires. There are dangerous goods on board, and the pilot's decision is to evacuate both him and his two other personnel. I can confirm multiple fires. Depending on various factors, fires can spread from the exterior fuselage to the interior cabin in 90 seconds. Oh, there's bloody fires, eh? And with pretend aircraft crew on board, it's all about rapidly containing the blaze. So now you'll see the deployment slightly varies because we've got the monitors at the front that have to be very mindful of the vehicle at the back. OK, so I'm looking at the monitor spray. We're looking at the deployment of the snozzle the effectiveness and rapidness of where the guys are bringing out the sidelines, enabling them to deal with the undercarriage, underwing and engine fires. An airport fire engine can pump out 5,650 gallons of water per minute and it takes three trucks to quell the flames. All the fires are now covered effectively. Station managers pass all those relevant messages. External fires on the number one engine and on the wing, now extinguished, Trevor. The guys are now setting up for breathing apparatus. From a training perspective, we're just set up to ensure that we're going to check the internal temperatures of the aircraft, we'll check for heat transfer, and there's uh, the report from the pilots with the dangerous goods, etc., to make sure everything's still intact. But most importantly, the aircraft is safe to enter. We have certain skill sets, as um, Liam Neeson would say, that we could use to assist in the stabilisation and the safety of the aircraft. Temperatures inside a charred cabin can top out at 810 degrees Celsius. Oh, losing you. While smoke inhalation and other deadly fumes can kill in seconds. Come on. After the crew gives the charred aircraft rig the all clear, another important fire drill is home and hosed. Thanks for your efforts, some really good exercises tonight. Uh, lots of good teamwork, that's what we're all here for. Thank you. The biggest things we need to bear in mind is that whilst we're undertaking this training, there is a reason and we can't 
imagine and, and put in place every scenario, but the reality is we could get a call out, even now, to any job, uh, to any style, type, size of aircraft that operates out of East Midlands Airport. So there's a massive array of potential risks and hazards that we have to be educated in, and every other firefighter can make correct decisions on scene in a timely manner. And at the end of the day, who doesn't love running out of fire? The early morning air package and postal run is entering its critical final phase. Because this aircraft goes to Guernsey with some cargo as well, so the guys are waiting over there. They want the stuff as quick as possible. Having made a dawn flying delivery to the Channel Island Jersey, the plane touches down in neighbouring Guernsey with just 45 minutes to offload a tonne of freight, ready for the start of the business day. Everyone knows their job, get on with it, and uh, away we go. It doesn't take us that long. It takes longer if it's all loose loaded, but today we had quite a few pallets, so it's a lot quicker. We get the forklift and on later with forklift. Not raining for a change, so it's, it's all good. As you can see, we haven't got that many stands here, so we can't really accommodate for lots of planes being stuck on the ground. So they need to be turned around and back out again so the stand's free. By 9 a.m., the 2,615 cubic feet cargo hold is bare. All the Channel Islands urgent mail and packages have been delivered. It's all good. Fully offloaded, we're just going to take the chocks, the cones away, and then we get these boys started up and they'll be off on their way. The only bags left are under Captain Nick's eyes, courtesy of his 3 a.m. start. What we'll do is just go and check the aircraft. It all looks secure and just check the ballast is secure. You just need to balance it because it's very nose heavy, this aircraft. The ballast in here can either be sort of concrete blocks or it's containers full of water and it's all strapped down so it's nice and secure. We need to carry that so the aircraft can trim. We just about made it on time today. So we're just gonna close up now and then we're, we're ready to go. There are certainly no frills on this island package holiday. And after personally stowing his aircraft stepladder, Captain Nick takes the controls and guides his twin prop into the great blue yonder. But he wouldn't have it any other way. If you tell people you're a pilot, they, they straight away think you're flying long haul for BA. That's all they think the pilots do. And they don't realise that people actually fly mail and cargo. Then they ask you, well, do, do you actually want to become a proper pilot, fly passengers, fly for a proper airline? but they don't realise that when you're sitting in the front, it's the same job. It doesn't matter what's in the back, whether it's freight or passengers. People think it's a very glamorous life being a pilot, but uh, if they come and spend a few nights, they'd see the realities of the dark, the cold. What we do miss on our aircraft, of course, is that, uh, a toilet. Around four hours after their pre-dawn departure, and bladders sloshing like the 200 litres of ballast in the back, and Captain Nick and First Officer James return safely to home airport, East Midlands. Good morning, boys. How are we doing? Fine, are you? Yeah, not too bad. Pretty standard day, to be honest. We left on time and got back pretty much on time, so can't really complain. It's a different job. It's not a nine-to-five job. It's quite varied and it's good for your flying skills because you're doing short sectors as well and people are great that you fly with so um, yeah it's an interesting job. Now we've, we've done a good job today. We can go and have some breakfast now. <laughs> in the early hours of the morning in America, the Louisville residents are in deep slumber, oblivious to the frantic rush at Worldport as they sought the world's urgent package deliveries. Everything going good tonight so far? Yeah. Very good. Pulling the myriad levers of this vast, complex planetary enterprise is the UPS nerve center. We're only going in one main room. It's all open. What they call the global operations center. This is the core where uh, all the activity happens. All UPS flights worldwide are planned and uh, tracked out of this building here. 
To do this job, you need to be an excellent problem solver, uh, as well as uh, ability to handle multiple issues at one time. Helping to weather this storm of logistical headaches are Worldport's resident meteorologists. I don't like doing this at three o'clock in the morning. This seamless, multi-billion dollar global operation depends on them accurately navigating UPS's fleet of over 250 aircraft past an oft tempestuous Mother Nature. We have uh, a lot of numerical models that I can look at. The tools I use to make my forecasts of uh, snow amounts or rain amounts or where the thunderstorm activity is going to be in, in the future. Now what we're looking at here tonight is an early season snowstorm that's indicated on radar here. It's going to produce uh, one to three inches of snow for Des Moines, Omaha, and Kansas City. So we're evaluating that and the impact of that on the airline over the next 24 hours. So we have five meteorologists here, and if the meteorologists weren't here providing weather information for the planners, their planning process uh, would be deteriorated. It's this daily pressure to deliver that makes Worldport's five meteorological musketeers believe they're indeed a cut above. We trust each other. We do our own forecast and I don't pay much attention to what other people are saying. I don't listen to the TV guys. <laughs> Away from the relative calm of the high-tech global operations center, down on the shop floor, the place is buzzing. Sucks, yeah. As over one million packages are being processed. With an average 13-minute sort time per item, the pressure is at its greatest. Loaders must rapidly and efficiently pack cavernous cargo containers ready for the waiting planes. There's always a high sense of urgency. Every package is a customer. So you always want to get them from a cart, from a chute, into a container as soon as possible, so that way we can make sure that we get everything out on a nightly basis. But for the workers, it's not all work, work, work. A lot of people will, will play a game. So if they load a, a container like this every night, they try to up how many packages they can get in between this one and the next one. So if they fit 500 in this container, they'll try to get 600 in the next container. If you had to, com if you had to compare what we do on a nightly basis, it's play Tetris of how much you can actually fit into one of these containers. Signs that I've checked everything and it's good. Put it in the pouch, hand her the seal so she can seal it up. So within roughly 30 seconds of a container pushing back, a new container will be brought in to be loaded and the same process will continue until it's time to pull the aircraft. It's a hustle, it's a bustle, it's a fast paced job. There's a lot going on, you're dealing with a lot of people on a nightly basis, but it, it's fun uh, and it's what you make it. The final stage of the relentless rush to deliver packages is the aircraft load. Dock 11's getting here at 150. Yeah. All right. So taking a look at this, our Dock 11 is the inbound Long Beach is actually arriving at 150. And that's where our old friend Charles Myers has to bring his A game. It's got a load time of 2.32 a.m. We're always under strict time constraints here. Minutes matter, seconds matter, so we want to do everything we can to get these planes out on time. Being Worldport, it's no surprise that even during this most manual task, humping container cans onto planes, technology still plays a part. I'll put the weights in right here, and when I, when I put the weight in, it'll, it'll, it'll turn blue that it's good, and when it goes in, posi in position up there, they also have, a, uh, have one of these up there where they scan the can, and once that can is in position scanned, it'll turn green on, my, on mine. It lets me know that we're good, that that can's in the right spot. Once the last can is in the can, the first of hundreds of fully loaded planes takes to the skies. Part of the never-ending round-the-clock race to deliver packages to you and me. Roughly tonight we'll process uh, 1.2 million packages. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. 
being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway and laughing at me. And incredible operations. This is a little bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode, go. it's go, 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 as we roar into the ultra-competitive world of Formula One. If it doesn't go, we don't get it. If we don't get it, we don't race. If we don't race, I get the sack. On a high-pressure pack to get tons of gear to the season opener in Australia. People turn their TVs on, watch a two-hour event, but what goes behind it is quite extraordinary. Staying with Formula One... Hang on, that's my foot. ..we delve into its rich history. Now we're just going to block it in. Always remembering not to screw yourself to the case. <laughs> As a world champion's former motor goes airborne. It's a historic vehicle, so obviously it's a bit special compared to the normal moves that we have. We're all happy. And we follow every fraught step of a life-saving batch of pharmaceuticals. The aircraft needs to be gone, or otherwise the flight is going to be delayed for tomorrow morning. Halfway round the world to a pioneering medical facility. We are top unloading everything. Because we have a heavy rain, and we have a lightning alert. Uh, we have totally top. Banbury, UK, and base for the Haas F1 team. Players in the maddest, baddest sport on the planet. If you talk to anybody in the freight industry or whatever, what are you doing, we're doing this, they just think you're mad. It's like a good game of Tetris. Every year, billions of dollars are spent taking 10 teams, their cars and crew, on a nine-month, gruelling global tour. Everybody's got the role to play to make sure that these cars go racing 21 times a year. Ready, go! To reveal the inside track of the mind-boggling logistics to run in F1, has granted us exclusive access in the build-up to their 2019 season. Unfortunately, you can't buy a, uh, a Formula One car shipping set off the shelf, so it's, everything's custom-built. And it all starts here. It's February. For a few short days, a sleepy Barcelona suburb becomes the base for the fastest and flashiest motor racing circus, Formula One. Just weeks before lights out for the season's first Grand Prix in Australia, the teams, technicians and drivers descend here for the all-important pre-season testing. The day we have today is to shake down our 
VF19. It's the first time our brand new car has run. You basically want to try and hit the ground running. If you're going to have any problems, you want to have them today so it doesn't impact your full test program. Today is our first test day of the year, and what you normally do on the first day, you just uh, make sure that everything works on the car, try to get as much mileage in as, as possible, uh, and get the first feeling of the car. As team principal, Gunther is the driving force behind F1 Upstart's Haas. Since an impressive debut in 2016, they've put pedal to metal, finishing fifth in the 2018 Constructors' Championship. Haas F1 is the newest team, the youngest team in Formula One, uh, but we are here to stay. There's a lot of secrecy in Formula One. Obviously, you know, you, you, you want to keep your design somewhat uh, out of the hands of the competition. You're trying to get that competitive advantage over each other. But there is one open secret. Tireless planning and preparation translates to track success. So the logistics in Formula One are very complex. Uh, you know, when we do the flyaway races, we're taking 70 tons of freight. There's a lot of bits and pieces that you have to cart around the world, and then there's a lot of big ticket items as well. We ship everything uh, by air. It is quite intense, and uh, you need to package very wisely because obviously it costs a lot of money. So uh, less you send and better you package it, less money you spend, and you can spend that money better on developing the car going faster. So with a multi-million pound move to race one in Australia days away, the buck stops with head of race team operations, Jeff Simmons. That's a varied job, which is why I like it. So but one of the main, main aspects of it is, uh, is logistics and freight. Because of the timeline between the races, it's the quickest, most efficient way, it's air freight. We carry 11 aircraft pallets, which is why we know it's 34,000 kilos of freight, because that's what we send every time, approximately. F1 is very much a can-do attitude. We will always achieve it. You know, no, there's nothing we can't do, really. Fighting words indeed. As the Barcelona test winds down, the countdown begins for the start of the Formula One season. Pack up tonight, get everything sorted, load the trucks, send them back to Banbury, fly home, then spend four days loading the freight and then uh, fly out to Australia, build the cars and hopefully have a successful race. The Swiss, famous for chocolate, holy cheese, pen knives, and that good old phlegm gurgling pastime, yodeling. Well, now you can add pharmaceuticals. We have a lot of pharmaceutical industry in Switzerland. Uh, for us, this is uh, very important. In Basel, we have two largest uh, pharmaceutical companies uh, of the world. One of Basel City's big players is Lampracht Pharma Logistics, and responsible for sales is Claudine. We are a specialized company uh, for warehousing and transportation of pharmaceutical goods. We're going now to the warehouse so that you see where actually the medicine you're taking at home are stored and how they are treated. We're just offloading here some goods which will then be stored into the racks. The whole building is temperature controlled, with pest controlled, so that really your medicine you're taking at home is safe and of good quality. Ironically, the pharma industry can be bad for blood pressure. Critical emergencies are always ready to pounce. This morning we received an urgent life-saving shipment. I'm not allowed to tell you exactly what it is. We have always to maintain the privacy of our customers. And uh, the, a patient is waiting in Singapore for this very important and critical shipment. It needs to be kept at two to eight degrees all the way down to Singapore. We are now going in the cool room to prepare the shipment. Singapore is quite hot, so this is why we pack it in a passive packaging. Think of passive packaging like a giant picnic cool box. But if it fails and extremely valuable drugs spoil, it'll sure be a bitter pill to swallow. 
This is a special box maintaining the temperature of 2 to 8 degrees during at least 96 hours. These plates here are cooling elements. They have to be preconditioned at the desired temperature. So there will, is one layer on the bottom. There are cooling elements around. And then on top, again, we put cooling elements. So really, the shipment is surrounded by the right temperature. To ensure the cool box does indeed keep contents cool. So I start it. It's blinking. A data logger is added. We put it in here. We scan the, the label. And now the shipment can be monitored now online. To finish, more cooling. Then anti-tamper strapping is added. And the box is ready. The driver is here, the pallet is finished, and off he go, because we are a little bit in a time pressure. This is crunch time. Leaving the sanctity of the temperature-controlled warehouse, the cool box will have to weather frigid Switzerland, then sweltering Singapore tropics on its 6,500 mile journey. At Swiss World Cargo's Operations Control Center in Zurich Airport, Roman is putting plans in place for the incoming pharmaceuticals. We just have received a phone call for a very urgent pharmaceutical shipment from Basel to Zurich. will arrive in a few hours. We have already informed CorgoLogic to build it up according to the physical needs. And we are going to plan the shipment in the front compartment of a 777 because it is temperature controlled. And we are planning to load it right here. It is important to maintain the temperature of the shipment in the aircraft because it is going on a long haul flight for about 12 plus hours. And therefore it's very important that it's it is stored according to its temperature needs. With the clock ticking, the truck is making good progress on its 55-mile journey to Zurich. At the airport, handlers Cargo Logic specialize in processing temperature-controlled, time-critical pharmaceuticals. And this is what I love about this place, the quality standard is always high, and we would like to keep it that way. Now we're expecting the truck, my colleague is informing me that the truck coming. We're gonna check the, the match between the documents and the, the shipment, if this is the, the, the correct shipment. And as you see, the shipment is being secured from all sizes because this is a special requirement of the customer. It's good now, after I give this green light, this shipment is ready to go to our warehouses. Having passed its physical, the box is sent into cold storage to wait for boarding. But as we'll see, cargo holdups in the hold turn into a sticky issue. So the aircraft needs to be gone before 11 p.m. or otherwise uh, the, the flight is going to be delayed for tomorrow morning. In Banbury, Haas F1 Team HQ is a hive of activity. The Formula One season is 10 days away, which means just 48 hours to pack a mountain of materials for air freighting to Australia. We're trying to make cars go fast around the world, but we're also making sure that we get that stuff around the world. Formula One is no stranger to spending a lot of money, and that money is spent even on just the customization of freight boxes, pallets for cars to go on. Uh, it's not just as simple as putting two cars on the back of a truck and off they go. It's a case of all the equipment, all the tires, uh, you know, pit gun equipment, pit walls, you know, th those little things, everything's got to go. Really, until you've kind of seen it for yourself, you just, you just can't appreciate the sheer scale that's uh, involved. So, no pressure and no missing nuts or bolts for operations manager, Tom. Over the next 24 hours, as we get ready to pack all our air freight for Australia, everything will be uh, palletized, uh, packed up into the air freight. The cars, as you see them on the track, they comprise uh, a chassis. They then have a front wing on the front of them. They have an engine, a gearbox, uh, and then the rear wing on the back. We travel the cars as, as just chassis as they are at the moment. So that chassis will be put in and then everything is then assembled at the circuit to make it a full car. 
Unfortunately, you, you can't buy a Formula One car shipping set off the shelf, so it's, everything's custom built. This is how the chassis will travel to Australia, be put into that frame so it's nice and rigid. That will then be built up into a pallet and will then go onto the freighter to Australia. The pit stop box is there. Struggling to compute the number of moves that would make a chess grandmaster wince is operations chief, Jeff. So we've already started loading. It's Wednesday, Wednesday afternoon. There's 5,000 pieces that make up a car, but how do you break that down? There's a lot of pieces. There's 34,000 kilograms of pieces, ranging from car parts, nuts and bolts, to IT equipment, to clothing, to driver's equipment. The whole range and the people involved in the different jobs to get it on there is, is, is massive. These are our containers, uh, the ones with the angle on are a Q7. So basically what that's doing is following the contour of the aeroplane, and that's why you have the angle. The pallets over there, we've got a lower deck wing, the lower one, that's because it goes on the bottom half of the aeroplane. We can get anything up to about four and a half tonnes worth of kit in those. Uh, we have 11 of them, Blimey, oh, nine that we run to that shape, and two that we... Even I've got to think about that. We have eight we run to that, nine we run to that shape, two we run to that shape. Jeff better be sure. With air cargo costing eye-watering sums, he's on track for a multi-million pound bill to get cars and kit over to Oz. But he's no option. We have to use air because time, we don't have time to wait three weeks. 21 races, and if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year, which is never going to happen, not in my life. So, so we have to use air. Rather than having all the loose bits at the top or little things like the air bottles, you can get that down here on the sub-assembly stuff. There's no doubt the F1 pressure cooker can turn anyone into a quivering wreck. That is not going to fit. So, to let off steam... Let's just have a little stretch out. We'll just do a cut the side twist first. Jeff and co get in touch with their inner yogi. Feel the burn. I don't want to hold you up. I know you've got a lot on, so once we get this done... Because the last thing I want today is to hurt yourself. I need you on Saturday and Sunday to be on the aeroplane. Do the arm swings, try not to punch the bloke next to you. Cool. Right, let's rock it. But I do find it stressful. We don't exactly make it easy for ourselves, do we? You know, we're going to the farthest point from the UK in order to race cars, and if we haven't got anything, we can't go down to Halfords and buy a bit. It's unique, it's bespoke. If the paper is wrong, it doesn't go. If it doesn't go, we don't get it. If we don't get it, we don't race. If we don't race, I get the sack. At Zurich Airport, a batch of life-saving pharmaceuticals is on its way to the cold storage center. As handlers aim to keep it at a strict 2 to 8 degrees Celsius all the way to Singapore. So we are at the moment here in our warehouse. Uh, on the other side, we call it air side because we are after the security control. We are going now to the flight preparations to palletize the shipment. Because it's a cool shipment, we have to bring it directly to the container to guarantee that the cool chain is not broken. It's all about keeping it cool as long as possible prior to the flight. But outside, they may get too cool. The temperature is well below freezing, putting at risk the minimum two degrees drug storage. This specific shipment to Singapore, we need to do a, a time-sensitive planning, so we can't just let the shipment sit at, uh, at an open bay. It's very important that we keep the transit time short, and then we have to make sure that the shipment uh, gets into a climate-controlled environment as soon as possible. That means tonight, ramp manager Andre can't afford a single hiccup with the freight load. We're in the process of loading the last long-haul flights for tonight and we're loading it uh, in order to uh, fly to Singapore at the quarter past uh, 11. It's very important. People are waiting for uh, these trucks uh, to get to Singapore on this flight, so we need to load them on this particular aircraft as soon as possible. The aircraft in question is a Boeing 777-300 passenger airline equipped with a climate-controlled hold for temperature-sensitive cargo. 
there's uh, about 300 passengers uh, sitting on top of uh, the cargo compartment right here and below the wing, which is everything about loading, baggage, cargo and stuff. You see here is uh, the containers with your pharmaceuticals being pushed into the hold and then moved automatically to the loading position. And the positions for these pharmaceutical containers here is also reported to the cockpit crew uh, in order to provide uh, the air condition, the temperature it needs to be uh, flown to Singapore. As the final containers are loaded, the captain is notified what's on board and crucially, Great. where? Do we have something special this evening? Uh, yes, we have some pharmaceuticals, valuables and the temperature setting. Okay, great. Pharmaceutical is in the aft. So we have low, that's seven degrees, what we need today. But minutes before departure time, in the hold, there's a hold up. A container is jammed. So it's a challenge to handle such situations. Zurich is closing the airport at 11 p.m. So uh, yeah, that's what we call a night ban. So the aircraft needs to be gone before 11 p.m. Afterwards, we have to ask for an exception um, or otherwise uh, the, the flight is gonna be delayed for tomorrow morning. But a strong Swiss shove does the trick. And just in time, the plane departs for Singapore. It's the last plane that's going to leave Zurich tonight, so uh, afterwards, we're done. But when they get there, the volatile tropics will put our pharmaceuticals back in peril. In a quiet corner of Sussex, the sheep, cows, and ornamental pig at Starve Mouse Farm are blessed with an esteemed visitor. One that can only be described as bona fide racing royalty. Big day today. We're preparing a Formula One car for shipping out to the Middle East. It was bought for around 1.1 million by a private individual and we're sending it out to him to, to his home. It's not every day you get to be surrounded by amazing cars, especially Formula One cars. They're always locked away behind closed doors. Yes, sitting in a giant freight forwarding barn is world champion Kimi Raikkonen's screaming banshee of a car, the 2002 F1 McLaren Mercedes. I think that's a fantastic bit of care, isn't it? Looks great. A car that took teammate David Coulthard to Monaco victory, but sadly for Kimi, he crashed. Let's hope a similar fate doesn't befall our removal men as they crate it for air transport. Never done a Formula One car, this is the first. Pretty much a square object in a square box. The only challenge is getting it up onto the base. We can't physically lift it, so we've got to roll it up. Very, very small ground clearance on it. So, you know, we can't damage it. I'm just gonna mark where the car needs to sit and then we'll be good to go. We've gotta go up and flat. Because it's so low to the floor, I'm worried about it. What's that, about an inch? It's meant to hit the floor at 200 miles an hour, so shouldn't do it any damage, should it? Well, time to test that theory. Slowly, slowly. Give the 1.1 million pound racer a shove and pray they don't get into an almighty scrape. Yeah, well, clear this end. Go on, go on, go on. It's looking pretty good. Come back, fella. Go on, hold on. Uh oh. Is this what they all dreaded? Hang on, that's my foot. Lovely. <laughs> Not really. <laughs> Just got my foot in the way. All right, you boys got it. Go on, go on. Go on, go on, go on, all the way up to that timber. Right, we're there. You see? So, apart from minor collateral damage, a few crushed tootsies, they've cleared their biggest hurdle. 
That went about as smoothly as you were ever going to get it to go. Doesn't get any easier than that. Now we're just going to block it in. Always remembering not to screw yourself to the case. <laughs> Just chucking it in so it won't roll backwards and forwards. We'll block it down the side as well, just to stop the front wheel turning. And then we're going to put straps over each of the tyres to stop the car from bouncing up and down. It's going to go on a plane. Um, it's literally just to stop it from jumping out over the blocks and smashing into the cuts. Right, boys, crank them up. It's going really well, the guys are um, getting it secured down onto the pallet and then we'll start to get the sides on and build the crate up around the car. <laughs> We're creating the car fully because um, it's a bit more delicate, there's a lot more intricate parts to the car, the carbon fibre, bits that could potentially you know, break off if it was out in the open, so it's just safer to have it in a crate. Just an hour after they first laid hands on her, the F1 car... Fingers. Not on your fingers is fully crated. Very nice. Once it's carefully placed on the lorry... Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, keep coming. Keep going, that'll do ya. So next stop, the plane. Kimi's former car is sent for onward transit to the Middle East. It's going to Luxembourg, flying a cargo Lux freighter. Smooth as anything, easy, nice. No dramas, apart from running over Michael's foot. There you go, he's got another one. And with that... ..the team hot-footed. Four days later, Kimi's car is on its final call for loading at Luxembourg Airport. Good out. Today we're uh, loading uh, Kimi Raikkonen's car uh, from the uh, Formula One uh, of 2002. It's a historic vehicle, so obviously it's a bit special compared to the normal moves that we have. And um, we're happy to be part of that story. From the outside, it's just a box transiting through Luxembourg and connecting our Boeing 747-8 today onto Doha. It's a case of approximately 1,400 kilos, which on an aircraft that can carry over 130 tons is just a, a drop in the ocean. <laughs> well, Eric, never underestimate the power of a drop. Once the Formula One box is loaded onto a Boeing 747-8 that combines impressive range and efficiency, Millions of frozen drops threaten their slick schedule. Right now we're de-icing the aircraft. We have around zero degrees Celsius here right now, so um, obviously these are the critical temperatures that uh, we need to be vigilant before takeoff. A quick spray to lubricate those frozen wings and the aircraft is ready to fly. All good. Everything's back on track. We're all set. We're just waiting for us to clear the aircraft, close the doors and uh, send uh, the vehicle to its destination, Doha. We're all happy. Minutes later, the giant 747 soars into the skies, bearing the ultimate plaything for some very wealthy new owner in the Middle East. In Banbury, the Haas F1 team has just one day to pack for the first Grand Prix of the season, 10,500 miles away in Melbourne, Australia. Here we are in the uh, race base. We are preparing for the freight to Australia. We have everything built and packed in 12 hours from this point. If we get to Australia and we have too much work to do, we miss sessions. So when we're here, we try and achieve as much as we can with the spare parts and build spec that we have to allow the least amount of work to be conducted when we're at the track. The fragility of the, of the components is a key thing to take into account. One, because we don't want to be repairing them when we get to the track, but also these are 
prototype builds. So any damage, whether on the track or transport, is, is, is unacceptable. Despite the factory racing flat out to fill 11 air freight containers with thousands of car components, track racing is still paramount. Well, we're just about to do the uh, final pit stop practice of the pre-season, really. Uh, next time we do pit stop practice will be in Australia, so obviously the pressure's on me to squeeze it in while the guys are trying to pack all the cars up and all the freight. A blistering pit stop can be the difference between a place or disgrace. So race operations chief Jeff is looking for perfection. So all I want to do now is I just want to do 10 really good stops, nothing more than that. Because I suppose now it starts. I know we've done the testing, but I suppose this is where it starts. Between all of us working together, we can hopefully make a difference. So that's the little speechy bit over. So we're all ready, yeah? Go! So nice warmer upper. Static again. Ready? Go! Okay. Roll the car. Two point one. I think that's the best one of the year so far. A two point one seconds full tire change is world class. Now they must do a lightning fast pack if they're to be ready for the Australia flight. This is a spare chassis. Uh, this travels in this spare chassis box. Uh, we need to try and get it in there. With it being a new chassis, it's slightly different to what we've uh, put in there before. There's a lot of other spare components that go around the box as well. So. Um, yeah, it's the first time it's gone in there, so let's hope it fits. <laughs> Two six. Just be careful of the old side pods as well. I remember last time we had a sketch with that. No, I think it goes the other way. I don't think it's going to make a difference turning it around. No, that's about right. Happy with that? There's a different uh, detail on the roof of the box. So, yeah, trying to wedge things in and making sure it fits. So, it's just the, the old classic jigsaw pack up we're doing. It's like a good game, game of Tetris. <laughs> and we're losing. Yeah, we're losing quite badly at the minute. Eventually, after much head scratching, the pallet puzzle is solved. But just as one problem is put to bed, Another far bigger one threatens to slam the brakes on their Australia race plans. It's racing, we're driving these cars to the maximum and you can almost guarantee that on Friday, in Australia, we will need brake duct spares of some kind. We're struggling to get them finished in time for the main freight and we're gonna be struggling for time to get them in the late freight. Yeah. How much time do we need them? Well, it's three hours a corner or something. So, three hours yeah, corner. that's right. We haven't finished the first corner yet, so we need more time on them here. Okay. Let's get what we can done, but yep. let's reconvene again in a couple of hours. Yep. It's just about making sure we have the right parts to protect ourselves. Brake ducks work in a very hot, uh, hot environment and is very liable to damage. Whether that's a, a miscalculation from engineers due to temperatures and we burn some stuff, or we have an accident. Going to a race without any spares is, is yeah, it just can't be done. But just as the wheels are coming off the Haas juggernaut and brake ducts may miss the plane to Oz, communications chief Stewart takes one for the team. People like myself occasionally will have to take that extra suitcase with them just to make sure that a part gets there. That's part of being a team, that's part of being a good teammate. Right, yeah. You're prepared to do whatever it takes because it's important that every component that we need, plus spares, uh, is there in Melbourne. So it's all systems go again, but it's now 9 p.m. and the freight truck to the airport goes at dawn. We spent two hours on, the, on one set of the fronts. And this is the kind of thing that holds us up in Australia. This is the kind of thing that we end up working all night. Changi Airport, Singapore. Our shipment of life-saving drugs from Zurich has just touched down. Uh, today we have uh, pharmaceutical products uh, on board. And uh, this, this aircraft is uh, Swiss Air, Alex 176, uh, from Zurich. Once we unloaded the uh, container, 
with uh, pharmaceutical shipment, we will get the driver as soon as possible. They will send it to our coupon site. For this temperature-sensitive medication, maintaining a constant 2 to 8 degrees Celsius is critical. So, the less time outside in the sweltering 31 degree tropics, the better. Yeah, this is a medication. Yeah, it's from the uh, aircraft, just being unloaded. And we have put on the uh, pallet dolly, and this will be transported to a coupon immediately. But even best laid plans can't compete with a furious Mother Nature. Why? Wow, it's raining now, it's heavy rain. Yeah, it's really heavy rain. I'm wet. <laughs> OK, arrival, we have uh, pharmaceuticals that I need to quickly send to Kupot. Can... yeah. Can you get the driver to stand by here? Uh, we have stopped unloading now because we have a uh, heavy rain and we have a uh, lightning alert. They will definitely slow, slow us down because uh, we have totally stopped operation now. We have stopped operating everything, we have stopped unloading everything. It is uh, very dangerous for us to work around. Because of weather, uh, we have no choice about it. But 30 minutes sustained assault from the elements, Franco is compelled to act. Can't wait anymore. We have to expedite this shipment to the coupon. It's still lightning going on. Other than that, we have stopped everything. With the airport on lightning lockdown, this is the only container processed. Now the question is, have the life-saving pharmaceuticals survived their brutal barrage? I'm waiting for our cargo, our pharmaceutical cargo, which is arriving in Tokopot from um, a Swiss air flight, which is from Zurich. Because it's a temperature-sensitive cargo, where if it's not kept in a certain temperature, the cargo will be spoiled. So now the shipment is here. So what I need to do next is to take the temperature of the cargo. So far, the, the temperature is between the range. This is how do we, we, we do the check, see whether there's any damage. And so far, it's so good. Everything's fine, everything's smooth, and now it's on its way. I'm very, very happy. The penultimate part of the shipment is to distributor Zelig Pharma, where our drugs must get final clearance. So right now, my colleague is checking that we receive the right shipment. What they'll do next is they'll cut the plastic straps and unbox the item. This is a data logger, we have stopped it. It means that we have received the shipment within the control environment that it's in. So in this way, once we download the data and check that the products are kept within the required temperature range during the transportation process. It's the moment of truth. Despite the delays and hostile weather, they've remained within the temperature range the entire journey. Meaning they can be safely delivered to the medical facility. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. The last. Okay. Okay, can you Very check? Good. Confirm? Okay. Yeah, confirm. Okay. Thanks. Okay, here we go. All yours. So, this is a very important um, uh, pharma medication. It's come all the way up from Zurich. The patient is waiting for that. Check it over. Uh, quantity is fine. That's what we order. And expiry date is okay and very fresh. Okay, so I'm sure my patient's very happy. And now I'm gonna put this drug into my refrigerator. So after a testing six and a half thousand mile journey, the pharmaceuticals can be given to the patients. Let's hope she doesn't muddle the medicine with the milk. In Banbury, the Haas F1 team is burning the midnight oil as they scramble to get 34 tonnes of car and kit ready for dawn transport to the airport. That front frame that you've got there by your knees, Carl, is going to sit in that section there. Three, two, one. And one of the last tasks is slotting the main race cars into their protective freight frames. The whole chassis is mounted into a frame and then loaded into an air pallet bolted down, nice and tight, covers on. With thousands of components needed for the Formula One season opener in Australia... You need more tobes. 
Right, okay, down. Everything must be precisely packed to optimise every square inch of the freight containers. Putting one of the security seals on, so you've got one on each corner. Then you know if it's been tampered with. These are the two chassis uh, ready to go to Australia. The mechanics have finished building them. They're, they're bolted into the air pallets. Now it's down to mechanic Rob to faultlessly forklift the pallets into the truck. I've done it loads of times before. It's just with this one, it's a different car, so it's different diameters, uh, different setup, different wings, different noses. So it's short by top designers, fit like an absolute charm. I've got no doubt. Well, there's only one way to find out. If they don't fit, it'll be a major spanner in the works. Um, a lot of money worth of cars. Tilt forward. Yeah, go on, a bit more, mate. Job done. It's 1.03 in the morning. Last pallet's going on. Been a bit later than anticipated, um, but everything's on. Seal it up. Uh, the next time we hopefully see that will be in Australia in four days' time. Next stop, East Midlands Airport for a strict 2 p.m. airside loading slot. And 63 miles later, Hash's 11 containers arrive safely, where they're met by DHL's Vice President of Motorsports, Paul Fowler. Behind me, you'll see the, the Haas team is just arriving. I know the guys have been working hard from Barcelona to now to get these here. I'm sure there were some sleepless nights. And they're on the final leg, obviously, before loading. The event's going to happen on Sunday, and we have to be there for that. It's, it's, it, delay is not an option. The aircraft entrusted with delivering Hass's cars to Melbourne, Australia, is a Boeing 747-400 freighter, dedicated today to transporting all the UK-based Formula One team's cargo in its cavernous belly. We've got a 747-400. Uh, the payload is going to be approximately 100 to 110 tonne, with uh, around 38, 39 containers, all full of uh, Formula One equipment. So do we want to go on board and have a look? OK. Follow me. OK, so inside we've got a converted uh, 747. When we start off the load, the load will all come through the rear entrance. Uh, we'll start loading the lower forward first to put a bit of counterbalance forward for the aircraft so it stops the aircraft from tipping back. Once the uh, rear of the aircraft is loaded, we then go downstairs to the lower hold and load the rear lower hold. So in a couple of hours' time, hopefully, fingers crossed, I should have approximately 100 tonne of uh, Formula One equipment on. I should have somewhere in the region of about 90 to 100 tonne of fuel on. I should have all my crew members on that's ready to fly, all the flight plans, all the air traffic clearance, and the ground crew ready to push the aircraft back. Uh, and I'm hoping approximately half past two this afternoon, in about two, two and a half hours, the aircraft should be airborne and well on its way to Melbourne. Okay. Fingers crossed. Well, time to put words into action and get the Formula One show on the road or up in the air for the mammoth 10,500 mile flight to Melbourne in southeast Australia. Some of these teams are spending 300 million upwards to, to produce these, this equipment and these cars. There's no replacements back at the factory, so you know we've got one shot of this. The weight is critical, so every pallet's um, loaded and then distributed evenly. You can't have them flying nose, nose high or tail low because they'll use more fuel. It's like playing adult Tetris. We've got a million pieces and we've got to get them in the right place at the right time, at the highest skill level, but we don't get to say game over. As we've gone over time, it's, it's evolved and we've kind of ironed out all the creases, so we don't have time for failure or delay, to be honest. As promised, the last container boards promptly by 2 p.m. and the 747 is ready to begin its long journey to the other side of the world. Well, that's the aircraft now fully loaded, fully fueled and ready to go. The next stop, Melbourne. People turn their TVs on once on a Sunday afternoon and watch a two-hour event, but what goes behind it is quite extraordinary. As our world races at an ever faster pace... We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. ..and delivery deadlines shrink. 
being an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people. You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa. We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. We get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out of this world giants, life-saving medical supplies. It's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this episode... Whoa, whoa, stop, 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 stop. The world's biggest military transporter turned mega freighter thunders in. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. To whisk heavy machinery to an African mine. They sometimes like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle with a leaf blower. A covert $55 million shipment of cancer drugs. You, you, you can't film this bit here, I'm sorry faces a race to stay on time and unspoiled. It's a very good feeling knowing that we're shipping medication across the world that could save someone's life. An airport wildlife officer gets into a flap. Sure, sure. Over a flock invading his runway. Permission to release the birds going cartridge. And we meet the man who constantly pushes back. 9-1. Clear to push. To keep a global package delivery service on track. You got a big one this time, fellas. It's a big bird. It's 5.30 a.m. Somewhere in Middle England, two trucks slowly rumbled their way towards East Midlands Airport. On board are two massive 30-ton rock crushers destined for a mine in Africa. These machines here would be used for sorting out different types of rock. We specialize in different size loads, abnormal loads, wide loads, and long loads. I haven't actually been over to the airport before with any of this. Hopefully somebody has pre-warned them of what we're actually coming with. Worry not, William, all is in hand. Working on the principle, it takes a monster to move a monster. In the skies overhead, the only aircraft that can handle such an abnormal cargo touches down. All 24 wheels. This is the Antonov 124-100. Once a military transporter, today its claim to fame is being one of the world's largest freighter planes. Its extraordinary bulk dominating the airport. The Antonov 124 originally was built specifically to accept tanks, missiles, but since the collapse of the Soviet Union, the aircraft's been used in the commercial uh, business. It carries all kinds of things, helicopters, aircraft engines, sea containers, trucks. But today we're carrying these rock crushers. Yes, the sheer size and weight of these two rock crushers could literally crush smaller planes. Uh, these weigh 30 tonnes each, and they're three and a half metres tall and 18 metres long. 
no other aircraft can carry that kind of height and that kind of length. All being well, the rock crushers will fly from East Midlands to a Gabon mine in the middle of the African bush. And it's proved a bit of a nightmare to organize. We've had a few problems along the way. One problem was they've never seen an Antonov 124 before. This aircraft's got a very wide wingspan, so there is a chance it will overhang the taxiways when it arrives in Gabon. So it's been an interesting process. It's sometimes like trying to do a jigsaw puzzle with a leaf blower. Well, Paul, your leaf blowing jigsaw troubles may not be over yet. The Antonov crew still need to get these heavyweight hulks on board without destroying the place. The floor of cargo cabin is 36 meters long and it's 6 and 4 meters width and almost 5 meters high. So basically almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. Now the nose ramp is opening. Each cargo in piece is 30 tonnes. So we have to build a special ramp equipment to load this cargo into a plane. And it's hard to do that and uh, we need to prepare. The main goal is to construct the special uh, ramp system that would be in one level with the floor of aircraft so you can put the cargo into airplane. Making this challenging task even more impressive is the fact that the Antonov crew must double up on duties. Effectively, this aircraft could fly for 500 flying hours, so that could even be up to six months before it has to return to base. But all the while the aircraft's flying, it needs to be maintained. And these guys, not only are they the loading crew, they're technicians as well. So they have to be able to replace engines, replace undercarriages. And they live on board the aircraft, as I say, for up to 500 flying hours. While the crew toil on their heavy duty load ramp, flight manager Anton takes us behind the scenes of his flying home. This is a place where technical crew stays during flight. Here is wardrobe when we can keep our clothes. Here is our kitchen. We have oven, we have fridge, so you can have a tea, coffee, whatever you want, and whenever you want. Not when the stewardess comes to you with a cup of tea. This is a place where we can spend the time during flight. This is my office, <laughs> seriously. Uh, this is working place of our flight crew, captain, second pilot, flight engineer, second flight engineer, navigator and radio operator. You can see how many systems you have to control during flight. Uh, it's not new, but it works really well. Outside in the freezing cold, the Ukrainian crew have almost finished their ramp that'll hopefully bear the considerable weight of the rock crushers. But just as they're about to rumble forth, Tom Blakeman, who chartered the plane, Lordy. spots a potential crushing issue. This track vehicle comes off the low loader. The impact will be quite heavy, so the tracks could bring some serious gouging onto the concrete. So the stakes have suddenly ramped up. Will the stone crushers wreak catastrophic concrete crushing? <laughs> Louisville, Kentucky, in the USA, home to Worldport, the planet's largest automated package handling facility and heartbeat of UPS's global delivery service. It's just the definition of a mega air operation. While the state-of-the-art aircraft, control center, and 155 miles of package sorting conveyor belts grab the headlines. It's huge, pretty incredible place. There are less heralded roles that keep this behemoth ticking over. One of these unsung heroes is pushback driver Greg McNatt. His motor is a Challenger 550 tractor, and his job to start the journeys of UPS's 248-strong aircraft fleet. 
What's up, Kerry? How you everything, doing? Everything going good today? Yep. Doing right. good, man. Everything pre-tripped and ready to go? We're ready. All right, well, let's get, uh, get to work. Sounds good. Right now, we're waiting on the mechanics and the pilot to do their walkthroughs and their pre-checks. They're just going to walk along the wings, make sure that uh, both sides of the aircraft are good, clear of uh, all other aircraft, all other employees on the ramp, any type of vehicles that we got going on, make sure they're out of the way and clear to go so we have a clean push. This is a mechanic. He just took the power out, so they're ready to go. Uh, we need, I need to help these guys with the stairs and we'll be done. We have the, the tow bar which hooks up onto the gear here. The pin goes in place, it's set, hooks on to the pushback tractor, tow bar in the front here. And that flight crew is trusting them that when they're pushing this aircraft back, they're pushing in the right spot and as safely as possible. The pressure is now on Greg to get the aircraft out on time. We're ready to go. UPS's global operation is so vast and complex, any little holdups can set off a chain reaction, delaying or even canceling future flights. 9 1, clear to push. 9 1, push and drop. Copy. So, with over 50 tons of cargo to shunt, it's not the time to turn boy racer. Right now, I'm just scanning the area, <laughs> making sure we got everybody out of the way. We're good, we're on our way. Greg's first big push is a fully loaded 200 plus ton Boeing 767, stretching to 180 feet long. Or if you like surreal comparisons, the equivalent of 40 Danny DeVitos lying head to toe. We push quite a few out every day. Busy, busy. Always got to make sure everybody's in the right position. You know, this job is exciting at times. You know, you, you get to push these aircraft. You just got to make sure you're doing everything right. Make sure you follow procedures. The co-pilot side is they're starting this engine to get ready. Once I get this pushed out, which I didn't do a very good job of, take the bar off of the aircraft. The mechanic will take the pin out. The pilot has control. So, one down, many more planes to go. But ever the perfectionist, Greg ain't feeling total pushback satisfaction. I wish I would have done a little bit better job. I was a little crooked, but it got out there safely and uh, we didn't have any issues and it's on time and that's always good. After that minor wobble, Greg's afternoon of hitching and pushing passes without another hitch. And as his shift winds down, he gets a shot at the world's biggest production freighter, the Mega Proportion 747-8, weighing in at over 400 tons. I mean, it's a heavy aircraft, so you got to—I mean, you just really have to be careful. You don't want to overexceed the, the landing gear too much as you're pushing it and turning it. So it, it, it just has to be precise in what you do. If you stress out. If you, you know, if you have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this because a lot of bad things can happen in such a small period of time. Are you the right man for the job? Today I am. Fighting words indeed. So, the stage is set. 11.36, ready to go. I have clearance, I'm just making sure my wing walkers are ready. We're good, we're ready to go. This classic David and Goliath duel pits a 50-ton Challenger 550 tractor against a 450-ton 747 freighter. All right, we got a big one this time, fellas. It's a big bird, it's a big bird. Uh, going in reverse. Because the aircraft is actually pushing me down the ramp. You have to know what you're doing, where you're gonna end up. He may be in retreat, but Greg's not panicking. This can be fully loaded and with all the engines going, and we can still push it. This plane is in my care, in my care only. Where I put it is where it's going to go. With that never say die attitude, it's a textbook pushback. Another one down. The gigantic 747 8, packed with packages, is sent packing thanks to a giant push from drivers like Greg. We have so many destinations around the world, around this country. We just 
Push him out and go to the next one. East Midlands Airport packs a major punch in the global air cargo world. Surprisingly, this relatively unheralded airfield, bang in the middle of England, is Britain's busiest for pure cargo, including a whopping £10 billion worth of goods to non-EU destinations. We are a strategic national asset. We're one of the very few airports that is um, licensed for 24-7 operations. We ship around uh, just over 1,000 tonnes of cargo every day through the airport, 365,000 tonnes a year. We're ideally placed right in the centre of the country, so actually we can reach 90% of the population within four hours. We're able to facilitate the movement of the high value goods, such as engines, aircraft, we're moving Formula One cars, animals, you name it, we can move it. It's vital nothing hinders the frantic shuttle of freight flying in and out. And sadly for ground ops crew Keith, the wings here are not all made of metal. The feathered variety can send him into a bit of a flap. My job as wildlife control officer is to ensure that we minimise the bird activity on the airfield. We're trying to protect the aircraft because aircraft and birds do not mix. The biggest danger that they pose, you have the potential for birds to be ingested into the aircraft engine. And depending on the size uh, of the bird, if it's up to a pound or more in weight, it can destroy certain parts of the engine. Well, it's clear our feathered friends are not so friendly and welcome to Keith. Keeping them out of harm's way is top of his pecking order. Quite often, the best dispersal method is just the fact that we're always out here. So the birds get to know this vehicle, the sea, is going to scare them away and move them away. And if the garish airport SUV doesn't work, it's plan B. We've got old school, tried and trusted methods of getting out the vehicle and flapping like a big bird. On this occasion, giving the birds the bird. Flap does the trick. But a short while later, touring the intercontinental nine and a half thousand foot runway, he spies a bigger prey. This one's a nice one, it's a buzzard, sitting on the Mark II side. Absolutely nothing. There we go. So we'll move down to a different perch now. A version of Leapfrog. So I'm trying to move him along and he's just going to hop and hop and hop. So all I'm doing is using my presence to try and move him further and further away. Now we're going to go a bit further down. It's all fun and games. Ah, I've got you now because I can get to you. Oh dear, back to square one. And to add to his woes, rather than scaring them off, Keith seems to be an unlikely bird magnet. I'm just noticing this some crow activity. But he's not panicking as he has some special scarecrow weapons in his armory. If I put the crow on him. We've got some recordings made in the 60s. We're able to, to mimic a birds in distress. They believe that one of their comrades is in distress and birds will naturally just fly away from danger. It's quite effective. As I say, it's another element that we can use the deciding to move on. At last, after failing to get the buzzard to buzz off, Keith has something to crow about. But later, Keith meets a more formidable foe, the Larus Canis. I've got gulls standing on the runway. Otherwise known as the common seagull, and they require Keith to pull out the big guns. Permission to release the bird scaring cartridge. Up too far at will. None of you's called Will, is there? Heathrow, UK, Europe's busiest passenger airport. And proof Blighty still rules the skies. 
Less publicized but equally impressive is IAG's cargo operation that shifts 40,000 temperature-sensitive medical shipments each year, something Emily Burton is rather proud of. IAG Cargo transported £30 billion pounds worth of goods last year. We have over 500 aircraft in our fleet, carry all different kinds of freights, everything from drugs to live animals such as tigers to tropical fish to perishables, so vegetables you might find in the supermarket. Everything that you can think of, IAG Cargo will move. Not to be sneezed at is the biggie. Millions of dollars worth of pharmaceuticals that includes two billion vaccine doses and a raft of other vital life-saving drugs. Today we're expecting three envirotainers, so three of our flying fridges, and they're coming all the way from Northern Ireland, so they're being trucked from Northern Ireland into Heathrow, and then they're flying out to the US. And these are cancer drugs in glass vials, so not only are they very expensive, they have to be handled with care. Tasked with transporting this $55 million shipment over 300 miles to catch the Heathrow flight is freight forwarders Farmer Freight. The crushing responsibility is enough to make boss Andy reach for the Valium. We just sent a double manned vehicle to pick up product in mechanical units, effectively a portable fridge, which by their very nature can break down. We have the weather, we have the transport network itself. All of these things can work against us. My ultimate nightmare on a shipment like this, if we think about it, this is a very valuable, life-saving medicine. If the patient doesn't ultimately get their drug in the correct conditions, that could have a huge knock-on effect for the treatment of their illness. They're the things which tend to keep people awake at night. The nerve-shredding shipment is from drug manufacturer Almac in Northern Ireland. 17,000 glass vials of a breakthrough cancer treatment needs to be carefully freighted between 2 and 8 degrees Celsius all the way to Philadelphia in the USA. Gary, yeah, you open up the box. So I'm now going to come here and do a manual check, make sure that the, the valves are the correct quantities. These products are all worth quite a lot of money, um, so there has to be extreme care taken. Once we put these valves back into the box and secure the box, we will be taking the valves into the lobby area where we will load them onto envirotainers. Straighten up now. And that's where Farmer Freight come into play. Yeah, you're right. These are all coming off. We're going to open them up then, one by one, put the pallet in, strap it in, close it up. It'll be sealed and then the temperature will be monitored again then. To keep the fragile cancer vials in optimum condition, they'll be transported in special temperature-controlled envirotainers. The only snag, they're battery-powered, meaning any big shipment delays can result in drugs worth millions going down the pan. That's got to be number one. Yeah. Two. Three. So our truck drivers will need to keep a close eye on their battery life. We're going to check them as we load. We check the temperature and the battery as we do one at a time. They've used 10%. They're at 90% at the minute, which is fine, because it sounds like they've used a lot 10%, but that's just to get them to the temperature. Once they get to the temperature, they start to slow down the loss. Just before we load this pallet here, you'll see that there's temperature loggers on top of the pallet, so they're placed at either corner. This will guarantee that the product has been kept with in the right storage conditions from the start of the journey through to the end of the journey. As you are, Mike, as you are. Yeah, that'll do it. Okay, top and bottom, yep. Uh, no, I think it's all right there. Is it? Yeah. So that's the first one loaded. They're securing the envirotainer with a security seal. So that security seal will remain on the pallet throughout the journey. With all three envirotainers given the seal of approval, 
They must be loaded without any major bumps. That's you all right now, yeah? Give a wee bit right hand down. Whoa, whoa, stop, just stop, 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 stop. Have you got sides? OK, your side, come out. Yeah, keep going. That's the shipment now fully loaded, uh, so there's been no problems, no issue. It was done within good times. Uh, I'm confident that uh, all the product was in and will reach its destination now all in one piece. Hi, thank you. This is, um, stops anybody being able to open these doors. There we are. We're getting a bit of time, it's slightly short now, we need to get down to the dock. Next port of call is the port of Belfast. But already the clock's ticking and batteries protecting their precious cargo draining. I hope we don't get any hold-ups on the way in. We shouldn't do it this time of day. No. You, know, well, I don't, you never know, do you? No. Well, it looks a bit windy out there. So uh, if it gets too strong, the wind, uh, let's hope they don't cancel the boat. Adverse weather is not the only threat to safe delivery. Mega-valuable drug shipments are also in the crosshairs of modern pirates. Criminal gangs counterfeit medicines for their illicit gains. The vehicle which we sent to Ireland had a covert tracking device in it. The drivers have defensive training. Oh, well. <laughs> you got that? Yeah. They're trained to understand when people are following the vehicle and be aware. We vary the routes. We take different ferries. So security is at the forefront of our mind. Let's be honest, you know, there's a lot of it going about and they're, they're, whatever you're carrying, if, if, if it's valuable, they'll take it. Uh, get into the port and... Uh, oh, by the way, you, you can't film this bit here. I'm sorry. After covertly entering Belfast port, stage one of the air freight consignment passes without a hitch. OK, that'll do, Tom. But later, the weather gods turn nasty as they unleash their fury that threatens to torpedo the shipment. Proper rain now, isn't it? Yeah, it's real rain. Come on. At East Midlands Airport, two gigantic rock crushers are about to embark on a perilous journey into the cavernous belly of the beast, otherwise known as the Antonov 124, a feat that promises even to test the mettle of its vastly experienced crew. The flight manager and the load master are now with the cargo, sizing it up, measuring it, figuring out how they're going to do it, because these things are 30 tonnes each. So it's going to be quite a, an intricate operation to get this done. But before these caterpillar track monsters are unleashed, yeah, we need that, that one. Tom, who arranged the plane's charter, desperately wants to avoid being clobbered by a rather nasty bill. One of the things what we'll attempt to do as we do this transfer is to minimise the exposure of the airport concrete to the tracks to the stone crushers you could actually bring some serious gouging onto the concrete itself, which not only puts the aircraft parking area out of use, but it's a costly repair. So that's to be avoided at all costs. Any concrete that we, we have to cross, we will have it protected by some rubber load spreaders. But we think we can do this without actually touching the concrete at all. Can you get as close to those aircraft ramps as possible so that we've got the least amount of concrete exposed. Yeah. Yeah? Yeah. Our crew is going to offload this mining equipment from the truck and they will be gone one by one in one line. They're lifting the front of the crusher so that when it comes down the ramp, it's not going to ground. It will come down the ramp and then it will roll across the tyres and then up onto the extension ramp here. Finally, it's crunch time. All spectator Tom can do now... It's quite a decent run, isn't it? ..is pray no actual crunching takes place. Whoa. Oh, yo, 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 yo. 
guy who's operating the controls, he's doing it remotely, so it's quite difficult for him. Effectively, he's driving it while walking, which is, uh, which is quite impressive. It's quite a delicate operation. Yeah, quite impressive. We rely on this man to do his job. Despite the absurdity of driving a 30-ton monster machine with what looks like a toy car remote control, the crusher reaches the aircraft ramp without causing major damage. Tom can almost breathe a sigh of relief. Lordy! You're happy for him to take it straight into the aircraft? OK. Yeah? Yeah. We'll just adjust these arms, lower the arms, before we transit up into the aircraft. That's probably a good idea, as airplanes, even hardcore transporters like the Antonov, don't fly so well with a broken nose. But thankfully, our joystick joyrider keeps everything under control and guides the crusher safely into the cargo hold. There's 30 tonne of weight on the aircraft now. If we took it right to the back of the aircraft, it could do some damage. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. So it's been restrained in the middle of the aircraft until this one's in the nose. And then what they'll do is they'll take the first one a bit further in and then position this one right up next to it. A solid hour of careful manoeuvring both the industrial rock crushers are home and hosed. Thank God they're in. And crucially, in the correct loading position. Stability is key. It's quite difficult to, to centre the load. It's going to require something like at least 14 chains uh, to restrain it forward and aft and sideways, so uh, that's what the guys are doing at the moment. Hopefully the captain's going to have a nice time flying to Gabon. Technical crew is in a good mood. A little bit tired, but it's enough for us. It's OK for us, so go. Just a few operations to finish our job and we're ready to go. By that, Anton means the vital operation of keeping stomachs fed for the 3,860 mile journey. So this is the most important delivery of it all, food. There might be more catering than cargo. Is that it? Have you got more in there? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. OK. The food's on board, the technicians are on board, so we're almost good to go. So we're all happy, crew are happy. They got their food, the cargo's on, it's all in one piece, job done. Late into the night, a thunderous roar reverberates around East Midlands as the enormous Antonov 124, now 60 tons heavier, heads to an African mine in need of a pair of stone crushers. On the outskirts of Heathrow, Europe's busiest airport and mega cargo hub, an air freight forwarder is anxiously tracking a white truck running behind schedule. How are things looking? Yeah, there's a massive delay on the ferry. Just past Birmingham. As it attempts to deliver a vital supply of cancer drugs bound for the US, before battery-powered temperature-controlled containers run out. We've had units come back here at less than 20%. The longer it's left, the more chance that battery life can fail. Just like the contents of your fridge at home, these medicines are going to spoil. So, no pressure then, lads. To add stress, they're battling heavy traffic and a biblical downpour. Proper rain now, isn't it? And real rain. We had our, um, our quota of hold up. Yeah. Come on. Having earlier endured a delayed ferry amid storms, all the more important to stop and check the battery life on their envirotainers. Oh, I'm going to have to get a younger cold driver. Yeah, you have to get yeah, someone younger, yeah. Right, first unit. And the battery's 65. I expected a little bit more than that. 
Uh, 63, that one at the back there. We're going to have to go on charge when we get back now. Yeah, yeah. 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 So, with the batteries running in the low 60%, the boys must dash to Farmer Freight HQ for a quick charge before checking into Heathrow. Come on. You want to look? No red lights. No red no, lights. No. Will you check them? Yeah. And the last time we had a look at them was at Warwick. Okay, okay so I'm now we're going to check the battery levels just to make sure it's still in spec. And the key thing is here is sort of green light um, rather than red, so green means good. Once the batteries are back to full charge, it's a short sprint over to Heathrow to get the Envirotainers logged into the airport's swanky constant climate centre. That's the one I want back signed, the rest of yours, yeah? Gotcha. Thank right, you. As they come off, they'll check against the numbers, make sure they are charged, make sure that the right temperature, there's no damage to the container. And that will be that, they'll sign our paperwork off and that should be the end of it for us here this evening. It's really important that drugs and pharmaceuticals are kept at the specific temperatures that they're meant to in order to ensure their stability and their potency. So they will come into our Constant Climate Centre where they'll be prepped ready to fly, so we'll do the checks on the unit, but then they'll be put on their aircraft and be on their way to, the, to America. Nothing we can't handle. Well, I beg to differ. The vital cancer drugs have travelled 756.9 miles without major mishap. See it flashing there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is gone out of alignment. But just yards from the Climate Control Centre, the conveyor system malfunctions. Right, sorry, the lane's actually gone red, so we'll just call the engineers. Has the ball been dropped in the dying seconds? At East Midlands Airport, UK. Ops 2 is holding golf while requesting runway surface and wildlife inspection. Ground Ops Supervisor Keith is battling valiantly to prevent air cargo disruption from birds engaging in dangerous foul play. We've now got clearance to go onto the runway. Once we cross over the greenlit line and the piano keys were actually on the runway surface itself. As you can see straight away, I've got gulls standing on the runway. So this one we've got here is a juvenile, tell by the, the feather colours. It's a case sometimes of chasing them around. I just want them away from the runway. Gulls, being a big bird, can make a, quite a lot of damage. And we had two aircraft taking off with multiple gull strike. Both of them ended up with engine failure in one engine and had to do an emergency landing back at the airfield. Unfortunately for Keith, these seagulls are a flying misnomer. They're permanent residents, despite the airport being over 60 miles from the sea. Most of the gulls that we have around here, probably 30 or 40 generations since they saw the sea. So their main diet is what they can scavenge, wouldn't know what a fish looks like, but could tell you what times McDonald's opens. In Keith's bird-scaring locker is a device that blares out blood-curdling squawks. Normally, it's a fail-safe winner. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. We find that gulls have a tendency to come towards the sound rather than flying away from it. The potential is if they think one of their comrades is in some distress of some kind, he may have food on him that he may drop and they get a free meal. Oh look, we've got gulls this side as well. There's now an aircraft on the other end of the runway holding, waiting for me to complete. I want to make sure that the, I've dispersed the birds safely out of harm's way uh, so that this aircraft can uh, take off and depart successfully without any incident. We have uh, something called a bird scaring cartridge that we do use occasionally and will assist in moving the birds along. Time is big money in the air cargo world, so Keith's surefire gull dispersal tactic is to unholster the big guns. Ground ops two. Ops two, tap. 
Uh, can I have permission to release the birds going cartridge? Up to fire at will. Fire at will, obviously. None of you's called Will, is there? A large uh, flashbang going off tends to have the desired effect. A very, very strong set of rules as to how we can use it, where we can use it, and when we can use it. Can you sound clear? That's moved the birds away completely. It's nice to, to set up a big bang and see all the birds disappearing. So that aircraft's departed, he's climbing away. The ghouls have moved away. Job well done. Yes, Keith can give himself a well-deserved pat on the back. And back at base, naturally, the only way to broadcast his ornithological victory is via a tweet. The bird threat at East Midlands has been eliminated for the day and we're all ready to have another go tomorrow. Nice. At Heathrow, on the outskirts of London, it's a hive of activity, with millions of passengers and cargo items in transit. One multi-million dollar batch of life-saving cancer drugs have just received final call for the 4 p.m. flight to Philadelphia in the United States. Which one are we going for first, Phil? And Simon Crute must ensure it boards in timely fashion. We're just going to do a, a visual check on the unit, obviously, to make sure it's still fit to fly. This is our computer unit on the system. If anybody can get into here, they can change the settings on it. So they could change it to a higher temperature, a lower temperature, which would affect the temperature on the shipment, obviously. So we have to seal that up. We all good on that one as well, Phil? Good, yeah. With the three refrigerated Envirotainers, designed for aircraft cargo holds, signed and sealed, it's time to deliver. With normal freight, we can get them out nice and early. It doesn't really matter if it's sitting outside in our, in our storage system outside. But with this freight, keeping it at correct temperatures, we've got to get the right time to obviously get it out of there, have enough time to get it to the aircraft, but also not have it exposed to the weather. You could have temperature excursions because of it being outside for too long. One, two, three. Well, while we're dealing with the units, we've obviously got to be very careful with obviously not trying to smash them into things. Very, very high value, that's the thing. To prevent the Envirotainers getting lost in the Warren that is Britain's biggest airport, they first pass through the high-tech Puma Centre. When it gets inside this, in our system here, it turns completely computerised. It will work out the quickest route through the building to make sure, obviously, that they go to an exit on the right door so the driver's there waiting for it, so we don't lose any time on that either. Fingers crossed, it all goes perfectly like that. <laughs> Having been hopefully sent to the correct exit, the rush is on to get our Envirotainers into the cool sanctuary of the temperature-controlled aircraft cargo hold. Here, what we're going to do is we're going to load it onto what we call a dolly, make sure it's ready for travel out to the aircraft. The aircraft in question is a passenger 747-400. What the paying customers don't realise is what may also be going along for the ride. 99% of the freight that we uh, fly is going on the bottom of our, our passenger aircraft. Passengers probably haven't got a clue what is underneath them, but yeah, we carry a lot of animals, dogs and cats, carry lions and tigers and stuff like that, Formula One cars. I have foot snakes on there, but <laughs> they, hopefully they're in the right box. <laughs> Today, the Philadelphia passengers will have to settle for $55 million worth of potent cancer drugs, now ready for embarkation. If you look at the unit, they have a slanted bit on them. That slanted bit will go into the curve at the bottom of the aircraft, so it can slide down the aircraft and be nice and snug in that aircraft and make sure it doesn't move. So that's the last one in. They're going to push it down the aircraft, they'll shut the doors and that'll be ready off to Philadelphia. Superb, ready to go. 
a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication across the world that could improve someone's life and maybe even save someone's life. It's a good feeling knowing when you've got that on the aircraft and it's on its way to the patient. As our world races at an ever faster pace. We'll land an airplane every 70 seconds for more than two hours. And delivery deadlines shrink. Being in an island, there's a lot of medicine coming in. It's always urgent. The skies aren't necessarily the limit for the mega movers. Almost everything in this world you can put in this aircraft. In this series, we go deep inside the $6 trillion air freight industry. Every day, we move the equivalent of 3% of the world's GDP. You name it, we can move it. Showing the people... You have a lot of high anxiety, you don't want to do this. They're just sitting on the runway laughing at me. And incredible operations. It's a little yeah. bit sticky. Whoa, 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 whoa! We have an aircraft on stand 666, which has got an engine for it. You get two minutes to get there. To keep this complex, high-pressure trade airborne. There's 30 tonne of weight on that aircraft. It could tip the aircraft up at worst, or it could damage the fuselage. And travel with an extraordinary array of goods. Now we just need the spacecraft so we can load and then get out of Dodge. From out-of-this-world giants, life-saving medical supplies, it's a very good feeling knowing that every day we are shipping medication that could improve someone's life. Perishables. Nobody is, is in such a hurry as a dead salmon. And components for some of the greatest spectacles on Earth. 21 races, if it took three weeks to get it there by sea, we need a 63-week year. Uh, we have to use that. Put your seats in the upright position, buckle in, and prepare to go max speed with Mega Air. In this show... Here you go, here it is, here it is. Woo! A flying whale that drives an aircraft manufacturer touches down. Impresses me still every day. Really good aircraft. And sends a trainee into a tailspin. It's OK, no? No? Like a stand Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely stressed too much. An American petrol head goes to extraordinary lengths. And it runs. To enter the world's oldest motoring event. I hope this isn't the bike path. This is a bike path, I think. <laughs> We're on a bike path. And in the USA, a global delivery service. Wow, it is really cool. Takes possession of a shiny new present. If it ain't a Boeing, it ain't going. <laughs> worth hundreds of millions of dollars. Poking around a little bit. A mm. leftover dessert. Hungry? <laughs> North Wales, the land of the dragon, is not averse to strange flying objects. But one in particular almost beggars belief. Is it a bird? Is it a plane? Is it a whale? Well, not quite but it resembles a flying one. This is the Airbus Beluga, a mega transport plane able to air freight ridiculous loads. The Beluga is a very unique aircraft. Uh, there's only five of them in the world. The bulbous shape of the, the Beluga is purely because of the volume uh, that we need to carry. It sort of gives it its distinctive shape, which, um, which can look quite odd. It still generates interest. We get people stopping in cars at the end of the runway, uh, taking photos. It still intrigues the, the public. Today, at Hawarden Airport, this bizarre-looking beast, rather disappointingly called Number Two, will embark on a form of aviation cannibalism. Swallowing a batch of passenger aircraft wing parts for transport to another factory in France. This Beluga, it's a seven-day operation. We work three, six, five, seven days a year. It impresses me still every day. It's really, really good. Really good aircraft. Naturally, a monster craft requires a massive and complex loading process. 
And when your plane's worth nigh on 200 million euros, you can't afford a prang. So, no pressure then for dispatch operator Paul. And we've got to stop them on that very, very small point just on the floor there to enable us then to start the offload for the aircraft. It's got to be perfect every time. If the Beluga doesn't hit the spot, none of the docking and unloading equipment will align correctly. But achieving pinpoint accuracy unbelievably relies on the most basic of tools, a stripey pole. I'll put the pole in as an indication of where I need to stop the aircraft. Take it to site five one, please, Dave. Straighten it up, mate. Back to 102 if you can. I'll be in constant communication with the tow ballast sub driver. OK, straight on that. Keep your light on for a second, mate. Spot on there, mate. I'll count him down usually from around eight foot. Seven foot. Straight up on that. Six foot. Five foot. Six inches. And stop. OK, Dave. The team pride themselves on their lightning-fast cargo turnaround using state-of-the-art technology. That starts with the beluga saying, ah, as she opens up wide. So the thing about the beluga, it makes it so unique, is the ability to load and unload without disconnecting any flight controls um, or moving the cockpit with flight crew preparing for the next flight. No special controls um, to be disconnected and reconnected, and that enables us to achieve our 80-minute turnaround target. Nose up, the speedy process is helped along with swish electric doors that hug the beluga's great girth as she disgorges her innards. The door is uh, the contour of the beluga. Huge benefits in terms of weather. Doing it outside like uh, we're used to, we were just restricted to a 25 knot gust of wind, so uh, delay is very minimal. But on this occasion, the swish doors have lost their swish. It's the same fault. But for some reason, we've got a few little TV problems with the door. The door keeps stripping out for some unknown reason at the moment. That's the frustrating thing with it, really. We, we know. We never really have any problems with it at all. The last couple of operations, it's been playing up. It's critical that we get it done on time, so hopefully there'll be no, no delay. Yeah, we're going for a push. In the end, it takes a helping hand to close the stubborn doors. All together, heave! After that untimely delay, the pressure is now on Paul to hit the Beluga's 80-minute turnaround. We'll commence the offload. We've got a strict time scale to the day or two, so every minute counts. Inside the offload container is a batch of covers, the carbon fibre skin for wings the Welsh factory manufactures. So in terms of communication, Mario is operating the Beluga itself and Terry's on the cargo border. They've both got to make sure they're aligned, and they've both got to communicate at all times. If we've got a failure on the rollers, it's Sadi and Mario are in communication, it could cause damage. Once the wing covers are offloaded, the 100-ton cargo border, effectively a super-sized winch, prepares the load of an empty jig container to be sent on to Europe. Before it goes on board, Paul gives the Beluga cargo deck a thorough check over. I love my job. At first, it was really intimidating um, coming to work with the aircraft. Uh, but after 16 years, um, I get huge job satisfaction seeing the aircraft depart after we've completed a successful loading operation. I don't think there's an aircraft in the world that can have a view that I've got today. Really unique. Finally, the load container is scrutinised from every angle. Mario now is doing his pre-checks uh, of the load going onto the aircraft. It's a really critical part of the process. 
the aircraft has been configured to take this load in terms of weight, balance, centre of gravity. So it, it, it's really critical that we check and double check everything that's coming on and off the aircraft. This is the whole shipment going in, and this is it really. It's, it's quite straightforward, it's one on, one off. We're doing okay. We're doing really well on time. If anything, we're gonna be early. Fingers crossed. Remarkably, just one hour after touchdown, the Beluga flying whale all good. All good. leaves Wales as it heads to another factory in Europe. We've just completed the complete turn round of Tango Bravo. Done it successfully. We had a, a minor hitch with the door. It was fixed in a matter of minutes and um, we achieved it in 63 minutes, which again is, is really good. Really, really good uh, turnaround time. It still amazes me to this day after 16 years uh, watching it take off. Um, how it gets up in the air, I don't know. It's really satisfying seeing it leave when it does. Here we go. successful operation. Oh yes, definitely. But the fun and games aren't over. As they call in beluga number three, Mario waits anxiously. He's about to take his final loadmaster exam. Uh, a little bit nervous, I suppose, but I'm um, pretty confident about what I'm doing. To ramp up the pressure, he must successfully oversee the load of a gigantic wing for the A350 long distance passenger jet. The big question is, will Super Mario rise to the challenge? We're 105, 105. 105.5. It's okay, no? No? You understand, Mario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mayfair, London. The stomping ground for the fabulously rich. It's also the temporary residence for American Bob McEwen. I love my car. I am a caretaker of history. Bob's also not short of a buck or two and has forked out thousands to air freight his beloved 1903 Packard car all the way from the good old USA. This is one of my favorite cars. I bought the 1903 Packard in 2001 and it was a pile of pieces that came out of an auction in Denver, Colorado, which is where it was sold new by Packard. It took me five years to restore the car to where you see it now. Bob's flown his car thousands of miles to take part in the annual London to Brighton Veterans Run. Apparently the world's longest running motoring event, but definitely the slowest. Hordes of antiquated automobiles, some steam-driven, gasp and splutter their way 60 miles to the South Coast Seaside Resort. With a fair wind and steep hill, some even hit eye-watering speeds of 20 miles per hour. You know, we all know one another. Oh, nice to see you again. Oh, how's your car going? Oh, it broke down. It's great. In 1904, the speed limit in England was raised from 8 miles an hour to 12 miles an hour. And so the Brighton run was started to commemorate that. So it was for 194 and earlier cars. And they get about 500 every year to do the run. In 2006 was the first time I did the Brighton run in this car. And uh, we've done it eight times since then. We'll end up in Brighton at 3.30 or so. Um, and have a drink at, on the shore in Brighton, and then the car reverses the procedure to come home. Rewind five days, and Bob's car is on the journey of its 115-year-old life as it jets across the Atlantic, bound for the tiny European country, Luxembourg. At the airport, the crushing responsibility of taking care of one of the first cars ever manufactured 
falls squarely on the shoulders of product manager Christian Thies. Today we are expecting the arrival of a very valuable car uh, arriving from uh, New York. Very rarely do we have such an old and valuable car on board one of our aircraft. Transporting a car requires a lot of expertise. We have dedicated teams and uh, every cargo is treated with care. But obviously, I mean, such a car, which is irreplaceable, special attention is also given to it. As the Boeing 747-8 freighter, bearing Bob's car in its 30,000 cubic feet belly, draws to a halt, the ground crew spring into action. So the freighter has landed and everything is getting prepared to offload the complete aircraft, where we have about 120 tons loaded on um, 42 aircraft pallets. That's a side door where we are able to offload cargo, which is, uh, we can go up to three meters high. And on the front, uh, there we can offload pieces which are much longer. Here is the famous car coming directly from New York into Luxembourg. It made all the way over the, the Atlantic, and here it is. Proudly standing among the packing crates is a priceless piece of rolling history. The Ford Packard is only the second car to successfully drive coast to coast across America. So the ground crew better handle her with due deference. One false move could dent the immaculate Packard's bodywork and their cargo handling reputation. The condition has to be uh, good, check that everything is all right and uh, that the customer happy with it, of course. But as the critical moment arrives, classic car nut Christian is completely distracted, lost under the Packard's bewitching spell. Let me also take a picture. <laughs> Are you a car fan? Yes, I am. Yes, I have an MGB from 1974. Yes, it has actually the same color as well. <laughs> Looks like it's brand new. <laughs> so this will move backwards and then will be turned and then taken out on the side cargo door. Our loading system inside of the aircraft is uh, fully automated. So we only need actually one, maximum two people to have the 747 offloaded completely. And this can be done within an hour. Yes, Cargo Lux's cunning plan to eradicate human error is to use as few humans as possible. Instead, a variety of high-tech machines whisk the Ford Packard off the 747 freighter. So right now the car will be transported via a pallet transporter to avoid any big shocks. Now the Packard 1903 has been offloaded almost 20 minutes after arrival of the aircraft. Of course, when the car reaches the warehouse, there's not a human in sight. The Packard is assigned its stacking bay via computer. Now the car has entered in the stacker system, where the pallet together with the car will be stored. The stacker system, as you can see, is fully automated. There is no people inside, so also nobody can touch the car. And of course, the last part of the journey will take place uh, soon. Uh, and this will be done by truck from uh, Luxembourg into London. And uh, we all hope that the car will arrive safe into London. The final leg of the Packard's epic journey will be a 300-mile road trip by truck before it can be safely reunited with doting owner, Bob. It's fabulous. Looks like it's ready to go but being in the hands of its Cavalier owner means the Packard's danger is far from over. Oh, I forgot. Jeez, <laughs> I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> Louisville, home to UPS's Worldport. The planet's largest automated package handling facility brings fresh meaning to special delivery. With an ability to sort 416,000 items per hour, then deliver them to over 220 countries. Everything going good tonight so far? Yeah, we're good. And on a chilly November evening, 
Christmas has come early. What's happening tonight? We're getting a brand new Boeing 7478 arriving here in about an hour. This is cool. Just about anybody who works for an airline has maybe just a little bit of jet fuel in their blood. And so to see something like this, you know, brand new from the factory is just really neat. So we've got a flight tracking app and we can actually watch the flight coming in. It is 5X9109. And right now it is just north of St. Louis and coming in on Nice straight line here into Louisville. Excitement is building. The aircraft is en route from Boeing's factory in Everett, Washington, but media head Jim faces a quandary. I'd say probably here, maybe right there. I don't know if it's going to be this way. He must find the correct touchdown location in the 5.2 million square foot airport. Well, they told us that the plane would be landing this way, not that way. And this, air, this aircraft coming in yeah, is obviously figured. that way. We're going to call it and see. Hey, Tony. Yeah, I wanted to check back and see if you had an update on flight 9109, uh, what runway it'll be on, and which direction it will be landing. OK, right at 7. Thank you. I appreciate it. Okay, have a good night. Okay, landing on this runway, they said the landing time is right about 7, 7 p.m. And it's about five to seven, so we need to get going. Where exactly is it gonna pull in? Right in here. Okay, so where's the nose wheel go? The nose wheel's right here. Right, right by the chocks? Yep. Right okay. Right here. All right, cool. Almost here, a couple of minutes. Bang on schedule, the ginormous jumbo makes her final approach. Here you go, here it is, here it is. Woo! Oh. And there it is, N613 UP, 7478, pride of the fleet. All right, so there it is right there. You can see it coming off the runway. It'll taxi in here and end up right here by these wheel chocks. She's, she's home. That's what we'll say, she's home. As the 747-8 slowly taxis into her new abode, she's given the full reverential welcome. Wow. They don't call her the queen of the skies for nothing. So pretty soon this marshaller will take control. The captain on board and the marshaller are communicating even though they're not talking to each other. It's all based upon the, the positions of the wands. Finally, this massive, shapely bird glides to a halt. That signal says that the wheel chocks are in and they can release the parking brake. And her pulling power is shocking, even to Jim. Didn't know this was gonna happen, but we have a lot of people here to meet the airplane, about 50. We've got buses and vans of people to go take a look at the new airplane. It's just awesome. This fresh out of the factory jumbo jet has lots of added jumbo. The 747-8 is over 18 feet longer than the previous generation 747, can hump 24 tons more load, fly 1,000 nautical miles further, and is more fuel efficient and quieter, adding up to an even greater thrill for the expectant throng. <laughs> 10 people won a competition to go get a tour of a 747-8, and they each get to bring about three or four people with them. So we're gonna go up and take them and show them the aircraft, have a good time. I love to see this. I mean, this just shows the enthusiasm that people have for an iconic airplane like this, the 747-8. It is pretty big. Everything's new right. and shiny and beautiful. It takes a lot to bring people out here on airport property, but it's certainly worthwhile to, to let people, you know, have a look at the, at the girl, at the queen. Yes, this truly is a rare treat. Here you can see the wing. Normally, the 747-8 will be stuffed full of containers, but for tonight only, these privileged few can gawp at the queen in her naked form. It's, it's really cool. It's really, really big, too. I'm just blown away from it. I'm speechless. It's cool. <laughs> Go ahead and flush. Hit the flush. Go ahead. Oh, wow. It's a oh, suction oh, layer. You've been checked out on your first piece of equipment in 747. It's the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> I 
think it's really awesome. It's humongous. And if it ain't a Boeing, it ain't going. <laughs> but sadly, this lot do have to get going. The party is over. But as we'll see, Jim gets to enjoy this flying beauty all by himself. It's a full-size bed. It's about six feet. It's actually, I've, I've slept on it, and it's, it's comfortable. In Mayfair, London, Bob McEwen is about to rendezvous with his ancient 1903 Ford Packard car. The American forked out big bucks to air freight it from the United States. And now it's approaching the end of a 4,000 mile journey. Hi, Bob McEwen. Hi, Bob. Shane from Bespoke. Nice, nice to meet you. Hi. You picked this I up? I picked it us up from yesterday. Heathrow. Yesterday from Heathrow for you. So, and so we're nice ready to, to go. We're ready to go. Just got to unstrap it, and she's all yours. Perfect. We're, do we're, we're good. good. We're doing it. We're good. Thanks. Bob last saw his car a week ago, and now he's beside himself with nervous anticipation. It's fabulous. I'm glad it made it. Wheels aren't broken, nothing's wrong. Looks like it's ready to go. Three of my friends' cars ended up in Antwerp instead of here, and they'll miss the run this year. But not this one, it made it. We even cleaned it for you, Bob. Thank you. We gave it a quick polish for you. I was gonna say, I didn't think it got dirty in the airline. <laughs> Do you want me to just get in and in back it off? I'll ask you to steer it in a minute. Okay. Sitting in and steer it, but I will control it on the winch. So it's a controlled descent. Bob, if you'd like to come up and take pride of place in your car. Like an old friend made it. You're good to go. So far, the Packard has made it transatlantic without a scratch. Bob, left hand down. No, the other way. Other way. Now Bob must sort out his left from right, or the last few feet could all go horribly wrong. Straight out. Right, stop there. There you go. Bob, can you turn the back of the car that way for me, please? That's as far as you get. That's fine. We're good. Jane, looks fabulous. Nice Thank to meet you. Very you. Much. Thank you, Bob. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Hopefully, we can work with you in the future. Absolutely. Take care. Bob's gone to incredible trouble and expense just to fly his Packard over for the veteran car run, an annual jaunt for near prehistoric motors. Fut futting from London to the south coast town, Brighton. And sometimes you drop things. All I needed to do was hook up the battery here, which is plus and minus. As it's only four days away, Bob gives his Packard the once over to check everything's in full working order. I'm gonna check and see how much gas is in the tank. There's no gas. Eight gallons of gas, it's all gone. <laughs> Leaks, everything. Definitely incontinent. <laughs> Uh-oh. No gas means Bob must traipse the foreign streets of London in search of a petrol station. 30 minutes aimlessly wandering later, he strikes oil. Hallelujah! Well, we put gas in it. We've got the fuel turned on. There we go. Hey, hallelujah. Starting the Packard is a challenge in itself. There are no keys or, God forbid, electronic ignition. So the only way to crank the 115-year-old single-cylinder engine into life is by brute force. And it runs. Recklessly throwing caution aside, Bob roars, or rather splutters off taking his friend for a test drive. A scary one at that, as Crazy Bob turns it into his own wacky races. Oh, I forgot. Jeez. <laughs> I'm driving on the wrong side of the road. <laughs> With up to 50 accidents a day in central London alone, it's like throwing a priceless antique 
into a demolition derby. Don't hit the nice taxi cab. There's the London Eye. I hope this isn't the bike path. This is a bike path, I think. <laughs> We're on a bike path. London traffic is definitely interesting and definitely a pain. And this car doesn't have enough acceleration, but I feel so lucky to be able to ride around and enjoy the city. And how many people can say they've driven an old car around London? And everybody smiles at you. <laughs> Thank you. This car's running terrific. We got a little bit of gas in her and she's happy and she's happy to run around. Perfect for London. So, despite a couple of near misses, Bob's Packard survives the London gauntlet unscathed. Next is the big one, the veteran car run. Hey, Mitch, go Wendy! But little does Bob know, there would be a savage twist to his motoring fairy tale. Back at Hawarden Airport, North Wales, the Beluga deliveries are coming in thick and fast, with aircraft number three touching down. The Beluga that's arrived is uh, taking a right-hand A350 wing. It's a big wing. On its own weighs about 21 tonne as well. So it's a pretty hefty wing that we're sending today. These giant air freighters make daily shuttles around Europe, delivering plane parts for Airbus. But this next job is anything but normal for trainee loadmaster Mario. So today um, we're going to be doing my loadmaster test. So just see how it goes. Uh, hopefully it all goes well. We're testing today on the communication skills with the crew of the aircraft. I'll be tested on offloading the plane, loading the plane safely. Passing this test today, it can be big. There's, there's like exciting opportunities to, to fly around Europe on the Beluga. So yeah, it means, means a big deal to me, yeah. Shadowing Mario is Jean-Yves Berry, or Chuck Berry, as the beluga wags like to call him. He's a man who loves to bring a dollop of Gallic flair to the party. My job today is to release Mr. Mario Merolo, Lord Master. Mario's test begins as the giant beluga nose is peeled open, ready for the cargo offload. Now you can release the button. After one meter? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 After uh, now, the temperature. Yes, yeah, yeah. Mario has his work cut out, because next he must figure mental arithmetic that would give Pythagoras a run for his money. Hello. One to five point five, OK. One to five, one to five. One to five point five. We can't import point five. On a computer? Yeah, yes. Is it? Yeah. OK. It's OK, no? No? You understand, Mario? Yeah, yeah, yeah. He must instantly calculate the beluga's angle, center of gravity and weight, including estimated fuel, so the jack operator can perfectly level the aircraft, ready for loading. It's okay? So it's only one ton. Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's good for you? Everything okay? Yeah. Let's go, Mario. Calc's done. Now it's the moment of truth, where the Mario's sums add up. I'm stressed out here. I'm absolutely stressed to the max. Yes, Jack, 88, 87. Perfect. Perfect. So far, so good for Mario, for me. He's done one of the main bits, which is the jack configuration. Really important that that is right. Mario, on that turn, did very well. Not one mistake. <laughs> OK, happy days. With a resounding tick on his speed maths test, Mario sends out the cargo crate to collect a wing for the huge A350 passenger jet. Spanning around four London buses long, it promises a tight squeeze. I'll have a little walk around now, uh, making sure it's in the right orientation, the right number, make sure nothing's loose before it goes onto the aircraft, as I'm the last link in the chain, as I say. So it is quite a lot of pressure. I'll just have a little walk yeah. around and then we'll wait. Yeah. Okay. yeah, okay. Direction is okay. Yeah. MSN. MSN. Two, two three, four. four. Okay. Correct. Yeah. 
wing we have right, okay? Yeah, wing, it's... not left, huh? right. Correct. Make <laughs> sure we got the right Very one. important, okay? Yeah. We don't want to send the wrong wing over. It's okay for you, Mario. Okay. All right, let's go. So far, Mario hasn't put a foot wrong. But inside the beluga, there may be hidden hazards that could trip him up. So yeah, we just have a bit of a general walk around of the hold, just to make sure nothing's falling off onto the rails for when we for when we load the plane. So it's just a, a visual check. <laughs> it's important uh, oil, oil leak, you know, because it's very toxic. Yeah, erosion, corrode. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. oh, there is. Yeah, feel there. Yeah. And very slight worry. Which we just spotted a small, small hydraulic leak, which can be quite dangerous for the aircraft because of the corrosion. We need to call uh, maintenance up just to give it a bit of a clean up. Otherwise, it could get could get a lot worse. As it stands, Mario's doing a really good job under the pressure, uh, and there is pressure today. We've managed to get the aircraft docked, we've completed the offload, and now we're just about to complete the loads. He's doing really well. With the oil leak scrubbed up, Mario gives the all clear to start ingesting the massive A350 wing into the beluga's belly. It's going well so far, yeah. Uh, I'm happy, to, uh, Johnny is happy, so yeah. It's, the final stage is now, then this will be loaded. The A350 wing stretches to over 100 feet and weighs 25 tons. It seems impossibly big, but the beluga swallows it in one gulp. I've made it. <laughs> Good job. Thank you very much. Good job. <laughs> Thank you. Everything went well. Yeah, happy. Exciting times ahead. But just as Mario can taste the glory of qualified loadmaster, the wheels come off, or rather, a printer malfunctions. We have a problem with the printer. Ah, yeah. What's wrong with the computers? Paperwork is an essential part of the Bluger operation. The printer has malfunctions. We need that paperwork to come off. As we've got another aircraft inbound, it's critical to avoid any delays on Tango Delta, which is coming in. So I need the printer working uh, sooner rather than later. Fortunately, the Rogue printer is quickly fixed. The Beluga is rubber stamped and sent on her way. As for Mario, one can only say he came through his Loadmaster examination with flying colors. A great day for Mario. Great day, champagne. <laughs> okay. All's gone well, so yeah, I'm all passed off now. So any aircraft that come in from now on, there will be no trainer. It'll just be me on my own. Very happy, yeah. Earlier, we saw how, with great fanfare, Worldport welcomed their latest, largest, and swankiest cargo plane. Go, oh, here it is, here it is. Woo! a 747-8 to their home at Louisville. Wow. They don't call her the queen of the skies for nothing. A select crowd were given a privileged peek. I think it's really awesome. It's humongous. I'm just blown away from it. I'm speechless. It's cool. <laughs> but now the party's over. That's all except for media man, Jim who can't resist sneaking a peek at the Queen of the Skies private parts. There we go. So we're on the upper deck of the 7478. Most people don't get a chance to see what the inside of a freighter looks like. Um, this is the area for what we would call jump seaters. So they might be pilots who are moving from place to place. These are first class uh, passenger seats. So you've got six back here. You've actually got a couple of more seats up front in the cockpit. But you know, this plane might fly 12, 13 hours, and you have people you know, on board for that, so we want to make them comfortable. Here in the back, come take a look. There's actually two full-size bunks. So while two people fly, two people can rest. There's one bunk here, there's one over on the other side. And it's a full-size bed, it's about six feet. It's actually, I've, I've slept on it, and it's, it's comfortable. But there's no rest for the 747-8 as she can cruise almost 5,000 miles on a full stomach of 139 tons and keep her crew well fed too. On long flights, you know, you want to eat. And so there's a galley, hot water, 
and then coffee, and then lots of storage. Take a look. So in here is a convection oven. Uh, they'll put essentially frozen meals on here, nice frozen meals that you heat up. Uh, might be fish, might be chicken, might be beef tips. 25, 35 minutes at about 350 degrees and uh, you get a nice meal back at your seat. So I was poking around a little bit. And we actually have a, a leftover dessert. Hungry? <laughs> of course, the ultimate in a sanctum is the cockpit. Come on and sit down, take a look. Here, you can deliver a spine-tingling 1,184 kilonewtons of thrust to reach Mach 0.845 speed, 560 miles per hour for us mortals. I'm sitting in the captain's seat. I'm by no means a captain, uh, but I can explain a few of uh, what you might see here. Um, four engines, so you've got four throttles. This is the flight management computer. Uh, they program the route the airplane will fly, and really shortly after takeoff, they engage the autopilot, and then the flight management computer flies the airplane almost to the destination where the crew then takes over and does the landing. Fuel control for the engines. Here's the yoke, uh, which is you know what you use to control the aircraft. You pull back to go up, push forward to go down, turn left and right with the ailerons. Up here are further controls, uh, including uh, fuel, uh, the what we call air conditioning packs, basically air conditioning for climate control. These are actually uh, fire control levers. And then the rest of the cockpit is really just circuit breakers. You sit up here and, and you realize how skilled the pilots really are to operate you know, a, a machine that's as massive as this one is. I'm proud of this airplane. We've got it now in the fleet. We'll eventually have 28 of these. Having been given the royal treatment tonight, the 747-8 will soon come down to Earth, hopefully without a major bump. She'll revert to being a giant workhorse of the skies, delivering packages to you and me. It is really cool. I mean, it's just... As you folks in the UK, I think, say it, uh, it's a fine piece of kit. In Hyde Park, central London, it's the day of the veteran car run. Around 400 historic 100-plus-year-old automobiles and some almost equally ancient owners cough and splutter as they warm up for the big one, a 60-mile amble to Brighton on the south coast. This is the most famous old event car in the world, the London to Brighton. There is nothing else like it in the world. It's great. I just like the pageantry and the drama. It's absolutely fantastic. Uh, I mean, usually, I mean, we've even got the best weather today. Usually it's pouring rain, and uh, your biggest risk is catching pneumonia. Six minutes before the first car will be crossing the start line, Tradition demands the race starts by the tearing of the flag. And with the flag torn, the intrepid owners tear off. Well, in a manner of speaking. Hey, Mitch! Go, Wendy! It's all systems go, apart from one hapless individual. Our man from the USA, Bob, is on the sidelines, reduced to the role of spectator. Friday morning, we were driving the car around London, and for some reason, the connecting rod bearing failed. Would have dramatically hurt the car if we kept going. We've done major effort to get the car here, so it's extremely disappointing. We just can't describe it. Probably spent $15,000 to get the car here. It's just horrible. So, as the veteran cars merrily wheeze their way south to Brighton, Bob's Packard heads in the opposite direction for shipping back home to America. Not that this whole sorry affair has put the brakes on Bob. I love my car. We'll take it apart and fix it. 
and it'll be back running again. We'll be back next year for sure. We're gonna have a good time again.